was the center of the house. <laughs> I don't remember a time without TV. By 1960, essentially every household in America had a television. It was a new way of bringing the world to you. When something big happened on television, it really did happen to the entire country and impacted the entire country at the same time. Keep an awakened eye on the world. Suddenly, television was the main event. Everything else changed even the way in which you went about the business of getting someone elected president. David, will you hit the one minute button, please? The 30 seconds and the cut, please. In 1960, the Nixon-Kennedy debate was a first in television. A lot of people were watching that night, and it introduced a lot of people to Kennedy. Will you let me see the tight shot on camera one, please? You hear me now, speaking? Is that about the right uh, tone of voice? Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide... When the networks offered a debate, Kennedy immediately said yes, because he was sure he could do better than Nixon. I think Mr. Nixon is an effective leader of his party. I hope he would grant me the same. The question before us is, which point of view and which party do we want to lead the United States? Mr. Nixon, would you like to comment on that statement? I have no comment. If you're live on television and there's a camera right here, there's really no place to hide. Once you see a guy sweating when asked a question, are you sure he's the leader for you? That's the question before the American people, and only you can decide what you want, what you want this country to be, what you want to do with the future. I think we're ready to move. If you saw it on television, clearly Kennedy had won that debate. Gentlemen, thank you very much for permitting us to present the next president of the United States on this unique program. Other debates in this... It was the beginning of a new form of political craftsmanship. If you could structure your message appropriately for the TV camera, you could have a huge impact. And if you couldn't, you were toast. I would like you now to give a real tonight welcome to the senator from Massachusetts, Mr. John Kennedy. May I ask you, so that I don't look too naive, a tough question right off the bat? And whether I'm a Democrat or Republican? No, they won't. <laughs> People recognized that television was now the medium that mattered. It wasn't before 1960, and it was every day after 1960 in those presidential debates. Oh, honey, let's go watch that. Try to find a Western. All right. Once everyone had a TV set in their living room, and advertisers had fully gotten a grip on how effective this was a way to sell products, the very definition of what you were doing was to create entertainment that would appeal to as many people as possible. Beaver, eat your Brussels sprouts. See, Mom, I can't. 
My stomach's still running to my throat. Now, no excuses. Leave it to Beaver was something that a lot of families understood. It's the first show that was ever shot from the perspective of a child. Beaver. Most people have had a lot of the experiences that the Beaver or Wally had, and everyone in their life has an Eddie Haskell. Hi, Wally. Some dumb kid fell in a soup. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, some poor, unfortunate child is trapped up there. Everyone has that moment when they were so embarrassed and they thought they'd never get over it, but they did. Tonight's special report at the scene of the 1961 Emmy. It isn't whether it's a situation comedy or whether it's a western or whether it's a, a drama. I think you, it's the quality of the show itself that's important. The Andy Griffith Show, Mayberry, it's just a kinder, gentler place. Be hard not to want to live in Mayberry. Hi, Paul. Hi, Barn. Hello. The core of the Andy Griffith Show was this rock at the center of it, a calm wisdom. I have taken the best parts of myself and uh, people that I've known all my life and put them into Andy Taylor. Hope they, uh, there comes a time when you have to stop the play acting tell the truth. Don't you believe me, Paul? Don't you, Paul? People appreciate emotional honesty. They appreciate it more than laughs. It's great if you can achieve both simultaneously. And The Andy Griffith Show actually did that very often for a sitcom. And it shows an unexpected depth. So how do we think of the new format? The second dance number should come before the big sketch. Gee, I don't know. I like it. Now I like it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I like it too. What do you know? Look at that tie you're wearing. <laughs> I only wrote what I knew about, which was my life. And if you're writing about that, nobody can say, that's not true. It is true. I'm living it. On The Dick Van Dyke Show, we could believe the actions of the characters because we could relate to them. This wasn't a genie in a bikini in someone's bottle on their mantle. These were real people. Well, women are more, more... Honest and direct? No. <laughs> They're more... Courageous. We all have the same needs, feelings, relationships with husbands and wives. That was the kind of comedy we did, the problems of living. Honey, how much do you like that baby? Already. The season opening episode for the 1963 season was seared into my head. Now, our wives had a baby on the same day in the same hospital, and the hospital was very busy, Mr. Peters. What am I getting at? They thought they got the wrong baby from the hospital. So he calls the parents of the other kid and thinks, you know, uh, we may have your kid, you may have our kid. Hi, we're Mr. and Mrs. Peters. Uh, come in. <laughs> It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Here they're tackling a subject without tackling it. Why didn't you tell me on the phone? <laughs> Missed the expression on your face? The network worried about the fact that the African Americans might be upset by it. The network was always a little behind. There was, there's always somebody back there who doesn't have B-A-W-L-S, balls. In Hollywood, the winner, Carl Reiner, Dick Van Dyke. I wish somebody had told me I would have worn my hair. <laughs> I've got to tell you this one. You know, you know those knock knock jokes? Yeah, but well, they're old now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a real good one. I got yeah. a real funny one. All right. Go ahead, start. Say knock knock. I say. Yeah, go ahead. Knock knock. Who's there? <laughs> There was only three yeah. networks, and yeah. the there was only one late night show, really, and it was Jack's. Jack Parr. They don't understand uh, how we do the show. We just keep talking. With I no know. Script. It's agony. <laughs> Jack Parr invented the late night television talk show. 
You feel confident that you'll... There's not a man in the world to beat me. I'm as pretty as Limit Roger. Jack had in his corner his personality, his fabulously interesting, complex, frightening, neurotic, but in other cases, enthusiastic and informed personality. It made for great television. How much time have I done? I don't have a watch either. <laughs> How much? Nine. Has it been charming? <laughs> I'll quit now, then. I'm not going to Here's Johnny. Johnny Carson inherited The Tonight Show, but he made it his own. It's going to be wild tonight. I can always tell. He hosted a nightly party. Are you married? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and if his buddies came and they started playing together, you felt like what it must have felt like to go to Vegas at 3 in the morning and have the Rat Pack come on. <laughs> where's the, no, but where's the guy you talked to? <laughs> It was a beautiful thing to watch a guy working at his best. Okay, bingo. Well, do we have Get a your act, act, and let's go. Oh, right. <laughs> if you watch it closely, He's gauging how much longer he can wait to let the laugh die before what he says will be irrelevant to what happened. And he gets it just on the nose. It's beautiful to watch. Johnny was the best audience in the world. And he loved comedy. And the, woman, the woman's watching him. She's watching him from the corner of her eyes. She says to him, what are you looking at? The guy says, I'm looking at that ugly baby. <laughs> That's a bad-looking baby lady. <laughs> Johnny was there listening for you. He wanted you to score. And when you scored, he scored. Enough, I said, now calm down, lady. He said, madam, the Pennsylvania Railroad will go to any length to avoid having differences between the passengers. Said perhaps it would be more to your convenience if we were to rearrange your seating. <laughs> and as a small compensation from the railroad, if you'll accompany me to the dining car, we'll give you a free meal. Maybe we'll find a banana for your monkey. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dick Cavett, uh, funnier than Chet Huntley, uh, taller than Mickey Rooney and as pure and honest as Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> the Dick Cavett Show was amazing because you could get people like Norman Mailer and Woody Allen. My only New Year's resolution this year, I think I'm gonna try and sleep through the Nixon administration, you know? <laughs> you would have authors on, you would have heavyweight boxers. There were conversations. When you mention the national anthem and uh, talk about playing it in any unorthodox way, you immediately get a guaranteed percentage of hate mail from people well, listen, who say, how that's dare not unorthodox. anyone? That's not unorthodox. It isn't North the No, no. I thought it was beautiful. But then there you go. I just thought anything that's interesting ought to have a place on a talk show rather than young, pretty actresses who use the word excited in every sentence. You're not frequently seen on television. Is that by choice or...? Well, uh, of course, it is the most impressive medium of all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the medium that's going to either save America or send it down and to demise. There's no question about it. I'm getting out of it myself. Really. We'll be back after this. What you do is you book the best possible guests from different kinds of businesses. Maybe not everybody in show business, some politics, some newspaper people. Get them all on a stage together and hope that something works. But it's a great show. It's a great platform for people who have something to say. The point is that they take these scripts out of the drawers, they change the things around. Maybe it doesn't work with Green Acres, but on many of these shows, and that's why night after night you turn on these serials and they all seem as if they came out of the same bread box. Back then, you had lots and lots of copycats. You've got the Adams Family, and then you have the Monsters. You've got Bewitched, and then you've got I Dream of Jeannie. You know, the, the old saying is imitation is the sincerest form of television. So if one person is doing this fantastical hit, 
we're going to do that. Now, is that considered a crime? <laughs> I'm afraid not. There aren't any laws to protect us against bad TV shows yet. <laughs> so you're safe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I'm surprised by are some of the shows that I can't even imagine the pitch meetings for, like Hogan's Heroes. It's a story about American prisoners of war in a Nazi concentration camp, which doesn't exactly sound like it's a funny comedy. Why don't they trust us, Schultz? <laughs> that shows you how weird the 60s was right there. Here's another one of our fine shows for this year. Vroom, pit Stop. <laughs> the moving story of an effeminate race car driver. <laughs> was really an astronaut for the Mafia. <laughs> 9.30 Eastern Time, 8.30 Central Time, quarter after two Pacific Time. PBS <laughs> presents this program in color. I didn't have color television until I was 16 years old. Yes, I lived like an animal. The following program is being brought to you in living color on NBC. Getting the color TV was huge because suddenly we could watch Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color on Sunday nights, which was like just an acid trip of a show. We just could not believe it. Tinker Bell going bing, 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 and it was like, oh, it was like special effects par excellence. The world is a carousel of color. It also happened, just coincidentally, at the time when what we think of as the mod 60s came in. Colors were all over the place, just as TV could start to take advantage of them. Hi. Well, glad you can make it. I remember saying, stay tuned for Gidget next, in color. Wednesday night, September 15th, in color, on ABC. It was a big marketing thing. Color TV was a huge step forward as far as the technology went. And yet, I think of uh, Lost in Space. Lost in Space started off as a black and white show and then went to color. It didn't get any better when it went to color. Dr. Smith, you're alive. Of course I'm alive. Do I look like a corpse? The period has a reputation for being TV as a kind of candy. It sometimes felt like there was this really aggressive innocence to it. You're only to blow that in an emergency. This is an emergency. You're staying on my foot. <laughs> Gilligan's Island makes no sense whatsoever logistically. You gotta make a spider drunk. How is the professor able to build all this stuff but not build a damn raft? Why, with this stick of crude dynamite that I made. It makes no sense if you pull any single thread on it, but it was just like the kind of show designed to live forever in syndication. What are you looking for? The nun, who else? <laughs> Are you kidding? Flying Nun is the most... <laughs> it's a crazy show. Like, what is that about? Look, Carlos, it's very simple. You see, I only weigh 90 pounds, and the combination of my cornet and the wind lifts me. It was just complete nonsense, let's face it. <laughs> It was in the height of the 60s, and everyone was eating granola and dropping out and doing God knows what else, and I wasn't. <laughs> Hello, Central. I'm switching to my eyeglasses. Put a hold on my wallet, but keep my shoe open. Television, more than ever in the 60s, was a place to escape to. Let's go. It seemed like it was almost sort of a willful respite from the stuff that was going on out in the world and in, in real life. Here's a bulletin from CBS News. There has been an attempt, as perhaps you know now, on the life of President Kennedy. He was wounded in an automobile driving from... Dallas Until the early 60s, television news was by and large seen as something of a backwater to print journalism and even to radio. But the Kennedy assassination was the moment that television journalism came of age. We'll continue full day coverage of the presidential funeral and final procession to Arlington. More and more people were depending on television to give them the headline news of the day. 330 Americans were killed in combat last week in Vietnam, but the number of wounded, 3,886, was the highest of any week in the war. Most of the 1960s, the contrast between what you saw on your entertainment and what you saw on the news was, you know, planetary. 
Never has this dissent been as emotional, as intense. In the 60s, it was one thing after another. Each year it was filled with important events. Governor Wallace has ordered 500 Alabama National Guardsmen into Tuscaloosa. At the moment, they are under his control. Whether it was the civil rights movement, or it was the Kennedy assassination, or the space race, when there was a huge thing that happened, it happened on TV. The witness to that violence that it seemed to be unprovoked on the part of the demonstrators. Television became the fire in which the whole tribe gathered around to listen to the elders tell them what was going on. Police reinforcements moving down Balbo Street now. Variety was the backbone of television back then. One year, there were like 18 different variety shows. Everybody had a variety show. It's the Jimmy Show. Everyone was different because of who was helming the show. But it's time. Dean Martin was just so loose, he acted as though he was doing the whole show drunk without a rehearsal. This is a real international show. Now, where else could you see a smooth Italian and a slippery pole? <laughs> it was funny. He was really, really funny. He always looked as if he was a bit lost. People thought that it was because he was tiddly, but that was part of the charm. Here he is, Ed Sullivan. Thank you, Greg. No matter who controlled the TV set the other nights of the week on Sunday night, you know, 8 o'clock, you were going to watch Ed Sullivan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a very fine novel act. Ed Sullivan was a phenomenon, and he was a powerful force. Quiet, please. Quiet. The beauty of the Sullivan kind of variety show is that if you didn't like something, something else would be around in four minutes. No, Johnny, no. No, no. Why? Why? It is very difficult. Easy. Advertisers wanted everybody. And so they got everybody. A little kid and his grandparents who could watch the same show. They would have an elephant on. And then the next thing, somebody doing Shakespeare. And the next thing, a comic. There would be an acrobat and then an opera singer the next bit, which was true variety. Anything that was current was on The Ed Sullivan Show. Here's young Richard Pryor. Thank you. Thank you. Rivers. Rodney Dangerfield. Everybody wanted a showcase, and if you got on Sullivan, you knew you can talk about it the next You just see Sullivan. My whole life, I don't get no respect. No respect from anyone. As a performer, you couldn't get a better place to sell your product. When I started out, they would say, variety is a man's game. Uh, it's Dean, it's Milton Burl, it's Jackie Gleason, it's, you know, the guys. But variety is what I know. I felt it was in my genes to do this. She had been so good on the Gary Moore show, she always knew she could sing and dance and be funny. Honey, where the... On my show, I would do pratfalls and jump out of windows and get pies in the face. And it was heaven. It's a, it's a, I, I think it's going, oh, God. You know, I still, I, I see a rerun of Carol Burnett's show, and I said, God damn, they're funny. 
There's never been a better three-wall scut show ever. She was great in bed, too, Dickie. Remember Stop. that? Stop. You never went to bed with... Well... No, I'm not supposed to catch air. I'm supposed to bow. Well, I get dizzy when I bend over. <laughs> when Tim Conway came on, his goal in life was to destroy Harvey. Here's Tim with our own Harvey Corman as a brand-new dentist with his very first patient. We used to have a pool backstage, not as to whether Harvey was going to break up, but as to how far he could get along in the sketch before he broke up. Okay, no we came. Here we are. No we came. Take a firm hold of the hypodermic needle. Right. <laughs> they never knew what he was going to do, but they knew it was not going to be what they expected. when they did the dentist sketch. None of that was rehearsed. Yeah, I'll be right with you. <laughs> Poor Harvey was helpless. Tears coming down. And Tim swears that Harvey wet his pants during that sketch. I don't know why that works so well. Watching two actors break character and just crack each other up should not be as entertaining. But somehow, when it's Tim Conway and Harvey Corman doing it, it just, uh, I could watch that stuff forever. I just thought, if we have fun, the audience will. We're going to go out there and do what we do best. And it worked. You can plan it, you can write it, you can rehearse it, but you hope for some magic. And it was, it was Carol. Carol, the magic of Carol Burnett. Now, you say he's a TV addict. Well, perhaps he's been staring at this electronic blessing the television set for so long that his life has become his. Yeah. And uh, he's reached such a stage of confusion that he no longer knows whether he's watching the action or is participating in it. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. There was a desire on the part of writers and producers to push the envelope and stretch the medium. And you certainly saw that with The Twilight Zone. It was a very cinematic show. This is not a new world. It has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. Rod Serling, who created The Twilight Zone, came to the realization that through a lens of fantasy or science fiction, he could actually tell stories about racism. He could tell stories about fascism. Tonight, I shall talk to you about glorious conformity. It was a way to deal with a lot of the issues that America was starting to go through at that time, but in a fantastic setting so that there's some divide between you and the show. They sent four people, a mother and a father and two kids who looked just like humans, but they weren't. The Twilight Zone had these little O. Henry-like twists on it and was allowed to have unhappy endings. They pick the most dangerous enemy they can find, and it's themselves. Now six months are fugitive. This is Richard Kemble with a new identity, and for as long as it is safe, a new name. The Fugitive was kind of a somber character study. Beware the eyes of strangers keep moving. Everybody wanted to see what happens to the fugitive. Well, the natural question is, how long is it going to go on? Will we ever find her? I'm about ready to give up. I'm tired. <laughs> when it ended, it broke the viewership record set by the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It was one of the first TV shows that actually went somewhere. You know, Youngstown is not exactly on our course. In a lot of ways, television was showing the slices of the world that people they had never seen before. Route 66 was an innovative show because it was actually filmed on location. So the audience was being exposed to things that just weren't part of their local orbit. Space, the final frontier. You know, there's a little bit of the Mayberry aspect to the world of Star Trek, and that's going to sound like an odd analogy, but, but follow me here. People want to believe that such a place can exist. The idea of a future in which a lot of the biases and fears of the past has evolved out of us. Where I come from, size, shape, or color makes no difference. 
There's one episode where some of the members of the crew were taken over by these mental giants. This psychokinetic power of yours, how long have you had it? They forced Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura to kiss. It was the first interracial kiss on television. NBC asked me if I would do my own special, and I had always adored Harry Belafonte. We decided to do one duet called The Path of Glory. It's an anti-war song, and we both felt very strongly about it. And I just touched his arm. The sponsor went crazy. My star doesn't touch a black man's arm. Pachula Clark says, I'm not doing it over. And it's my show, and it's going in that way. We weren't having any of that nonsense. No way. So it went out the way we wanted it to go out. I didn't really have any other problems with sponsors, but that sort of gave me a taste of <laughs> what could happen. In the TV business, the 60s was probably about the last decade during which the sponsors had a really iron grip on content. Brought to you by Dash. Even if they tried to keep TV, this white, homogenous, whole milk product, the world found its way in. It could, it, it just had to. Where's the trouble driver? Do you ever remember to bring a silencer? It ruins the line of my suit. With I Spy, Robert Culp and Bill Cosby were equals. Cosby is this pioneer in terms of a black male lead in a drama. He made race a non-issue because he's undeniable. The winner is Bill Cosby and I Spy. Bobby and I try and put forth an example of the way it should be racially in this country. We need more people in this industry to put forth that message and let it be known to the bigots and the racists that they don't count. Thank you. As television changed, it was helping all Americans to understand that this is what America looks like. Uh, frankly, you're not exactly what I expected. No? No, not from what I read here. Did you expect me to be older or younger? Huh. Julia was going to be the first time that a black woman starred in her own television show. Has Mr. Colton told you? Tell me what. I'm colored. What color are you? She was a young black woman who had been educated, raising her son alone. It had a universality that was just something new and you'll keep out of mischief i'll just watch the old tv good in the 60s america was exploding in a way that needed to be reflected on tv stand still dragnet came back in the late 60s and friday was now in a very different world than he had been in in the black and white days and suddenly there were the damn dirty hippies i'll make your book he's been dropping that acid we've been hearing about jack webb would lecture you about the dangers of marijuana smoking and crazy drug culture they're trying to deal with the counterculture but they don't understand it so it's just basically their stereotypes of what the hippies were like, and it plays exactly like that. Keep your nose out of my purse. Keep yours out of the acid. Next time I will. The supreme national effort will be needed to move this country safely through the 1960s. There was tremendous anxiety and fear. 25 Russian ships are en route to Cuba on what may be a collision course. Jeff K said to his brother, what if there's a nuclear war and our children die? Who is going to blink first? Stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Whatever the president does, he risks nuclear war. NBC presents... Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In.
country would be much better off with a strong leader. I know, but Sinatra can't do everything. <laughs> when Latin came along, we'd never seen anything that was kind of like grown-ups acting goofy and hip that way, you know? And they had girls dancing in bikinis, and they had the joke wall. Oh! Who's in there with you? Cool hand Luke! And it was nothing but jokes. I was at the hospital. Oh, anything serious? A black widow bit me. Well, it never would have happened if he had been a gentleman. <laughs> Jug. We took it to the network, and the network said, what the hell is this? He said, this makes no sense. I said, right. Hi. You too. They acknowledged the hippie generation, yet the hosts were in tuxedos smoking cigarettes. They were still your parents. But the other people let loose on the show were this kind of young vaudeville. She socked it to herself. We knew that sock it to me didn't mean sock it to me, right? So we thought, oh. Sock it to me. Sock it to me! Uh -huh. Sock it to me? <laughs> sock it to me? <laughs> it was not as subversive as it sounds. Yes, it was. No, it was, it was, it was fun. Sock it to me? <laughs> it was the first time a presidential candidate had ever appeared on a comedy show. And that uh, may have got him elected. And I've had to live with that. Hmm. Anyway. The family that watches laugh in together really needs to pray together. It just seemed like it's happening right now, and it's about right now. That was the greatest thing ever, that there was a fusion of politics and a comedy and everything else into one television show. When we take over, I'm going to look out for you. The subjects that were verboten, we don't talk about these things, were starting to come up in TV, and because it was well executed, it changed everything. This is the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, production 124, air, take one. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the Smothers Brothers Show. If Rowan and Martin and the Smothers Brothers are the new stars of TV comedy, it is the comedy itself, rather than the comedians, which is more often in the spotlight. These two programs have consciously tried to influence people by comedy techniques that break through the traditional song and skit routines and by subject matter that is often on the cutting edge of what is new. Our, our government is asking us as citizens, good yeah. citizens, to refrain from traveling to foreign lands. Okay, all you guys in Vietnam, come on home. The times were changing so quickly in the 60s, and we didn't change them. Uh, are we, uh, we just reflected them. I can't hear you. What are you doing? I'm getting ready to go to college. Yeah. <laughs> CBS gave the Smothers Brothers that show because they were clean-cut folk satirists. You know, they wore blazers, they could sing well, they were funny. Mom liked you best! You lower your voice. Mom liked you best. <laughs> they told us what they thought we could do and what we should do, and it was totally wrong. And Tommy came in saying, I would like a show where we could be relevant. If you ever get a war without blood and gore, boy, I'll be the first to go. But until then, Mr. McNamara. Oh, I'm only 18, I got a rough just clean, and I always carry a purse. The people in the counterculture start making these shows, and they don't want to play by the rules that other people did before then. But who would expect the Smothers Brothers, of all people, to be the ones raising this much of a fuss? A good script. I held my breath every time they did the show because I knew that the network people were befouling their trousers with fear. Nothing funny in this. Hey, our boys, we're through censoring your show. They said that the social subjects we touched on were not appropriate for the 9 o'clock family viewing hour. They came up with any excuse to make it difficult. And I came up with any excuse to push it. Yeah. CBS would like to give us notice. And some of you don't like the things we say. But we're still here. Oh, yeah, we're still here. They were going to speak truth to power, and they were not compromising. Do you have something important? Something or... very important to say on American television. You know, a lot of times we can't, we don't have opportunity to say anything important because it's American television. Every time you say uh, something, yeah. they try to say something important, they, uh, do... 
Well, whether you can say it or not, keep trying to say it. That's what's important. You get that? Yeah. But there's no way in the world, if anything's meaningful and truthful, that you're not going to offend someone. You've got to be able to uh, say what it is, say how it is, and take the consequence. CBS announced today that the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour will not return to the CBS television network next season. Network president Robert Wood said it became evident that the brothers, quote, were unwilling to accept the criteria of taste established by CBS. CBS News efforts to reach the brothers for comment have been unsuccessful. I was angry, but we never regretted it. We never did regret it. What do you think of television, honestly? Do you think it's good? Yes, I do. I think particularly for what it is, for the amount of hours that it gives you for enjoyment, either in education or for pure entertainment, it's remarkably good. What television did in the 60s was to show the American people to the American people. Until then, we did not truly know much about each other. We knew only what we had seen, which was very little, and what we had read, which was even less. A few years ago, I thought it was the end of the world. Now it's just the beginning. I think people looked at television for answers, maybe. that The world's just confusing. It's going to hell all over the place. Maybe something on here will help. There was no denying the shift in attitudes towards sex, towards race relations, towards politics. It was all televised. That you will faithfully execute the office but I will faithfully execute the office. When it works, television conveys impressions and evokes memories. When it works well, television makes us feel. Good morning. It's T minus one hour, 29 minutes, and 53 seconds and counting. Television created a sense of national unity around cultural events. OK, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. You could turn on a machine and be somewhere else. You're looking good here. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Television changed absolutely everything. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? in the 60s, you have this backdrop of tension. You have capitalism versus communism. And there was palpable fear in the United States and in the Soviet Union that the two sides were going to get into a nuclear war. The temper of the world is crisis. Architect of the crisis, Nikita Khrushchev. 
as a head of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev was very ideological. He believed that the future belonged to communism. He said, America needs to be contained, and the only way to do it is to create crises all around the American empire. Khrushchev came to the UN in 1960, and he said, we are grinding up missiles like sausages. We will bury you. And Americans took it seriously. The toughness of the Khrushchev speech did add some propaganda fuel to the fire that is now raging diplomatically between Moscow and Washington. To see if the Soviets were building nuclear weapons, more importantly, missiles to launch them at the United States. We were flying a spy plane over the Soviet Union called the U-2. I'm Bill Fox, state cable editor for United Press International in New York. A single-engine U.S. Air Force plane with one man aboard was missing today, not far from the Soviet border in the rugged mountains of southeastern Turkey. To a stunned and startled audience, Khrushchev announced that an American U-2 spy plane had been shot down in the Soviet Union. Khrushchev made the wreckage a public exhibition. To the Soviet Union, this wreckage was a national cause, national outrage over the violation of Soviet boundaries. And so, out comes the cover story. The department has been informed by the NASA, a U-2 weather research plane piloted by a civilian has been missing since May 1. Eisenhower had said, no, that didn't happen, et cetera, et cetera. He'd been drawn into a trap by Khrushchev. The Soviet leader was able to show not only had they shot down the plane, but they had the pilot. Francis Gary Powers, an ordinary man caught up in extraordinary circumstances and in a way magnified by them. I realize that I've committed a grave crime and I realize that I must be punished for it. The evidence of espionage, currency, presumably for the spy to buy his way to freedom. And a spy's last resort, a poison needle with which he could kill himself instantly if captured and threatened with torture. No one wants another Pearl Harbor. This means that we must have knowledge of military forces and preparations around the world. The safety of the whole free world demands this. Our government was, in effect, admitting that we had previously lied and that we had committed espionage. Admissions no nation had ever made before. How will this incident uh, affect the United States, do you think? I feel that it will give the uh, Americans a black eye all over the earth. I think that we ought to uh, sink one of those submarines that have been spying off Cape Canaveral. Well, I don't think we should admit it. We have a right to protect ourselves. The shoot-down was such a big event that it basically torpedoed detente. It torpedoed the chance to have a peaceful period. And actually, it was the beginning of the scariest part of the Cold War. America's public mood was one of demoralization. And there's the feeling that we can do better. And that's when the election of 1960 comes along. I think the question before the American people is, are we doing as much as we can do? Are we as strong as we should be? Are we as strong as we must be if we're going to maintain our independence? Kennedy was a cold warrior more than Eisenhower was, really. I want people in Latin America and Africa and Asia to start to look to America, to see how we're doing things, to wonder what the President of the United States is doing, and not to look at Khrushchev or look at the Chinese Communists. The fact is, Kennedy did run to the right of Nixon, and he was saying that they were letting the Russians get ahead of us in missiles. It frightens people. It's not true, but it frightens people, and it's very effective in the campaign. I believe the Soviet Union is first in outer space. You yourself said to Khrushchev, you may be ahead of us in rocket thrust, but we're ahead of you in color television. I think that color television is not as important as rocket thrust. The missile gap was a total lie. We out-missiled them at that time better than 100 to 1, 
if Eisenhower had come forward and said, this kid is not telling the truth, it would have been a different election. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Kennedy, in his inaugural speech, did not have a single mention of a domestic issue. He came to the presidency thinking his job was to run the Cold War, to defeat the Russians. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. If you had left New York by car at seven minutes past one this morning, by 2.55, you could have made Philadelphia, 95 miles in an hour and 48 minutes. In that same time this morning, a man went around the world. The spaceship was built in Russia. When the Russians put Yuri Gagarin into space, it was another sense of America being knocked back on its heels. We're behind. Khrushchev greeted the hero saying, now let the capitalist countries try to catch up. For the Russians to be the first to put a man in space, dealt a real blow, not only to American pride, but restarted the whole question about whether the US government could protect the American people. Gagarin's spaceship weighed five tons. The biggest payload we've been able to push into orbit weighed only a few hundred pounds. If you can put a man into space, you can put nuclear warheads into space, and lots of them. And then we're in trouble. This is Marvin Kalb in Moscow. The people who work back here in the Kremlin are convinced that the balance of power in the world has shifted in their favor. And encouraged by this conviction, they've stepped up their activities all over the world, not only in Berlin, but also in Latin America. A great jam of cameramen here now, an absolute madhouse here. The first historic meeting between Premier Khrushchev and Premier Castro is now over. My father first met Fidel Castro in 1960 in the United Nations. Cubans became heroes in the Soviet Union. It was like the David who challenged Galeaf. If every citizen of the United States could visit Cuba, their opinion would change. They would be alive. In the years since he took power, Fidel Castro has become an enemy of the United States. In Cuba, you have Fidel Castro, who is tying himself to the Soviet bloc, which seems to be threatening the United States by the possibility that they're going to export communism to other South American countries, which are, in many instances, anti-American. Khrushchev is saying that you have to understand that Cuba matters a lot to us. Don't mess with Cuba. Khrushchev was not just using rhetoric. The Eastern Bloc was supporting Castro with military assistance. Many Latin Americans were shocked to find out how much communist equipment Castro actually has. The sense was that Kennedy had to do something about Castro. When Kennedy comes to the presidency, he's briefed on the fact that there was a, a plan in place to topple Castro. But the plan that's presented to him is not what he wants. It's a huge invasion on a noisy beach. It's going to look like a U.S. invasion of Cuba. So he says to the CIA, we can't be associated with this. I want something that is believably Cuban. This is Ron Oppen in Miami. I'm standing in one of the many anti-Castro recruiting places scattered throughout the city. The great majority of Cuba were anti-communists. So when we found there was something against Castro, we learned where there was a recruiting center, and we just approached them and, and joined. We had no idea it was the CIA. Since 2 o'clock this morning, men and boys have been filing through this door behind me, anxious to join the fight in Cuba against Fidel Castro's government. They were mainly Cuban exiles. They hated Castro. They thought that they could mount a small-scale invasion which would gather more and more support until it ended up overthrowing the regime. 
Cuban businessmen, doctors, white collar workers, men who once drove taxis, always hoping the muscle of the United States would sustain them. Without the United States being behind this operation, it was no way we were going to lose, and we were wrong. landed at a semi-isolated resort area on the south coast of Cuba at the Bay of Pig. Castro alerted his small air force and his large army and raced toward the scene. The showdown came at dawn. The rebels managed to move only 20 miles inland, and those able to move beyond the beach were trapped in swamp or high growth. No bajemos la guardia. Long live the revolutionary forces, which are shooting down Yankee planes and are smashing the invaders of the land. The Castro Control Television Network is parading prisoners captured on the beaches of Las Villas before the cameras for public interrogation. One writer called the Bay of Pigs the perfect failure. It was a tragedy on the beach and in Washington. Out of the news of this week, the attempt of Cuban exiles to reestablish a foothold in their homeland. A tactical failure that became a strategic defeat for Cuban democracy and American prestige. This act of imperialistic piratry falls squarely on the government of the United States. The United States has committed no aggression against Cuba, and no offensive has been launched from Florida or from any other part of the United States. The American role is immediately exposed. No one believes that this isn't happening with some American help. The leader of the free world has been humiliated on its own doorstep. Castro has prevailed over Kennedy, at least for the moment, and it will take a long time to destroy that image. And it was a calamity. Kennedy had been totally misinformed by American intelligence about the strength of the anti-communist movement. And the fact is when these Poor people arrived on the beaches in Cuba. They were decimated. On the landings themselves, Stuart, how large were they actually? Best indications, Walter, are there were about 300 men armed only with the weapons they could carry. It's unmistakably clear, Walter, from all the evidence available that the CIA planned this operation. It was the CIA that established the Revolutionary Council by saying to the dissident factions, get together or else. Today, in his news conference, the president acknowledged the failure and took the responsibility for it. Detailed uh, discussions are not to uh, conceal responsibility because I'm the responsible officer of the government. Victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. The Russians, I think, see this as evidence of a young, feckless, inexperienced president. Kennedy privately goes around saying, how could I have been so stupid? He's full of self-recrimination. Kennedy listened to the experts, the CIA, the military, a little bit too much, and they were wrong. The lesson he learns from this is not to trust the CIA. After the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy was more anxious than ever to meet with Khrushchev because he knew that he had screwed up. And there he is, President Kennedy with Mrs. Kennedy. And he thought the meeting in Vienna would straighten all that out. In fact, it made it much worse. Vienna was at its romantic best. Almost enough, it seemed, to remove a bit of the chill from the Cold War. It began with a police escort leading Mr. Kennedy's limousine to the Soviet embassy. Nikita Khrushchev was waiting also for talks that would explore such issues as Berlin, nuclear testing, and disarmament. Tell us what you think of this meeting between the young president and Khrushchev. Well, I think it was long overdue because the world needs peace and the world needs uh, disarmament. For Khrushchev, it is a chance to test the new president. On the subject of Berlin, Khrushchev is tough and blunt. Khrushchev said, West Berlin is a bone in my throat, and we must extract it. Berlin, of course, is divided at the end of World War II, but Berlin is 110 miles inside of the East German zone. Khrushchev is threatening to force the integration and take over West Berlin. 
And Kennedy says to him, Berlin is part of our Western commitment out of World War II. Don't challenge us there. After two days, the talks end. Kennedy did not do well. He allowed himself to be caught in an ideological argument with Khrushchev. He'd been warned against it. He did it anyways. And Khrushchev bullied him and pushed him around. Khrushchev has made the first move in the chess game. And the president knows it. As he leaves, he says, it's going to be a cold winter. Kennedy thought there might be a basis for dealing with the Soviets. Instead, he gets the Berlin crisis. In July, 1,000 East Germans escaped into West Berlin every day. Now, in August, they are coming out at the rate of 2,500 a day as a result of Khrushchev's threats and demand. East Germany is being bled of its best-trained people. I went to Berlin to cover the Bureau, and the NBC news desk in New York called in the middle of the night and said, what's this about closing off the border at the Brandenburg Gate? At 2 a.m., the communist regime issued a U-case. No East German could go to West Berlin without special dispensation. The sound of jackhammers erupts in the night. Suddenly, East German police appear, tear up the sidewalks and street. The small crowd gathered, and the East Germans were unrolling barbed wire and starting fences. They were sealing off the border. I thought, my God, this is, you know, unbelievable. President Kennedy was in Hyannisport for the weekend. A telephone call from Washington that Sunday morning told him that the communists had finally begun to seal the Berlin sector border against the East Germans and East Berliners. Through backyards, down canals, across streets, all along the 25-mile border between East and West Berlin. Telephone lines to West Germany are cut. The flood of refugees is dammed up. West Berlin is isolated. country like East Germany cannot exist with an open border. It must be able to wall its people in and make them work till communism succeeds. President Kennedy decided on Thursday to send Johnson to Berlin because Mayor Brandt had written a letter warning of the city's rotting morale required bold and quick treatment. And the United States wants you to know that the pledge he has given to the freedom of West Berlin and to the rights of Western access to Berlin is firm. Is Khrushchev entirely convinced that our words have meaning? And if he is not, what can we do short of war to convince him that they do? 1,500 American soldiers arrived in West Berlin after a 110-mile road trip across East Germany. And the Soviet press and radio described the arrival of additional American forces as a challenging military act. The Berliners know that Western strength is their only protection. There are all sorts of people who say, send the tanks and knock the damn wall down. And Kennedy, no. He understands this solves his problem. Will Khrushchev try and take over the rest of Berlin if he's putting up a wall? Will he risk a war with us? No. The wall saves us from that kind of conflict. After the Berlin crisis, Khrushchev tests the largest nuclear device ever. He basically is going to say to the Americans, you can't scare me. I'm going to scare you. The West has nuclear jitters. People worry about fallout, about war. Khrushchev has turned testing into a weapon of terror. There was tremendous anxiety and fear that if you got into a nuclear war, it was going to mean the devastation of civilization. It was the apocalypse. Let us face, without panic, the reality of our times. The fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. And let us prepare for survival by understanding the weapon that threatens us. The threat of nuclear war was the center of many of our lives. A fallout shelter could save your life in a nuclear war. The family room of tomorrow 
It's a truly ship-shape room. Only eight and a half by 12 feet in size, but with an amazing amount of storage space. It just seems unless we can control the use of such a thing as that, that, uh, that all the civilization that we've built up over all these uh, many thousands of years will just be washed out. It gives you quite a scare to think about something like that happening to us. We were close to nuclear war in 1961. And as uh, JFK said to his brother, Bobby, you know, we've had a good life, uh, but our children, what if there's a nuclear war and our children die? That's how close war felt. As he said he would, Mr. Khrushchev has exploded his giant bomb in cynical disregard of the United Nations. Kennedy recognizes that he's on the verge of yet another crisis, but he's looking in the wrong direction. And then in 1962, there's a lot of political chatter about Cuba. If at any time the communists build up in Cuba were to endanger or interfere with our security in any way, then this country will do whatever must be done to protect its own security and that of its allies. The CIA had a consultant who spotted soccer fields all along the coast in Cuba. And as he said, the Cubans play baseball, Russians play soccer. Kennedy approves a series of U-2 flights. He didn't want to get sucked in once again as he had at the time of the Bay of Pigs. He wanted hard evidence. It was the combination of very good high-level photography plus espionage that made it possible for the U.S. intelligence community to say, Mr. President, we are absolutely convinced that they are putting missiles in Cuba. Kennedy gets together a group of his closest advisors, which becomes known as the EXCOM, or Executive Committee of the National Security Council. How far advanced is this? Uh, sir, we've never seen this kind of an installation before. Are you in the Soviet Union? No, sir. How do you know this is a medium-range ballistic missile the land, sir? U.S. intelligence showed him the parts of the United States that would be hit by a nuclear attack. And the figure was... About 30 million Americans were in danger of dying. My father, he want to be recognized as equal. If you're not recognized as equal, you challenge opposite side. Uh, now, what kinds of military action are we capable of carrying out and what may be some of the consequences? We could carry out an airstrike within a matter of days. Big debates. Should we bomb? Should we invade? Back and forth. After we've launched 50 to 100 sorties, what kind of a world do we live in? How do we stop at that point? And I don't know the answer to this. Most of them thought that we should attack Cuba. Kennedy, almost alone, did not want to do that. Kennedy is the only person who has a sort of larger view. There are times when he's not just the president of the United States. He is thinking in terms of the survival of the human race. Now the question really is, what action do you take which lessens the chances of a nuclear exchange, which obviously implies failure? He was frightened that a wrong move by him could trigger a whole sequence of moves by the other side. So he wanted to slow everything down, and the method he chose was the imposition of a blockade. Kennedy will address the nation tonight on radio and television on a subject of the highest national urgency. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. With these large, long-range, and clearly offensive weapons of sudden mass destruction constitutes an explicit threat to the peace and security of all the Americas. To halt this offensive buildup, 
A strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventualities. Within minutes after the president spoke, the Navy announced that it was sustaining a blockade of Cuba with more than 40 ships and 20,000 men. They'd like heck to see us go to war, but if it's necessary to, uh, to prevent a nuclear war, I think uh, the action has to be taken at this time. Well, I think it's uh, high time we uh, stop Russia from having things her own way. I know that some action should be taken, but uh, he's going to have to tread very lightly short of war. But the American people were very frightened that they were on the edge of a cataclysm, something no one had ever experienced before, a nuclear war. We have been jammed up. We have been mobbed. People are buying like food is going out of style. Is this uh, your normal order, or are you stockpiling? Oh, I'm not stockpiling. I feel that if anything would happen, you wouldn't be able to eat it anyhow. Develop a shelter spot where there is water, food, medical supplies, a Geiger counter, and a radio. Congressional leaders were recalled from their campaign labors, blown back to Washington in military planes, and there were reports of troop movements in the Florida Keys. Cuban Premier Fidel Castro told his people that the armed blockade is the most dangerous adventure since World War II. He called President Kennedy a pirate and said a life and death struggle is underway between an empire and the revolution of a small and weak people. The Cuban militia was mobilized and the country was put on a war footing. Russia alerted its military forces and warned that the United States is playing with fire. At a special session of the United Nations Security Council, the United States, Cuba and Russia offered separate resolutions and traded bitter charges. Do you, Ambassador Zoran, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba. Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? <laughs> I am not in an American courtroom, sir, and therefore I do not wish to answer a question that is put to me in the fashion in which a prosecutor does. In due course, sir, you will have your reply. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. You know, each side didn't know what the other side was doing, and there was a lot of room for miscalculation. We believe there are about 25 Soviet ships moving toward Cuba. If the vessel does not stop, refuses to heed the instructions, force will be applied to assure that it does stop. Nikita Khrushchev says Soviet ships will never submit to the United States blockade. The next few days are critical. Who is going to blink first? A dispatch just in, a late development. 25 Soviet ships steam toward Cuba. If the ship's captains do not stop, force will be used to stop them. It was all a truly historic drama taking place every moment of every day. We are now in the most dangerous situation since the end of World War II. The next 48 hours will be decisive. Right up to the last minute, the first ship looked like it was going through the barrier. And at that point, Kennedy would have had to do something more. What it was uh, wasn't even clear to him. The White House was on the point of being evacuated. They thought that this was the early stages of uh, World War III. You can listen to the tapes of the missile crisis. And on the last day, when we seem so close to war, you can hear the voices becoming a little bit more ragged and a little bit more urgent. President Kennedy is the calm voice. Well, let's be prepared for either one tomorrow. Let's wait and see if they fire our. Meanwhile, I'm not convinced yet of the invasion. And at the last minute, the Soviet ships turned around. Khrushchev has changed his position. There was an announcement from Moscow 
that they would withdraw the missiles. And I said, the other guy just blinked. This is the day we have every reason to believe when the world came out from under the most terrible threat of nuclear holocaust since the end of World War II. The message to President Kennedy was long and rambling. But for the first time, Mr. Khrushchev acknowledged the presence in Cuba of Soviet missiles. He argued they were defensive in nature, but he said he understood the president's feeling about them. He said he would withdraw the missiles if President Kennedy would promise not to invade Cuba. The uh, following is the text of uh, President Kennedy's statement of uh, noon. I welcome Chairman Khrushchev's statesmanlike decision to stop building bases in Cuba this is an important and constructive contribution to peace. There was an incredible sigh of relief uh, in the country and in the world. With the tranquil courage of the great leaders of democracy, John Fitzgerald Kennedy said to the communist world, enough. There have been some back and forth between Kennedy and Khrushchev, we'll make our promise not to invade Cuba, and within a matter of months, the United States will take its missiles out of Turkey. And in return for that, Khrushchev publicly and verifiably removed Soviet missiles from Cuba. The conditions of the Cold War had been altered in spirit, if not in fact, by what happened in Cuba. As a result of American determination in the crisis, morale has been raised throughout the non-communist world. Perhaps this is the beginning of more understanding be between our people. Both sides realize we need to stand back from this and we need to create a framework that's less dangerous. I have chosen this time and place to discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds, and the truth too rarely perceived, and that is the most important topic on Earth, peace. The following June, Kennedy gives the famous peace speech at American University in which he talks about changing our attitudes toward the Soviet Union. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Kennedy and his people waited for any reaction from Moscow at all. And then they got the teletype saying that for the first and only time, a speech of an American president covered a complete page of Pravda, the party newspaper. Khrushchev decided to change his world policy. The strategy of creating tension all around the American empire was dropped. And he said to his colleagues in the presidium, you know what? Let's give them a test ban treaty. The United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain promise to end all nuclear test explosions in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater. It was a big deal in the Soviet Union, the same as the United States, and Khrushchev was very proud that they stopped testing and poisoning atmosphere. Man's long, hopeful quest for peace will cease to be only a dream and will begin to acquire solid reality. The nuclear test ban treaty is one of the truly great achievements of the uh, Kennedy presidency. We shall not regret that we have made this clear and honorable national commitment to the cause of man's survival. For under this treaty, we can and must still keep our vigilant defense of freedom. People of this country are elated by the feeling that the United States finally has taken the initiative in our conflict with communism. But all along the borders of communism, we and our enemies have unfinished business. Mr. President, the headline and the story in the New York Times yesterday morning has said that the administration would try diplomacy in Vietnam, which uh, I'd assume we've been trying all along. Uh, what can we do in this situation which uh, seems to parallel other uh, famous debacles of uh, dealing with unpopular governments in the past? Well, in the first place, we ought to realize that Vietnam has been at war for 25 years. 
Kennedy had treated Vietnam as a second tier issue until 1963. He was dealing with Berlin. He was dealing with Cuba. He had his domestic challenges. He had sent troops to train the South Vietnamese army, but he wasn't happy about it. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them, we can give them equipment, we can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam, against the communists. Kennedy felt that uh, the United States had to draw a line against communist expansion. But the Soviets supported the North Vietnam regime. We supported the South. It's what becomes known as the domino theory. If South Vietnam falls, then all the rest of Southeast Asia, Laos, Cambodia, the Philippines, they might be defeated. As I believe I reported upon my return from previous visits, uh, I've been very much encouraged by the progress which the South Vietnamese forces have been making and by the assistance which our forces have rendered to them. When Vietnam started up, they believed that they had so expertly micromanaged the Cuban Missile Crisis that they could do the same in the Southeast Asian nation 10,000 miles away. The North Vietnamese were very different from the Soviets and Khrushchev. And the attempt to resolve the Vietnamese crisis through controlled escalation simply didn't work. The government of South Vietnam has been overthrown by a military coup. If we are at all involved, I hope we don't have another bay of pigs on our hands. Are we winning the war in South Vietnam? Winning? No, we're losing. Kennedy says to one of his principal aides that after he's reelected in 64, then he can talk about getting out of Vietnam. It's difficult to believe that the story of the United States in Vietnam would have followed the same course had John F. Kennedy not gone to Dallas in 1963. Do we know what Kennedy would have done if he had lived? There's all sorts of evidence to suggest that he never would have done what Lyndon Johnson did in Vietnam. This nation will keep its commitments from South Vietnam to West Berlin. Though LBJ had experienced the same crises by sitting next to Kennedy, he had not come out with the same conclusions. He did not share Kennedy's suspicion of the United States military or of military advice. Once Kennedy was gone, it was inevitable that U.S. foreign policy would change. You lost a president who was skeptical of military advice and gained one who usually took it. The official Russian announcement said he resigned. The crowds that once cheered Khrushchev wildly were left in the dark as to just what went on when the Central Committee met to name Leonid Brezhnev as the new leader of the party. My father was shocked. His successor just turned in the opposite direction and then reversed all his policies. He was very upset. He had begun a new age with the Soviet Union, a thawing of the Cold War, not complete, but the beginning of something. But things changed. The Cuban Missile Crisis showed that neither side could gain a military victory over the other side. So therefore, the competition had to take a different form. It was beginning of the very rapid changes in the relations between two countries. Next period in our history will compete in the economy. In the end, we couldn't defeat the Soviet Union militarily, but we could demonstrate that we had a much better attractive society. The United States of America wants to see the Cold War end. We want sanity and security and peace for all. And above all, President Kennedy, I'm sure, would regard as his best memorial the fact that in his three years as president, the world became a little safer and the way ahead became a little brighter.
here comes Air Force number one, the President's plane now touching down. There's Mrs. Kennedy, and the crowd yells, and the President of the United States. And I can see his suntan all the way from here. Looking at how things actually went, it wasn't just a trip to Dallas. It was a political trip, preparing for the 1964 elections. Shaking hands now with the Dallas people, Governor and Mrs. Conley. Governor Conley on your left. It was whether Kennedy could use his charisma and his influence to get all the squabbling Democrats in Texas to come together before the election the next year. And here comes the president now. In fact, he's not in his limousine. He's departed the limousine, and he is reaching across the fence, shaking hands. In those days, everybody could get a lot closer to the president. I was standing behind Mrs. Kennedy, and I saw a hand reach through the chain link fence and break off one of the red roses. Thousands of children now swarming, trying to get over the fence. The Dallas police trying to keep them back. This is great for the people and uh, makes the eggshells even thinner for the Secret Service, whose job it is to guard the man. Well, the trip had gone terrifically well in Texas. Pretty hard to write a script for it going any better. Thousands will be on hand for that motorcade now, which will be downtown Dallas. A number of my classmates were gone. They were at the parade. My father had been invited to have lunch with Kennedy at the Trade Center. There was a, a mood, a climate of excitement. The speech of President Kennedy at the Dallas Trademark will be broadcast by 570 Radio. Stay tuned for the President's Dallas speech at the Trademark on 570 Radio. Bulletin just into the KILZ News Terminal. They find Dallas. Three shots were fired at the motorcade of President Kennedy's day in downtown Dallas. Police radios are carrying that the president has been hit. Parker Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. This is Walter Grind Guide in our newsroom. And there has been an attempt on the life of President Kennedy. Let's turn the mic on. I can't hear you, Johnny. What do you want? You want me to move back a little bit? Is it all right now? Is this all right? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you the chief cameraman and assistant news director of WFA Television. This is Bert Schiff. Bert, we have brought the people pretty much up to date. Uh, would you tell them exactly what you know as of this point? Well, Jay, I was standing at the uh, trademark waiting his arrival there. All of a sudden, the uh, we saw them approaching. They didn't slow down. As a matter of fact, they were going 70, 80 miles an hour past us. And then uh, I jumped in a police car and went to Parkland. These two men come running in. One of them had a large, what appeared to be a machine gun, and they was hollering for stretchers and cots and everything, and the governor, they brought him in first. What happened after this? Well, then the president come in and me behind him, and, uh, and they took them all of both of them back to the front room there. Albert Thomas, Democrat of Texas, is standing outside the corridor of the emergency room, said he's been told the president was still alive, but in very critical condition. The president has not arrived here. A group of Secret Service men and other officials is gathered where the president normally would enter and discussing heatedly with one another some subject or other. Of course, we have no idea of what. Now, here's an announcement from the platform. Mr. Uh, Eric Johnson, uh, with an announcement. It is true that our president, Governor Conley, the motorcade have been shot. We shall tell you as much as we know as so as we know anything. Thank you.
gentleman just walked in our studio that I am meeting for the first time as well as you. This is WFAA TV in Dallas, Texas. May I have your name, please, sir? My name is Abraham Zapruder. Mr. Zapruder? Zapruder, yes, sir. Zapruder. And would you tell us your story, please, sir? I got out in, uh, about a half hour earlier and get into a good spot to shoot some pictures. Five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Palmer Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved in the man. Come here. That's all right, sir. You were right, sir. As he, as he was waving back, he was, he was, the shot rang out, and he slumped down in the seat. And then all of a sudden, this next one popped, and Governor Conley grabbed his stomach and kind of laid over to the side. And then another one, it was just all so fast, and President Kennedy reached up and grabbed, looked like he's grabbed his ear and blood just started gushing out. Did you see the person who fired the No, not, I didn't see any person fire the weapon. You only heard it? I only heard it. And I looked up and saw a man running up this hill. If it's a conspiracy, not only the president was hit, the governor was hit, who knows if the next shot would have been for Lyndon Johnson. Johnson's car pulls into the emergency bay at Parkland Hospital. Four agents reach in and they grab Johnson and pull him out and start to run him down one corridor around looking for a safe place. Mr. Johnson, his whereabouts are being kept secret for security reasons. Uh, if anyone knows where Mr. Johnson is, uh, it is not us at this moment. That was a signal moment in our cultural history. Suddenly it occurred to us the right thing to do is to turn on television. Reports continue to come in, but in a confused and fragmentary fashion. President Kennedy has been given a blood transfusion at Parkland Hospital here in Dallas in an effort to save his life. It was odd because uh, there were no commercials. It was just a continuous experience. For two priests and have entered the emergency room at Parkland Hospital where he rests after the assassination attempt which now was about a half hour ago. What are your feelings right now, man? I'm absolutely shocked, stunned. We have the same birthday. I, I'm just crazy about it. I mean, who would want to shoot the president? What did he do? I mean, he's been doing so much for the country. Did someone go out there and shoot him? A flash from Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead of bullet wounds. This is the latest information we have from Dallas. I will repeat with the greatest regret, two priests who were with President Kennedy say he has died of bullet wounds. Malcolm Kildove, the assistant press secretary, was filling in for the regular press secretary and then he had to draw himself up to give the most fateful announcement that a press secretary might have ever had to give. All the cameras were rolling. And I remember he put his fingers like this on the desk and pressed very hard to stop his hands trembling. Do it again. Go on, man. Go on, man. President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today. Here in Dallas, he died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Slow it down. I have no other detail regarding the assassination of the president. Yeah. The people standing here are stunned, just as all of us are, beyond belief that the president of the United States is dead. All over the world, people are going to remember all their lives what they were doing when they first heard that President Kennedy had been killed. The crowds are standing around in silence and sorrow in the rain. The strange thing is you don't even notice it's raining. And if you do notice, you don't care. I just can't believe it. I feel like uh, someone in my own family is dead. Is dead. I just can't believe it. Ma'am? I can't say that. <laughs> like a daze. You don't know what's going on. Why? Why did it happen? Who would have done such a thing as he questioned? In the first minutes and hours 
chaos and confusion was radiating out from the scene itself. It was very pervasive. Secret Service agents thought the gunfire was from an automatic weapon, fired possibly from a grassy knoll. I saw some police run up this grassy slope. I thought, they're chasing a gunman. I ran with them. The report is that the attempted assassins, we now hear it was a man and a woman. I got to the top, looked around. A policeman went over the fence, so I went over the fence too. There was nothing there. A television newsman said that he looked up just after the shot was fired and saw a rifle being withdrawn from a fifth or sixth floor window. It was originally thought that the shots came from in here, and now it's believed that the shots came from this building here. I see police officers running back toward the Texas School Book Depository building. They are going to continue searching in that building for the would-be assassin of the president. The center of downtown Dallas is in a virtual state of siege. They are combing the floors of the Texas Book Depository building in an effort to find the suspected assassin. In the building on the sixth floor, we found an area near a window that had partially been blocked off by boxes of books and also the uh, three spent shells that had apparently been fired from a rifle. Crime Lab Lieutenant J.C. Day just came out of that building with a British 303 rifle. It was a 7.65 Mauser. A high-powered army or Japanese rifle of 25 caliber. A 3030 rifle. Much of the first things you hear are going to be wrong. And to some degree, you were constantly trying to separate out what seemed to be a fact. In Dallas, a Dallas policeman just a short while ago was shot and killed while chasing a suspect. J.D. Tippett, a good experienced police officer, was shot three times in the chest in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. Then the manager of a shoe store saw the suspect walk into the Texas theater. Someone has been arrested in one of the downtown theaters. Uh, they don't know if it was the uh, man who shot the policeman or the person who actually shot President Kennedy. Police suddenly jumped this man and started to drag him out of the theater, hustled him out to the car as the crowd broke and started to maul the police officers and grab this man, trying to run with him. They shouted murder, and the officers hustled him into the car and ran away just as fast as they could. As we mentioned a short while ago, a number of arrests have been made in Dallas in the wake of President Kennedy's death. We have scenes of one of those arrests in the downtown area. This was just after a Dallas policeman was shot in the vicinity of a downtown movie house. Bentley, what's your first name? Paul, Paul, Paul Bentley. Was Captain Bentley. Bentley. approached him, and as he approached him, uh, the man hit McDonald in the face with his left hand, reached for the pistol with his right hand, and as he reached for his pistol, I grabbed him along with two or three other officers. What did he say to you after he was arrested? He just said, uh, this is it. It's all over with now. This is a picture of him. He probably does not look exactly like this now, after he's been questioned. That's Lee Oswald. The president is shot. Then a police officer is shot. Then someone named Lee Harvey Oswald is arrested. Oswald may be a suspect in the assassination. Who is he? Lee Oswald of Dallas, a former Marine who spent some time in Russia, who at one time had applied for Soviet citizenship. The description that we had of the suspect in Oak Cliff was similar to the description we had and the man we were looking for as the assassin. But uh, at that time, we had not been able to connect the two in any way. Down there in this third floor corridor, a crowd of cameramen, reporters, wait for a possible appearance of the man accused of killing President Kennedy and a Dallas police officer. Now. There will be a great deal of confusion. Mr. Oswald is put through the door. I don't know if you saw him. Oswald lives at 1026 North Beckley. He's an employee of a bookbinding firm in the building, which the police and Secret Service men believe the president was shot today. Mrs. Kennedy accompanied the body in an ambulance from the hospital to the airport where it will be flown back to Washington. 
So they run everyone out of the emergency room of the hospital completely on the first floor there, and uh, they come out uh, and told us that uh, we would have to help remove the remains into a casket. Lyndon Johnson had ordered that the body be brought immediately to Air Force One, so there was a little tug of war. They almost shook the crucifix off of the top of the coffin as they were trying to get that coffin out of the hospital. Took him out and put him into the hearse, and uh, one of the Secret Service men, well, about two or three of them got into the hearse and just drove off and uh, left Mr. O'Neill and the uh, rest of us just standing there. Vice President Johnson is expected to be sworn in as president aboard an airliner before flying back to the nation's capital. Not everyone realized that Johnson was already the president because he, in fact, had taken the oath in January 61, the same oath the president takes. Johnson wanted to show the American people that the government was functioning without interruption. And also, perhaps, he wanted to show that his predecessor's family bore him no ill will for the assassination. Lyndon Baines Johnson is flying back to Washington to take the reins of government, at which time uh, President Johnson will have to take into his hands the reins of the most powerful nation in the world. We think November 22nd, 1963, as a date when a president was killed. But it was also a date when a president was created. Is there any doubt in your mind, Chief, that Oswald is the man who killed the I president? I think this is the man that killed the president. Yes, sir. Is there any evidence that anyone else may have been linked with Oswald to this shooting? At this time, we don't believe so. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. The no, so I did. People keep asking me that. Sir? Did you shoot the president? I work in that building. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. Did you Come shoot on, the man. president? No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I lived in the Soviet Union. What time did you leave? I'm just a patsy. the president? This is room 317, Homicide Bureau, here at the Dallas Police Station. As you see, they are bringing the weapon that will allegedly used in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy this afternoon at 12.30 here in Dallas. 6.5 apparently made in Italy in 1940. Police had traced a rifle purchased in Chicago by mail order to Osby. He bought it under the alias of A. Heidel, Handwriting experts have established that the uh, handwriting on the purchase order was, in fact, made by Oswald. At the price of $12.78, the life of the President of the United States apparently was born. In the wake of the Kennedy assassination, the Dallas police, on the one hand, they, they were committing all of the resources to trying to solve the crime. But you're moving in the doorway. When you get him in the doorway, all the way the doorway. On the other hand, they were ill-equipped to handle this tsunami of reporters. Well, I was uh, questioned by a judge. However, I uh, protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation. In bringing Oswald out, they were, of course, doing something that you would never see happen today. But they were trying to cooperate with the press with the understanding that there would not be questions shouted at him. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been. Nobody said what? Sir? You have been. Nobody said what? Okay, man. Okay. okay. What did you do in Russia? A policeman hit me. At 1.35 this morning, a complaint was read. It charged that, quote, Lee Harvey Oswald did voluntarily and with malice aforethought kill John F. Kennedy by shooting him with a gun, end quote. Following the reading of the complaint, Oswald said, that's ridiculous. 
Within hours of the assassination, it was very obvious to virtually everyone in Dallas law enforcement that Oswald had killed Kennedy. Chief, can you tell us in summary what directly links Oswald to the killing of the president? Well, the fact that he was on the floor where the shots were fired from immediately before the shots were fired, the fact that he was seen carrying a package to the building, the fact that... Uh, when he was carrying that package, the same day? Yesterday morning. After the shooting in Dealey Plaza, Oswald was the only employee at the book depository that fled the building. 45 minutes later, he shoots and kills Officer J.D. Tippett. Half hour later, at the Texas Theater, he resisted arrest by pulling his gun on the arresting officer. During 12 hours of interrogation by the Dallas Police Department over the weekend, he told one provable lie after another. Did you buy that rifle? Press dispatches you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Within a day or so thereafter, when they discovered what a complete nut this guy was, they were satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt that Oswald had acted alone. There's only one thing that I can tell you without going into the evidence that this case is cinched, that this man killed the president. And there, there's no question in, in my mind about it. We plan to transfer this man, not tonight. You men will be here by no later than 10 o'clock in the morning. Why, it will, that will be early enough for you. Chief, do you have any concern for the safety of your prisoner in view of the high feeling among the people of Dallas over the assassination of the president? No, but precautions will be taken, of course, but I'm not, uh, I don't think that the people will, uh, will try to take the prisoner away from us. Oswald is to be taken soon to the county jail. That's true. And you are going to take him there how, sir? We are going to use a, an armored motor vehicle to take him. Dallas police meant to transfer Lee into the regular prison during the night to avoid the press. And then someone must have overruled them so that Lee could be photographed by the press during the transfer. We're standing by awaiting the transfer of Oswald from city jail to county jail. And uh, for that report, here is ABC's Bill Lord at the city jail. Bill, what's the situation? Well, I am presently in the basement of the Dallas Municipal Building, and it is like an armed camp. Police officials are frankly worried. They don't want anything to happen to Oswald. It is through this corridor of newsmen, photographers, and policemen that Lee Oswald will be brought to a vehicle for transfer to the Dallas County Jail, a distance of about 15 blocks, which ironically is just across from the scene where President Kennedy was assassinated on Friday. Anticipation has built up here in downtown Dallas, Dallas in front of the county jail. They are waiting for a glimpse of Lee Oswald. There he is. Here he comes. Now the prisoner uh, wearing a white spider is from his t-shirt. Let me have it. I want it. Being let out by uh, Captain Fritz. There is the prisoner. There is Lee. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. Absolute panic, absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Detectives have their guns drawn. There is no question about it. Oswald has been shot at point blank range, fired into his stomach. He is shot. He is shot. Oswald, he is shot. It is Oswald. You're on. Was that the man that shot the man, or do you know? That is the man that shot the man. Immediately after the shooting, our only witnesses that we could talk to were other reporters. Where did he go, Pierre? Well, he was here. He just, uh, they just put the gun there. I saw the flash on the black sweater. Oh, yeah, right in the belly. And the guy brought right. Oh, wait, did you see his gun? Did he miss his stomach? No, I saw him there. He was in the group of men right here. The best rating is one of us or what? Uh, I thought he was one of the detectives. You know, he had a hat. The situation is now that Lee Harold Oswell has been shot. 
The man who saw the shot fired said it was fired by a man wearing a black hat, a brown coat, a man that everyone down here thought was a Secret Service agent. We can hear sirens outside, and an ambulance apparently is moving down now into the basement. Here comes the ambulance. And uh, Oswald will be removed now. The ambulance is being pulled up in front of us here. Here comes Oswald. He's, he is ashen and unconscious at this time, now being moved in. He's not moving. He's in the ambulance now. And attendants, police are quickly climbing in. The ambulance is leaving Dallas Police Headquarters. Where will he be taken? I'm assuming Parkland Hospital. Parkland Hospital, the irony of ironies, the place where President John F. Kennedy died. Uh, I believe the man... No, don't take the microphone. Keep your head up. Let's start again. What is your reaction to the shooting of Oswald? Well, I think it's a deplorable uh, situation. Uh, the man is entitled to a fair trial. They should give him a fair trial, of course. Killing him just like that ain't none, because I ain't going to bring President Kennedy back to life. And after you get a trial, they should let him out in the street and let the people kill him. They should not only shoot him, but cut him up in pieces. Put him every one hour in a fire and set them up for one day and then the next day start again. Thank you. I got a man that I believe, I didn't see it. I think it's the man. You got, you got him, what's he look like? Uh, I can't give you a description now. He is, he, is, he is known locally. Immediately after the ambulance left, somehow I had begun to suspect that maybe the shooter was someone who was known to the police. Do you know this subject? Do you know him? Have you seen him before? Yes, I do. Is he from Dallas? Yes. He is? I, I couldn't tell you. Do you know what kind of business he happens to be in? Uh, Bob, I, I wouldn't want to say. Right. Uh, Dallas City Hall is normally a public building, but today it was really under armed guard. Jack. We, uh, is this a confirmed report as to who did the shooting? As far as I know, uh, I just got it from Vic Robertson. Uh, Vic Robertson from City Hall reports that Jack Ruby, the owner of the KSL, which is a bar in Dallas, did the shooting. My statement will be very brief. Oswald expired at 1.07 p.m. Died? He yes. died at 1.07 p.m. We have arrested the man. The man will, will be charged with murder. Who is he? The, man, the suspect's name is Jack Rubenstein, I believe. He goes by the name of Jack Ruby. And here is Associated Press, a still picture of the moment, the split second, as the shot was fired. This is the man Dallas police have identified as Jack Rubenstein, and this, of course, is Lee Harvey Oswald. You see the gun in the hand of, of Ruby, and just about to be fired. I know my own feelings were, and I think they were widely shared by many, if not most Americans. This can't be coincidental. The assassin is assassinated in the police station. What in the hell is going on? Just learned from City Hall from a very authoritative source that police are working on the assumption that there indeed is a connection between Jack Ruby and Lee Oswald, and that in some manner of speaking, Oswald's murder was to shut him up. Captain Wilfritz just told me that Ruby has said that he did it, that it was his gun, and that he had built up a tremendous grievance over the death of the president. In Jack Ruby's small mind, he thought he was going to become a big, big hero. I mean, he killed the guy who killed the president. Uh, commend what he did. I think he ought to win the Congressional Medal of Honor for it. And a lot of other good American citizens think he did exactly the right thing in shooting down this communist. Word also in just uh, now from Dallas 
that homicide chief, Captain Will Fritt, has now said that the case of President Kennedy's assassination is now closed with the death of Oswald. It may not, however, be the opinion of the U.S. Secret Service or the Federal Bureau of Investigation. is bereaved. The whole world is poorer because of his loss. But we can all be better Americans because John Fitzgerald Kennedy has passed our way. Because he has been our chosen leader at a time in history when his character, his vision, and his quiet courage have enabled him to chart a course for us, a safe course for us, through the shoals of treacherous seas that encompass the world. And now that he is relieved of the almost superhuman burden we imposed on him, may he rest in peace. Dallas today had even more to mourn. It held funeral services for one of its own, who was a victim of Friday's tragedy, Officer J.D. Tippett. There was a funeral of a very different sort today in nearby Fort Worth. This was the dreary funeral of Lee Harvey Oswald, alleged murderer of President Kennedy. The pathetic group of mourners included Oswald's mother, Marguerite, his wife, Marina, his brother, Robert, and Oswald's two children, one of them, a babe in arms. The six pallbearers you see here are newsmen. There were not enough relatives or friends on hand to serve as pallbearers. Now there is a new flag of the President of the United States flying in the White House. In President Kennedy's old Oval Office, Mrs. Evelyn Lincoln, his secretary and her aides, have removed every scrap, every vestige of the signs of the personal touches of President Kennedy. We know from history that one test of societies is how do they handle the transfer of power at the top? Lyndon Johnson, whatever you thought of him, and a lot of people disliked him greatly, some even hated him, would be the president of the United States. I think it shouted about the strength of the country and that we swear by the rule of law. standing here today. Johnson knows he has to show the country that the ship of state is sailing on under a new captain. But at the same time, he can't appear to be too anxious to assume power. And he has to keep the Kennedy people on board with him. So that speech means everything. No words are strong enough to express our determination to continue the forward thrust of America that he began. The people of Europe just cannot believe that a lone Avenger made his way into a major police station and killed without difficulty the most celebrated and infamous criminal in the United States. One of the most important things that happened after Oswald's murder was that we 
you know, were forever denied the why. I mean, people at the time believed he did it. The question was why. There are questions continuing, really coming up about the possibility of an international plot. There's still all this thought that the Russians might be behind it, or Cuba might be behind it. Johnson sees there's a real danger in that. You want to put these rumors to rest. Investigations into all the facts of these last four days may not be limited to the state of Texas or the FBI. Some congressmen already have suggested a congressional investigation. Killing a president wasn't a federal crime at the time. So you had the federal government intervening in still what was a local murder. There certainly was a concern of competing investigations. There was the Dallas criminal investigation. There was the state of Texas court of inquiry. And there were committees on both sides of Congress, while, of course, the FBI had been given the job to conduct a full-scale investigation. Johnson realizes something has to be done. He realizes that he has to appoint a body that the public will respect to look into this. Yes, Mr. President. I've got to have a top blue ribbon uh, presidential commission to investigate this assassination. I'm going to ask Chloe and Dulles and Ford and Boggs and Cooper and Russell and Chief Justice Warren as chairman. If there's one public governmental official in the United States universally respected for his integrity, it is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren. If there's one person in Congress that everyone respects, it's Richard Russell of Georgia. He has to get them both on the commission. There is, however, a problem. Russell is a segregationist through and through and despises Warren for the decisions that he's made on the court. Johnson thought if they can agree on a verdict, then I ought to be satisfying 90% of American public opinion. Mr. Russell, 2191. Um, I'm highly honored you think about it in connection with it. But I, I, I couldn't say that with Chief Justice Warren. I, I don't like that man. You can serve with anybody for the good of America, and you're going to do it. I can't arrest you, and I'm not going to put the FBI on you, but uh, you're goddamn sure going to serve, I'll tell you that. Linda Johnson was known as the greatest salesman one-on-one -on -one who ever lived. So he meets first with Warren, and he says, if I asked you to put on your uniform and fight for America, you'd do it. I'm asking you to fight for America in a different way. Then Johnson has to get Richard Russell. Mr. President, please now. No, it's already done. It's been announced, hell. You mean you give me Yes, sir, I made the announcement. It's already in the papers, and you own it. Well, I think you did wrong getting Warren. I know damn well you got wrong getting me, but no. I hope it's the best. Yeah. No, I think that's what you do. That's kind of American, both of you are. Produced by NBC News, which is solely responsible for its content. The Warren Commission, appointed Friday night, will investigate and make a report on the murder. As yet, it has said nothing about how it will proceed or when. In the meantime, again, the FBI is investigating every lead it can find and will turn its report over to President Johnson probably this week. It was the FBI's hope that its report would be, uh, if not the final word, the semi-final word, and that the commission's job would be to read it and then essentially endorse the findings of the report. The members of the Warren Commission, Earl Warren, John Sherman Cooper, Jerry Ford, Alan Dose, Hale Boggs, Richard Russell, and John J. McCloy realized at their initial meeting that they had to do an independent investigation. They didn't want to be a stamp for the FBI or the Secret Service. There are three issues the commission had to grapple with. You know, did Oswald commit the physical act of the murder? And even if he did the physical act, did he have forces behind him? And then, of course, what's Ruby's involvement in this? You had various branches of the investigation traveling, interviewing witnesses, collecting evidence, bringing it back to the commission. Let's see, the time of day was about, uh, well, we're not very far from, uh, two hours from it. There were questions, how would they deal with the different stories about shooters from the grassy knoll and shooters from different directions? The lawyers from the commission took 395 depositions 
and there were 94 witnesses that appeared before the commission. Lyndon Johnson wants to report out so it doesn't interfere with the election in November. Warren left for Dallas because he was a man who had spent his early career as a, as a courtroom prosecutor. He understood a crime scene. He wanted to stand in that window and see whether this was a shot that a marksman could make. While he was there, Warren felt he should talk to Ruby. There, there was all these suggestions that Ruby had killed Oswald to silence him. So Warren, I think, wanted to hear from Ruby himself. The Warren Commission realized they were going to have to invest a lot more time than was anticipated. It was from maybe two to three month operation to the conception that it'll probably take six months. The hourglass of time was running out on them. Can you say if you still think it was one man? I think we better not get into that uh, area, you know. The report will cover all of that in great detail. This committee labored 10 months, then brought forth a document close to a 1,000 pages. President Johnson received that report today. What the public understood and what I understood is these were very honorable men. They thought that the commission had done a good job and they would come up with an answer. When the Warren Commission report came out, I believed it. We were still in a time when you tended to believe what officials told you. It is now 15 seconds after 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Sunday, September the 27th. As of this moment, the report of the President's Commission is public record. For the next half hour, we will search it for answers. First must come the answers to the two great overriding questions. Who killed John F. Kennedy? The Commission answers unequivocally, Lee Harvey Oswald. Was Oswald acting alone? Or was he a member of a conspiracy? The commission answers, he acted alone. We knew most people were not going to read all of the Warren Commission report, so CBS News wanted to be able to bring to air an understandable form for the public at large what the Warren Commission itself has found. There was nothing to support the speculation that Oswald was an agent, employee, or informant of the FBI or the CIA or any other governmental agency. Oswald owned the murder rifle. The mail order purchase slip for that rifle was in his handwriting. Oswald's palm print was found on a surface of the gun. The media had all concluded that this was the most exhaustive investigation. Case closed. Oswald did it alone. The commission concludes that three shots were fired, all of them from this sixth floor window in the Texas School Book Depository. The cumulative evidence of eyewitness, firearms, and ballistic experts and medical authorities demonstrated that the shots were fired from above and behind President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. When the Warren Commission came out with their report, the majority of Americans uh, accepted the findings of the Warren Commission. The bullet entered here came out just below the President's Adam's apple. The Commission believes that the same bullet then entered the right shoulder of Governor Connolly passed out through his chest, continued through his right wrist, and on into his left thigh. The report has been generally accepted throughout the country. I think it reflects the thoroughness with which they went into it. And I think at least it has dispelled many of the rumors and the speculations that surrounded this, this very tragic event. Well, I'm quite satisfied uh, that it has been very well covered entirely. It leaves no doubt in my mind that Lee actually did assassinate the president of the United States and kill off the tippet. In the end, we find confronting each other the liar, the misfit, the defector on the one hand, and seven distinguished Americans on the other. And yet, exactly here, we must be careful that we do not say too much. Oswald was never tried for any crime, and perhaps therefore there will forever be questions of substance and detail, raised by amateur detectives, professional skeptics, and serious students as well. We are the jury all of us, in America and throughout the world. The reaction to the report initially was very positive, but that didn't last very long. This book is the number one bestseller on the nonfiction list in the country, Rush to Judgment by Mark Lane. It's gained a vast number of readers in the recent groundswell of skepticism about the findings of the Warren report. We did not envision 
the breadth and the scope of the criticism. The author has some highly provocative and controversial things to say. So please greet Mr. Mark Lane. No matter how illustrious the members were, we were not going to be reassured by a commission. We're already having a little disagreement here. Yeah. Well, the commercials were on. What were you saying, David? Well, I think I disagree almost totally with Mark Lane on several counts. I don't know where to begin. Let me show you some, just in case we have a chance. That is a picture of Jack Ruby. And this was taken five minutes after the assassination in front of the Texas School Book Depository building. The commission said Ruby was not there. This is a picture showing how the commission published it. He wasn't there when they published the picture you because they, doing? they cropped him out. Chief Justice Warren and that commission of notable Tell, tell me something about some facts instead of your deep faith you're, in the Chief Justice. You're accusing How about that, them David? of deliberate malfeasance. You are part of the media which prevented the American people from finding out what you happened until now. You are alarming the American people. I say Secret the American people unpublished. should be alarmed. The public had been kept in the dark for so long about this, but had an undying thirst which can only be quenched by getting facts. We have a right to know who killed our president and why he died, and we can't get that from reading the Warren Report. The critics of the Warren Commission have three different points of view. One, we were simply incompetent. Two, we were thoroughly corrupt. And then there's those that say both of the above. I want someone to tell me that to my face. At the start, Lane was almost alone. Now he's just one among a growing band of doubters. Their books and articles are on the newsstands, they're in the supermarkets. Now, according to a recent poll, only one in three Americans remains convinced that the Warren Report has the whole story. When you have a great number of people devoting their lives to looking at every word, every comma, uh, they can create a lot of mischief. I believe very firmly that uh, Ruby and Oswald knew each other, and certainly uh, Tippett and Ruby knew each other. Before we proceed with that uh, kind of uh, questioning, let me ask you, what kind of uh, conspiracy do you think? Was it a communist, a uh, left-wing, a right-wing conspiracy? I am convinced that there were two riflemen. The Warren Commission was set up, as you know, at the request and urging of the Communist Party. It's obvious that he was working for somebody else at that moment, and that somebody else could not be anyone else than Fidel Castro. There is no possibility of Oswald having been in the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository. He may have been the servant of the Castro Mao Zedong Communist School of Violence. There was an entire world of assassination buffs. Some raised valid questions. Could a bullet, which had done as much, have come out looking like bullet 399. It is another one of the very many highly improbables that we are asked to accept by the Warren Commission if we are to accept the validity of their full report. Some had completely mad theories. Cody was killed by karate chop to the throat in September, I believe, of 1964. But everyone, I believed, had a right to give their views. You have apparently succeeded in persuading the majority of the American people that we cannot trust the most august conceivable panel to do a responsible job. You talk about faith in these institutions or faith in the FBI as if it's a religious experience to read the Warren Report. I think of the contrary, that all we're supposed to have faith in a democracy is in our own ability to look at the facts and reach our own conclusions. The decreasing trust by Americans in their government all started with the Kennedy assassination. By 1966, there's this cultural revolution in the United States. I mean, we're deeply enmeshed in Vietnam. There's a lot of protests, there have been riots, and there's a sense that things have seriously gone wrong. We've gone off the rails since November 63, and the Warren Report is a very important part of that loss of confidence in the government. I don't think that all the uh, facts were brought out. I think something was held back. I think there were more involved in it than just Oswald. I don't know how in the world I could ever reach a conclusion that one person assassinated him. This is ridiculous. I saw the whole thing on television. I just happened to be home at that time. And I don't think that Oswald was. Uh, I think that he was uh, working for the CIA myself. Why doesn't America believe the Warren Report? Because of the conspiracy theorists 
who have put this case under a high-powered microscope, splitting hairs and then proceeding to split the split hairs. The Kennedy case is now the most complex murder case by far in world history. Nothing even remotely comes close. We are left with the series of real and critical questions about the assassination. Questions which have not been answered to the satisfaction of the people of the United States. When President Kennedy was killed, he was not killed by one man. He was shot from a number of different directions by different guns. The story has been suppressed. Witnesses have been killed. And this is your country. We aren't trying to hide a thing from you or from Mr. Epstein or Mr. Lane or the world. We are laying it all out that it's right here in the notes of testimony. And if we have transposed in error a possibly into a probably, then we are delighted to have you point it out to us. But you can do so only because we've laid it on the line. The Warren report said that Lee Harvey Oswald shot the president from his window in the Texas School Book Depository. Three years after Kennedy's assassination, the major question is still a simple one. Did the Warren Commission with all that time and all these resources, get its answers right. Tonight, we'll go over those arguments one by one, area by area. As the assassination was taking place, a Dallas businessman called Abraham Zapruder stood behind that low concrete wall, looking down at Elm Street. As the president was coming down from Houston Street, making his turn, it was about halfway down there, I heard a shot. And I heard another shot or two, I couldn't tell it was one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. The Warren Commission could use the film and each frame to reconstruct each moment of the assassination. Part of the reason why I think the film captured the American imagination is because it pushes us to think about something more complex. And each person who looks at it, you know, people see different things. Where did the shots come from? If the shots did not all come from the book depository window, then there was most likely some form of conspiracy. I think that the, that the massive head wound where the president's head was literally blown apart came from a quartering angle on the grassy knoll. He struck and his head doesn't go directly back this way, but it goes back and, and over this way, which would be consistent with the shot from that direction in Newton's law of motion. Seven men on a railroad bridge right here said that when the shots were fired, they looked toward the wooden fence, and each of the seven said he saw puffs of white smoke come from here. You glanced over to underneath that green tree, and you could see a, a little puff of smoke. It looked like a puff of steam or cigarette smoke. When you stop to think about it, no one saw anyone with a gun, a rifle, on the grassy knoll. No expended cartridges from a weapon were found there. Not one bullet, other than those fired from Oswald's rifle, has ever been found and linked to the assassination. Now, there were two doctors and one priest who claimed that, who said flatly that there were uh, entrance wounds in the president's neck. If the wound in the president's throat was an entrance wound, then clearly this would be proof that the bullet came from the front. Mark Lane has suggested that this wasn't an exit wound by the president's tie, but an entry wound that Kennedy was hit in the throat from the front. The doctor at Parkland didn't want to talk about the president's injuries, but the press more or less forced him to. And the wound in the president's throat was pretty clean. He thought it was an entrance wound. What about this uh, wound that you observed uh, in, the, in the front of the president's neck? Actually, I didn't really give it much thought and uh, realized that Perhaps it'd have been better had I have done so. There was a wound in the back of the neck that had not been seen by the Parkland doctors because they never turned the body over. You did not turn the president over? No, there's really no reason to. It made very little difference to me since um, my immediate concern was with an attempted resuscitation. You can explain this ad infinitum, and people will only remember that a doctor at Parkland said he'd been shot, you know, from possibly the front. So it's, you know, kind of trying to put the genie back in the bottle. A bullet hit the president from the back, bullet hit him from the front. The bullet which killed him came from the right front. Unless the laws of physics were not working that day, 
The reaction of the president tells us where that shot came from. Some critics say by the very fact that in the picture you can clearly see the explosion of the bullet on the front side of the president, that that certainly indicates the bullet came from the front. Well, I don't believe any physicist has ever said that. Quite contrary, it does indicate uh, that the bullet was coming from behind. It's a minor explosion where pieces of material go generally in the direction of the bullet. If you look at the individual frames of the Zapruder film, at 312, frame 312, President's head's okay. At frame 313, one eighteenth of a second later, the President is struck in the head. In what direction is the President's head pushed? Not backwards, but slightly forward. Is there any doubt that the wound at the back of the President's head was the entry wound? Uh, there is absolutely no doubt, sir. So at the all-important moment of impact, the president's head is pushed forward, indicating a shot from the rear where Lee Harvey Oswald was. CBS News Inquiry, The Warren Report, continues. The time span between shots is a point upon which the critics have seized. Could Oswald have fired three shots in 5.6 seconds? There was a lot of attention being given to the Zapruder film and when exactly the president was hit first and then hit second. CBS News had a tower and target track constructed to match exactly the heights and distances in Dealey Plaza. If there wasn't enough time, then you would have a second shooter. Oswald was not an expert shot. He was a good shot. But making the shots was not that tough at all. CBS did it. A guy from the military did it. Those three shots he got off in 2.6 seconds. The Zapruder film became the lens through which the assassination was seen. If it didn't happen on the Zapruder film, it didn't happen. Zapruder started his camera after the limousine was about 70 feet into Dealey Plaza. Well, Oswald had the presidents in his sights for many seconds before that. And this gets into the whole question is how much time did Oswald have to shoot the president? There are so many interesting questions and problems that come from the film. We believe so much in the image. We believe so much in, in the sort of ultimate truth of film and of images. And then they become our memory. Is it impossible that the bullet would have gone through President Kennedy, gone through Governor Connolly, and not suffered any more damage than is shown in this photograph. I, I would hesitate really to say that it is absolutely 100% impossible, but it is highly improbable. Could a single bullet have wounded both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly? The single bullet theory has become perhaps the most controversial aspect of the report. If the Warren Commission couldn't prove that one shot had hit both men, that meant there were two shooters, Ipso facto, there's a conspiracy. The conspiracy theorists claim that the second shot was a magic bullet. They argue that a bullet would have had to make a right turn and then a left turn in midair. The reality is that Connolly was not seated directly in front of Kennedy. If you figure out the alignment of where the men sat, and if you look down the man liquor car sano, as I did, and as the others did who conducted the on-site test, and had the automobile placed in the position, it is perfectly plain, I submit to you, that the bullet that exited from President Kennedy's throat would have to strike either the automobile, which it did not, or someone else in the automobile. To believe that it didn't hit Governor Connolly, that would be a real magic bullet, one that disappeared in thin air. To the Dallas County Courthouse for more developments on the Jack Ruby verdict. Jack Ruby has just been found guilty of murder with malice and has been given the maximum sentence, death in the electric chair, after the jury deliberated two hours and 25 minutes. Just what do you think of this verdict? I believe that Jack Ruby was a paid killer to close the mouth of my son, Lee Harvey Oswald. The question of whether Ruby knew Oswald before or was in coats to kill him is one of the most important questions. 
because Ruby knew people in criminal activities. There was a lot of investigation about a potential conspiracy. Ruby would have been one of the most unlikely and worst hit men that the mob could ever get. On November the 24th, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to have been transferred at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, the evidence is undisputed that Jack Ruby was at home asleep. Then he got dressed and drove downtown. The receipt shows that Ruby was sending a money order to one of his strippers from a Western Union office across from the courthouse at 11.17 a.m. We know that at 11.20, three minutes later, a block away, Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald. The evidence showed that he was down there anywhere from 5 to 15 seconds. 5 to 15 seconds. If this is a hired assassin who is supposed to have some advanced information, he is the world's best timer. What type of man is he? Uh, Jack is a very emotional type person, and uh, uh, as I was saying a while ago, he's a type man that probably would give you a shirt off his back at one moment and then turn around and do something as nutty as this in the next. I never used the term angry. That's not on my vocabulary. He was known for a quick temper, and later, as it turned out, he was hooked on two kinds of speed, preluding and benzedrine, at the time of the shooting. He had uh, been here at the police station uh, during the past two days talking with newsmen and uh, distributing his card and also making friends. Jack Ruby was a police and media groupie. Ruby thought he was our friend. Saw him in this very same room Friday night when we had the defendant up here. If some of you will recall, he asked a question from out here in the audience. He stand right back here and I didn't know who he was. I thought he was a member of the press. And he told me as we walked out of here that he was a nightclub operator here. Ruby's act was that of a vigilante. He wanted nothing more to be known, you know, people to flock to his nightclub to shake the hand of the man who killed, the man who killed the president. I might add, if Ruby silenced Oswald for the mob, who was supposed to silence Jack Ruby? He died of normal causes or three years later. Now, one would think that the conspiracy community would fold its tent and go home. But they continued undaunted and unfazed with this obsession. Their game is to fool you. These people want the investigation stopped. They don't want a trial at all. Please believe me. But the most recent most spectacular development in the Oswald case involves the CIA. It involves, too, the spectacular district attorney of New Orleans, a man they call the Jolly Green Giant. Do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald did not shoot President Kennedy? I don't want to get involved in the uh, speculations as to individuals, but I will say that it, uh, there's no question about the fact that there, there was a plot and there were a number of individuals involved. In 1960. Seven, he announced, I've solved the case. I've found the real assassin. We will make arrests based on that, and we will make charges based on that, and we will obtain convictions based on that. Now, you wouldn't have paid much attention to this, except he was the district attorney of New Orleans. I've spent hour after hour with Jim Garrison. He has presented his case to me, detail by detail. The Mark Lanes and the conspiracy theorists all flocked initially to Garrison. And I can report that a powerful domestic force, a force that is still part of the American structure, planned and initiated those acts that resulted in the assassination of President Kennedy. They all thought, here's a guy who's finally going to bring the case that we've been, you know, arguing about for years. If I seem somewhat confident, it is because our office is in its fifth year and has never lost a murder case. The press initially builds Garrison up because everybody believes no district attorney in his right mind would do this unless he had something. Arrested this evening in the district attorney's office was Clay Shaw, age 54 of 1313 Dauphine Street, New Orleans, Louisiana. Mr. Shaw will be charged 
with participation in a conspiracy to murder John F. Kennedy. The charges filed against me have no foundation in fact or in law. I have not been apprised of the basis of these fantastic charges and assume that in due course I will be furnished with this information and will be afforded an opportunity to prove my innocence. Clay Shore was a very well-respected businessman in New Orleans. He had been a distinguished soldier during World War II. I knew Clay Shaw, and the concept of Clay Shaw as being part of an assassination conspiracy was just too weird to be believed. Clay Shaw was also homosexual and closeted, and I think that played a part. This decision to arrest Clay Shaw, I believe, was intended to get the national media back to town. As soon as he arrested Clay Shaw, they all came back. And then they realized the truth that there isn't anything there. Garrison has based his case on the certainty that he can prove Clay Shaw is Clay or Clem Bertrand. The name Clem Bertrand was first introduced by a lawyer named Dean Andrews, who told the Warren Commission a person by that name telephoned him, suggesting he provide legal defense for Lee Oswald. Dean had described Clem Bertrand as having gay tendencies and representing uh, gays as a lawyer. Therefore, Garrison believed Clem Bertrand must be Clay Shaw. That was the extent of Garrison's investigation. Do you have enough evidence now to go to trial? Well, if, uh, if I answered that, uh, I shouldn't be district attorney. The case he has built against Clay Shaw is based on testimony that did not pass a lie detector test that Garrison ordered, and Garrison knew it. Can you say positively that the person you knew as Clay Bertrand is not the person you have seen as Clay Shaw? Scout's honor, he is not. Garrison started bribing witnesses, intimidating witnesses. He said, I could be made to uh, serve this whole nine-year sentence, or I could be cut loose right away. Hypnotizing witnesses. We decided to give him objectifying uh, machinery to make sure he was telling the truth. Leon. Leon. Does Leon have a last name? Oswald. Would you say these uh, methods were illegal? I would say very illegal and unethical. And he had everyone and their grandmother involved in the assassination. At one time, it was oil millionaires. Then it was the Minutemen. Then it was a homosexual killing. Yes, sir. Uh, do you feel that homosexuality or coercion through homosexuality was a factor in the planning or the assassination of John F. Kennedy? No comment. At one point, he had 16 assassins in Dealey Plaza. With that many assassins, I don't know how Kennedy made it to the autopsy table. Garrison announced he had discovered a code. Garrison says Jack Ruby's unlisted telephone number appears in address books belonging to Shaw and Oswald. So if you take the P and the O and you use a telephone dial, P gives you seven, O gives you six. He just changed the digits around, added digits, added letters. And you reconstruct the numbers, and, and, that, and then you subtract 1,300, and that gives you Ruby's unlisted telephone number. Well, Mr. Garrison, if the P.O. didn't exist until late 65, how could it then be Jack Ruby's phone number? Well, that's a problem for you to think over because you obviously missed the point. Whenever anyone would expose Garrison, he would then say, they're CIA agents. Because he's part of a conspiracy. Who's suppressing all of this information on whose order? I'll tell you who's suppressing it. The federal government is suppressing it. Who in the federal government? The administration, the administration of your government is suppressing it because they know that the Central Intelligence Agency... On whose order? on the order of the President of the United States. Mr. Garrison has come up with no credible evidence to support any of his theories. I think that it is unfortunate that the media of this country uh, has become so hysterical for fear of what it might see that it spends a good deal of its time and energy attacking the one serious investigation. The results of his four months of public investigation have been to damage reputations, to spread fear and suspicion, and worst of all, to exploit the nation's sorrow and doubts about President Kennedy's death. I can't make any more comments about the case except to say anybody that thinks it's just a theory is going to be awfully surprised when it comes to trial. Roll one, sound on film, Clay Shaw trial. <clears throat> Clay Shaw came to court in good spirits today. With his long-awaited trial underway, Shaw seems almost relieved that his case is finally being heard. 
Shaw sits quietly in this courthouse, chain smoking cigarettes. He does not react when the state talks about things like conspiracy. The trial went on for six weeks. It's important to note that not one witness produced by Garrison survived cross-examination. They were all proven to be unreliable at best. It was the most shameful thing you've ever seen. Everyone knew in the courtroom that Clay Shaw couldn't possibly have been more innocent. In a unanimous verdict by a 12-man jury, Shaw was found not guilty of charges that he conspired to kill the late President John Kennedy. Clay, you our first question, Tommy, don't you? Why did you do it? <laughs> After the not guilty verdict, editorials around the country says it's one of the darkest chapters in American jurisprudence history. It's just a crime. From what I saw and heard, I didn't think he had proven Clay Shaw's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I would have voted not guilty for Clay Shaw. I think that uh, Garrison feels that the end justifies the means. And he felt that if he could bring to the American people what he considered the truth about the death of their president, any means whatsoever was supposed to be used. And it didn't matter much who got hurt in the process. I would sum it up by saying that any society which allows a man like Jack Kennedy to have the top of his head torn off and then protects the assassins and obstructs any inquiry and attempt to find the truth is not a great society. Information concerning the cause of the death of your president has been withheld from you. To show you how uncredible the conspiracy theorists are, over the last 50 years, at one time or another, they have accused 42 groups, 82 assassins, and 214 people of being involved in the assassination. Could Oswald really have done this? As a reporter, you know, the greatest story for us would have been to find out somebody other than Oswald did it. And we tried hard to do that. But at every turn with the Kennedy assassination, things pointed to Oswald as not only a shooter, but the shooter and the only shooter. At its core, this is a very simple case. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. If a person is innocent of a crime, chances are there's not going to be any, any evidence pointing towards guilt. Why? Because he's innocent. But with Oswald, the physical evidence, the direct and circumstantial evidence, the scientific evidence, everything points towards his guilt. We'll never know why Lee Harvey Oswald killed Kennedy, because he's dead. But there are certain things we do know. At the age of 13, a probation officer said he remembered Oswald as a truant, a troubled boy in need of psychiatric help, without which he might turn violent. After starting in high school, he promptly joined the Marines. Oswald's Marine career ended in 1959 when he was dishonorably discharged. A month later, he was in Moscow, where he announced his decision to renounce his American citizenship are you a Marxist? Well, I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But I, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. He desperately wants to become a Soviet citizen. He wants to renounce his American citizenship. They turn him down. What does he do? He slashes his wrist, tries to commit suicide. Lee Harvey Oswald had these dreams or delusions that he'd been harboring for a long time of an act that would lift him from his obscurity. A squad mate of his in the Marines said that Oswald wanted to do something that 10,000 years from now people would be talking about. It looked to me like a, uh, an ira a stupid, irrational act. The opportunity presented itself to him, and he probably wanted to make a mark on society by suddenly occurred to him that he could. People who think Oswald was sort of a patsy and, and such an ineffectual, innocent person, forgot that when Oswald was stopped by a police car and a policeman gets out unarmed to talk to him, Oswald shoots him four times in the middle of the body. That, plus his, his previous attempt on General Walker. Interestingly, on Saturday morning, in the Dallas Morning News, it said that there may be a connection between this guy who was just arrested for killing a police officer and President Kennedy and this effort to assassinate 
General Walker back in April. Oswald used to attend a small discussion group, and he began to rail against this right-wing general, Edwin Walker, who was calling for the invasion of Cuba. General Walker was about as right-wing as you got in the early 60s. And Oswald saw Walker as a American Adolf Hitler. And Oswald said someone should kill Walker. He then ordered a rifle with a sniper scope, and he planned very meticulously his assassination of General Walker. He took photographs from different angles. He figured out how to get his rifle there and how to escape. On March 31st, a Sunday, he asked Marina to come out and take his photograph. All in black, pistol, rifle in his hand, holding a few radical newspapers. And Marina writes on the back, Hunter of Fascists, and dates it April 6th, 1963. And then he went on the night of the 10th of April, took up his place and shot at General Walker. Hick come in the house, 11.30. He was so pale, nervous, and then not talk. I said, what happened to him? And he said, he told, I tried to shut General Walker. General, will you describe for us just what happened last night? Rifle shot was fired into the house, fired through the west window, and hit the cell and hit the wall across the room and went over the desk at which I was sitting. He was very disappointed to find out that he missed by less than an inch. It shows his ability to plan who his target was and that Oswald was capable of violence. I think that was kind of the Rosetta Stone, that if you understood the Walker shooting, you understood that Lee was like a cocked rifle and he could go off any time. the conspiracy notion about the Kennedy assassination among many Americans was the sheer incongruity of the affair. All that power and majesty wiped out in an instant by one skinny, weak-chinned little character. to some questions leave us restless. The theory that a single bullet struck down both the president and the governor, for example, has too much of the long arm of coincidence about it for us to be entirely comfortable. It doesn't satisfy our sense of narrative or justice that a small person of no distinction can be of such historical consequences to kill the president of the United States. But would we be more comfortable believing that a shot was fired by a second assassin who materialized out of thin air for the purpose, fired a shot, and then vanished again into thin air, leaving behind no trace of himself, his rifle, his bullet, or any other sign of existence? There are two groups of people. There's one group that will look at an extraordinary coincidence, a cataclysmic circumstance, and say, Yes, that's the way the world works. There's another group of people for whom that's quite unsettling. They don't want to believe that something so random could have occurred. Can you believe that you could step off a curb someday and be killed by an oncoming car? Nobody believes in that kind of possibility for themselves, but it happens. Is life that fortuitous, that uncertain? And for them, oddly, the notion of a conspiracy is more comforting than the absence of it. Because if there's a conspiracy, at least there's a plan. I think the uh, five bullets fired from at least two different directions the result of a conspiracy. Kennedy's killing touches off a belief in the idea you can't trust government. There has been a loss of morale 
a loss of confidence among the American people toward their own government and the men who serve it. And that is perhaps more wounding than the assassination itself. They've lost so much faith in government that they actually think that the government is an accessory after the fact to the president's murder. Can't get too much worse than that. The assassination changed the trajectory of the 60s. America was a different place on the day before John F. Kennedy was killed. So when you look at this America as a whole in the 20th century, you look at America in the 60s, you really say that day was the dividing point. I guess in the average man's life, there are two or three emotional experiences that he, he doesn't forget because they're burned into his, his heart and his brain. And no matter what happens to me, I'll remember November the 22nd as long as I live. And I, it's impossible for me now to this day, and I'm sure 10 years from now, to drive to Dallas without looking at the sixth floor of the school book depository building. And it's impossible for me to drive by the Texas Hotel today and not think of that morning when President Kennedy spoke there. It will always be with us. Kennedy, alongside of the other presidents, Johnson, Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Reagan, the two Bushes, even Bill Clinton, people, they don't remember what they did, but they remember their rhetoric, and they remember the images. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. This is what people wish for again in the government. They want someone who inspires them, who gives them hope, for whom they have a kind of admiration. Kennedy's standing hold on the public, I think, will only fade if and when we get another president about whom they feel the same way as they currently feel about Kennedy. Thursday on the 60s. There's battle lines being drawn. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Young people speak in their minds Are getting so much resistance From behind Every time we stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down today of the bloodiest fighting in almost a year. We will not surrender, and we will not retreat. You think you can win? Oh, I know we can win. These people are being killed, and they're being killed. Why? The United States must stop this bloody aggression. God damn it, we're in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. President, 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 it was just a year ago that you ought to have stepped up aid to Vietnam. There seems to be a good deal of discouragement about the progress. Can you give us your assessment? No, we are putting in a major effort in Vietnam. As you know, we have, uh, have about 10 or eight, 11 times as many advisors there as we had a year ago. So we don't see the end of the tunnel. But uh, I must say, I don't think it's uh, darker than it was a year ago, in some ways lighter. Early on, Kennedy made a command decision. We will not allow 
South Vietnam to fall to the communists. In Southeast Asia, communist-inspired subversion was unrelenting. South Vietnam looked to others for assistance in stemming North Vietnamese aggression. Going back to the Eisenhower administration, in the late 50s, the country split into South and North Vietnam. You have the communists in the North, and so the United States is very eager to preserve the South from a communist takeover. The communist North Vietnamese believed in nationalism, uniting their country under their own control. The Cold War conspiracy was that if the Vietnamese communists won the war in Vietnam, all of Southeast Asia would fall, the dominoes would fall one after another. There is no doubt that the fall of South Vietnam would have serious repercussions on the other countries of Southeast Asia. This is fundamentally the reason why we're in South Vietnam. After all, Eastern Europe has fallen to communism. China has fallen to communism. We can't lose Southeast Asia. So we have to stabilize South Vietnam. On January 2nd, 1963, South Vietnamese troops surprised a Viet Cong battalion at a village called Ap Bac. Five American helicopters are shot down, three American advisors are killed, 63 South Vietnamese die, half of them shooting at each other. We've got U.S. military advisors flying combat missions. We've got advisors that are accompanying South Vietnamese forces into the field. So by this point, their role had gone beyond simply advising. We have learned a bitter lesson. The Army of South Vietnam cannot cope with the Viet Cong, a committed guerrilla enemy. It is trained for conventional war, American style. There is growing uncertainty about whether the advisory effort is really working. Then, in the midst of this, there is what's called the Buddhist crisis. The war in Vietnam has literally become a fight on two fronts. On one hand, the government faces the Viet Cong communists, and on the other hand, it faces a revolt of the Buddhist majority, a fight which has been joined by thousands of students. The country's Buddhist majority sees President Diem as a tyrant. We had established a government in South Vietnam led by a Western-educated Catholic named Diem. Diem was our boy. But an absolute power corrupts, and Diem becomes the dictator. So you have a Catholic presence imposing itself on a Buddhist majority, and now they're going after the Buddhists. Soldiers and police broke up the demonstrations and killed nine persons. A debate broke out in the American government over whether we should continue to support GM or not. By the summer of 1963, there have been discussions in the CIA, in the Pentagon, about toppling the ZM regime. Mr. President, has our government in any way been tardy in recognizing the, the nature of the ZM government? We are faced with a problem of wanting to protect the area against the communists. On the other hand, we have to deal with the governments there. That produces a kind of ambivalence uh, in our uh, efforts, which uh, expose us to some criticism. Mr. President, in the last 48 hours, there have been a great many conflicting reports from there about what the CIA was up to. Could you give us any enlightenment on that? No, I don't think so. Okay. This is an NBC special news report. The government of South Vietnam has been overthrown by a military coup. Now, this happens with our understanding and knowledge. And then the president of South Vietnam is shot and killed by a cabal of South Vietnamese generals. Once the U.S. had led the coup to get rid of Diem, Kennedy realized that the United States had finally bitten into a bad apple. Monday, November 4th, 1963. Over the weekend, the uh, coup in Saigon took place. I uh, feel that uh, we must bear a good deal of responsibility for it. I uh, should not have given my consent to it without a 
round table conference. And I was uh, shocked by the death of Zim. The way he was killed made it particularly abhorrent. When that assassination took place, we owned it. It actually started that early in the 60s in the Kennedy administration. When Kennedy came into office in January of 1961, you had on the order of about 600 uh, U.S. military advisors uh, in South Vietnam. By the time he left on that fateful trip to Dallas in November 1963, there were more than 16,000. John Kennedy's death commands what his life conveyed. That America must move forward. I think Johnson genuinely felt that continuity in the government after this terrible event was essential to retaining the confidence of the American people. And now the ideas and the ideals which he so nobly represented must and will be translated into effective action. Congress and the nation had reminders today that while the world seemed suspended by our tragedy, it really kept on its whirling way. In Vietnam, reports today of the bloodiest fighting in almost a year. Bob, how are we doing? Oh, fine, I think, Mr. President. Uh, I want you to dictate to me uh, on the situation in Vietnam. Now, I've got to have some kind of a summarized, logical, factual analysis uh, of it. Well, I, I do think, Mr. President, that it'd be wise for you to say as little as possible. I, the, the frank answer is we don't know what's going on out there. The, uh, the signs I see coming through the cables are, are disturbing signs. Yeah, yeah. Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, he had been the head of the Ford Motor Company, brilliant executive. Famous especially for his cold analytic methods. He was a World War II vet. He wanted to stop waste in the Pentagon. We've increased the number of combat-ready Army divisions by 45%. The expectation is that he would figure out Vietnam. The position of my government is clear. We are prepared to furnish whatever economic aid, whatever military training, and whatever quantities are required, and for as long as that is required. Vietnam, Moon Nam! The public Secretary of Defense McNamara is all about kind of bullish bravado, that we are going to prevail. But privately, McNamara is increasingly gloomy about the prospects. Until a strong government begins to function here in Saigon, the war against the communists will continue to found. I'll tell you, the more I just stayed awake last night thinking about this thing, it just worries the hell out of me. I don't think it's worth fighting for, and I don't think we can get out. Now, of course, if you start running the communists, they may just chase you right into your own kitchen. Yeah, that's the trouble. Gentlemen, this is a modern war but it's a different war. We're here to advise and support our courageous Vietnamese allies. It was West Moreland's misfortune to inherit the most complex war that we had fought to this time. And I think his plan for the war was an entirely conventional plan in a very unconventional war. We're over here to win, and we have what it takes to assist them in this victory. Is that enough for you? I'm going to put this in two parts. I'll be a little more candid in the second round. Lyndon Johnson doesn't want to be a president who found his administration torpedoed by an unpopular war. Parenthetically, however, we have a very interesting episode that happens in August of 1964 in the Tonkin Gulf. Three 
PT boats, identified by our State Department as North Vietnamese, attack the USS Mattox, a destroyer which is operating in the Tonkin Gulf, some 35 miles off the North Vietnamese coast. This was not an unprovoked attack. There had been these covert actions against North Vietnamese directed by the United States, and the North Vietnamese were responding to that on August 2nd. This is a special report from CBS News in Washington. Today, just past the midday point, unofficial sources started to report additional naval combat action in the same Tonkin Gulf. Now I'd like to review briefly in chronological order the unprovoked attacks which took place today, August 4th. We know now for sure that the second Tonkin Gulf incident didn't happen. But the Johnson administration pretty much dismissed evidence indicating that an attack actually hadn't taken place. There was this acute political pressure from the right wing to be strong, stand up to communist aggression. Certainly, I think, a more prudent administration that wasn't looking for a pretext to flex some American muscle would have stepped back and said, let's determine what actually happened here before we launch any retaliatory action. My fellow Americans, hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. That was the beginning of the American air assault on North Vietnam. President Johnson has asked for and will soon get a congressional resolution authorizing the president to act as he is. The Tonkin Gulf resolution said that Johnson had all-out power to use American military strength to defend American interests as he deemed necessary. And that is the beginning of the slippery slope. Lyndon Baines Johnson has been elected president of the United States, and the landslide has carried him in for his first term in office on his own right by his own election. Communist Viet Cong guerrillas killed seven Americans and wounded 109 yesterday in a sneak nighttime attack on the American helicopter base at Play Coup. Uh, I don't wish to speculate on action we may take in the future. I don't believe it will ever be possible to protect our forces against sneak attacks of that kind. Vietnam keeps creeping into the Oval Office. But Johnson's stuck. He refuses to be the American president who loses Southeast Asia. So he has to keep going in deeper. So we're going to send the Marines in. Yeah. I guess we got no choice, but scares the death out of me. And it's a hard one, but uh, uh, Westmoreland and uh, Taylor come in every day saying, please send them on. And McNamara and Russ say, send them on. What do you think? Well, it doesn't look to me like we just got in this thing and no way out. You couldn't have inherited it, Wes. Yes, well, if they'd say I inherited, it'd be lucky, but they'll all say I created it. You know, they, Dick, the trouble is, uh, the great trouble I'm under, a man can fight if he can see daylight down the road somewhere. Actually, but there ain't no daylight, Vietnam. No, there's not a bit. Early in 1965, the president decided to launch Operation Rolling Thunder, a sustained bombing campaign directed against North Vietnam. The emphasis is on the destruction of strategic enemy targets. Raids are designed to cut off supplies from the north to the Viet Cong rebels in the south. Our first mission was more or less static defense of the principal airfield for the bombing missions over North Vietnam. General, will this entail any offensive operations? No. No, I don't believe it will. The reason we put ground troops in 
was to protect airfields. And then we had to protect the ground troops around the airfields. And it sort of, we backed into this war, not really understanding what we were doing. Third squad, let's go! The soldiers moved cautiously off into the jungle, encountering only an occasional sniper. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese didn't play by our rules. We couldn't find the enemy. They were invisible. It was their country. The enemy again broke contact, slipped away and disappeared. Combat arouses emotions so powerful that teaches you about human nature at its best and at its worst. Give the baby to mama son. Yeah, oh, papa son, come on. Give the baby to mama son. Come on. UVC? UVC? Yeah, UVC. UV at con, huh? The rule of thumb was is not to trust anybody, regardless of sex or age. What's going on? Enemy fire opens up from surrounding bushes. <laughs> If the Americans got a sniper fire from a village, they didn't send a squad in to find the sniper and kill him. They just called for artillery or airstrikes and blew the whole hamlet away. States was killing 25,000 civilians a year. We were blowing up and burning down this country we were supposed to be saving. Success continues to be elusive in any meaningful way, and Johnson keeps being told, I need more troops. I have today ordered to Vietnam certain forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. This will make it necessary to raise the monthly draft call from 17,000 to 35,000 per month. And this is the most agonizing and the most painful duty of your president. It's difficult to understand. Why would you take the course that is going to lead to large-scale war, even with what we now know is this deep skepticism on the part of Lyndon Johnson? But it seems he felt that no matter which way he went on Vietnam, he would be crucified. We're on the outskirts of the village of Tam Ni with elements of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. It first appeared that the Marines had been sniped at and that a few houses were made to pay. Shortly after, an officer told me he had orders to go in and level the string of hamlets that surrounds Cam Nee village. I wasn't looking for that story, but what I saw was absolutely shocking. The day's operation burned down 150 houses, wounded three women, killed one baby, and netted these four prisoners who could not answer questions put to them in English. To a Vietnamese peasant, it will take more than presidential promises to convince him that we are on his side. Morning news had put the first bit of footage on the air. I had no idea it would have the kind of repercussions it had. Do you ever have any regrets about some of these people or you leaving homeless? You can't expect to do your job and feel pity for these people. Well, I think it's sad in a way, but I don't think there's any other way you can get around it in this kind of a war. What Vietnam did to America via television was introduce us to a new kind of America, one that was not pure, one that committed the same kinds of atrocities that are always committed in war, but we had never allowed ourselves to see them. 
The president, I understand, called the senior executive at CBS, and Lyndon Johnson said, Frank, this is your president. Your boys just shat on the flag of the United States. Three months ago, the 1st Air Cavalry Division shipped out from Charleston, South Carolina. Last week, some of them came home. Most of these casualties were suffered in the Battle of Yadrang Valley, the most significant yet fought by American troops in Vietnam. It looked at first like a routine Viet Cong attack, but this was a full-scale sustained assault by not only the Viet Cong of South Vietnam, but with North Vietnam and its strong and dedicated army. the full shock came. Americans and North Vietnamese lay side by side in the grass. Kind of walked right into a ambush. It was, it was pretty bad to listen to your friends crying out for help, not being able to do a thing. We just, we all pinned down. I want to congratulate you on your distinguished victory. You were fighting regular North Vietnamese troops. The consensus of the military after I drank is we can inflict enough casualties on them to, to win. Our armed forces are prepared to take the necessary casualties in order to seek out and destroy the enemy. The question remains, are the American people prepared to lose more and more young men in Vietnam? Cavalry band will go anywhere for a parade, even within rifle range of the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong have terrorized you and have burned your homes. We are here to help you and to show how much we are able to protect you. The Air Force are going to hit some Viet Cong on the other side of the valley. Televising of the Vietnam War was like the split screen reality in American culture. On one side, you had what the official story was, which was we're winning in Vietnam. And yet, every time that Americans looked up, what they saw was body bags. Marine Colonel Michael Yunk was hit by fire from a village while he was directing close air support from a helicopter. He saw women and children there and decided not to order an air attack. The colonel talked about it while surgeons amputated his leg. They do all they can to save that leg. I know. God damn it, I, I hate to put bombs and napin on these women and children. I just didn't do it. I just said they can't be there. I'm sure now that that's where they were. And as the casualties mounted, that was turning the public in this country against the war. <laughs> How do you expect to be protected in this country unless you have people fighting for you? They're not fighting for me. They're not. They're not. This is genocide. These people are being killed, and they're being killed. Why? Dissent spread across campuses all over the country and gave a sense of empowerment to students who were about to be drafted but still couldn't vote. A new type of protest and civil disobedience occurs in New York City. David Miller publicly burns his draft card. Seven young and earnest protesters burned draft cards on the steps of a Boston courthouse. A group of high school boys set upon them with fists. The draft was in place from World War II. When you turned 18, you had to register. In January 1965, 5,400 young men were called for the draft. In December 1965, 45,224 young men were called. This is one fact pouring in on the American conscience and causing increasing concern. 
the compulsory draft force you to make a choice. Vietnam against your will, jail against your will, Canada against your will, no good options. All kinds of ways are found to try to beat the physical. People are known to mutilate themselves. Starve themselves, declare that they were homosexual when they weren't. There were also escape hatches in terms of deferments, like deferments for college students, which means that working class young people are likely to get drafted before upper middle class. The war was waged in a lot of living rooms in America. It was a real generational divide because my father's generation went off and saved Europe. I fully expected to have a military experience, but it was a, the wrong damn war. Washington, November 27th. The rally was to be held at the Washington Monument. The protesters began to arrive, about 20,000 strong. Most of the world says that killing's all right. Peace Corps by day and the bombers at night. The whole world are watching us right now. They intend to support the Constitution of the United States. I will not fight in Vietnam. We forget this, but there was always a substantial number of Americans who supported the Vietnam War. It's hard to recapture how intense that period was, how morally conflictual it was in your relationship with your country, which is something we never question. The pressure on Mr. Johnson to choose sides has been growing, clinging to a middle line. He tried to give one ear to the war hawks in America, one ear to the doves, but both ears to neither. We halted bombing in the north in the hope that the government in ha Hanoi would single its willingness to talk instead of fight. But I regret to tell you that no signal came during those 37 days. Johnson feels alternately outraged that he's being attacked in this way when he's doing the best he can. Until the day they decide to end this aggression and to make an honorable peace, I can assure you that we, speaking for the United States of America, intend to carry on. A large committee of responsible lawyers has examined the United States' legal position in Vietnam. Its conclusions, briefly and bluntly, are that the United States is violating the United Nations Charter, the Geneva Agreements, and finally, violating the United States Constitution, which says only Congress can declare war. When the Congress tried to ask questions about the Vietnam War, they found it very difficult to get answers, and sometimes they were lied to. We're engaged in a historic debate in this country. Our the honest differences of opinion. Fulbright hearings are one of the first times when people who weren't far on the left or extreme on the right started raising some very serious questions about the war. All I'm asking is, if the people decide that this war should be stopped, are you going to take the position that's weakness on the home front in a democracy? I would feel that our people were badly misguided and did not understand the consequences of such a disaster. Well, uh, we agree on one thing, that they can be badly misguided, and you and the president, in my judgment, have been misguiding them for a long time in this war. In the beginning of 1965, there were 23,000 American servicemen in Vietnam. Currently, there are about 267,000 U.S. fighting men in Vietnam, and 18,000 more will be there by the end of this month. The commitment became bigger and bigger and bigger. You could feel the spirit of the troops was draining. How old are you? 22. Volunteer? Nope. Would you? Nope. What's the worst thing about it? Getting shot, getting hit. Well, you see your buddies get hit? Living in the swamp? Dirt? Three days out in the bush, you'd be covered with ringworm and jungle rot. It was just the nature of the terrain and the weather. It's hot in Vietnam, 
often hotter than the Mojave Desert. The temperature rises to 120 degrees. If we've got two hours sleep a night, I'd be surprised. You're almost in a hypnotic state. I'm amazed that these kids didn't just completely fall apart. Humans are really, really tough. Things are going reasonably well in the South, aren't they? Yes, I think so. What are these men doing? They're trying to locate the enemy, I see, and they run them into caves. Yep, we think we're uh, taking a heavy toll of them, but it just scares me to see what we're doing there with taking soldiers with God knows how many airplanes and helicopters and firepower and going after a bunch of half-starved uh, beggars. And it's not a certainty, but it's a, a danger we need to look at it, that, that they can keep that up almost indefinitely. Today I can tell you that military progress in the past 12 months has exceeded our expectations. Our policy remains what it was and has been. We would supply our commanders whatever they required to accomplish our objective in South Vietnam. You started to distrust your own leaders because you started to say, well, they're lying to us. I mean, or, or if they're not lying to us, they don't know what's going on over here. If they don't know what's going on, what the hell is going on? Get it on! Get it on! I'm glad they're on our side. Hold out! Hold out! Alpha Company has reached Hill 943. Start coming this way, up! After sweeping the area around 943, Hill 943 is taken. There is nothing to take. And now that the enemy is gone, there is no reason for the Americans to stay. When we abandoned the hill, it was crushing to morale because if your friends died, what was all that about? There is a hill in Vietnam which was assaulted twice taken twice and abandoned twice by Americans. And today, 943 is again controlled by the North Vietnamese. Progress was not being made. There was no end in sight. How would you measure progress? So it was a kind of absurd situation. How do you feel about it now that it's all over? Pretty bad in a way. Uh... You live with them, you work with them, you get real attached to them. I had three that died in my arms, and that hurt more than anything else. We have to carry them out, you know. And that's when it bothers you when you gotta carry them through this slop. It really gets to you. I'd lose friends, and I would just like, wow, you know, I got a job to do here, and you'd, you'd throw them on a chopper, and that'd be the last you'd see them. And so you were constantly shoving it down, because if you didn't, you couldn't function. by the thousands to the Pentagon this week. They demanded to see Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara to ask him to stop sending their sons to Vietnam. And they showed their anger and frustration. Given the nature of the enemy, it seems to me that the strategy we are following at this time is the proper one, and that it is producing results. We will prevail in Vietnam over the communist aggressor. Fundamentally, we didn't have a strategy in the Vietnam War, except that of attrition. 
They talk about, well, we can kill 300 North Vietnamese for every one of us. Do the American people care about the 300? No, they care about the one. Five hundred thousand American troops, fourteen thousand American dead. The war in Vietnam is no longer simply their war to win or lose, it's ours as well. And it has become the most divisive in a hundred years of American history. It was the first time that all of these different factions and philosophies and personalities came together in one place. The seed was planted when there was a massive march on the Pentagon. People realized that we could go beyond polite protest into more massive civil disobedience and shake up the war makers. McNamara had been managing the war since 1961. And the man was just overwhelmed with guilt. In less than 60 days, I will have served seven years as Secretary of Defense. No one of my predecessors has served so long. I myself did not plan to. Robert McNamara leaves office. I think it's fair to say that he is, by that point, tortured on a personal level by the war. Tonight, the communists hit the very heart of Saigon, the brand new U.S. Embassy building, and at least 10 cities in that war-torn country. The Tet Offensive was the big show of the Viet Cong. It's huge. They got the Americans in South Vietnamese completely by surprise. It exposed how tenuous the U.S. hold was. and who lost in the great Tet Offensive against the cities? I'm not sure. The terrible loss in American lives, prestige, and morale, and this is a tragedy of our stubbornness there, seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. When Walter Cronkite, who was the most trusted man in America, said that, Lyndon Johnson said, if I've lost Walter, I've lost middle America. Lyndon Johnson realized he was no longer in charge of the war. The war was in charge of him. What'd you lose? I had uh, 36 when I started. We got uh, 21 killed. What were you thinking about? I was thinking uh, of my wife and I... Uh, my baby that I haven't seen, I guess. Uh, I got a baby coming in June, and that was on my mind. I, was, uh, I just knew we were going to get overrun. If you look at the history of Vietnam, it was a tragic comedy of errors from beginning to end. And the tragedy of Johnson is that he achieved remarkable things, particularly in terms of civil rights, but will be remembered for Vietnam. It's the full Shakespearean wheel of fortune. The man who has nothing, who rises to everything, and then loses it all. In a moment of tragedy and trauma, the duties of this office fell upon me. With America's sons in the field far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, I have concluded that I should not permit the presidency to become involved in the partisan divisions that are developing in this political year. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president.
is not living up to the dream with liberty and justice for all. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. We're willing to be beaten for democracy. They'd give anything in the world if we had trouble here. Would you be willing to go on a demonstration again? Yes, sir. We want our freedom and we want it now. Open hostility towards the civil rights demonstration. <laughs> talk about it here as separation of the races. Customs and traditions that have been built up over the last hundred years that have proved for the best interests of both the colored and the white people. It was almost 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation and America is still rigidly and racially segregated. Black people couldn't vote in the South. They couldn't even go into the public libraries. The public libraries were segregated. The churches were segregated. We are in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Ebenezer Baptist Church, where a father and son are the co-pastors. Frankly, as others have said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And this is our hope, and this is that something that keeps us going. Martin Luther King was immensely frustrated by the end of the 1950s because he had become famous. He's preaching all over the country. He knows that's his gift, but he says, people cry at my sermons, and then the next morning it's still segregated. Martin King called about 50 ministers from across the South to start a nonviolent movement. The understanding of teaching nonviolence was clear, but there wasn't anybody that could teach it like Jim Lawson. James Lawson's been to India and comes back with this storehouse of Gandhian tactics. Martin King said, come to Nashville now. We need you now. So I went to Nashville and organized other people. Now tonight we have a most important business to try to accomplish. And that is to try to have one major role-playing experience which sort of tries to set the stage for an actual demonstration, for an actual sit-in. When you talk about the civil rights movement in the 60s, people often talk about Selma and Birmingham and Montgomery. But the incubator of it all was Nashville, Tennessee, where James Lawson started teaching his classes on nonviolence. And then after beating him, teaching people like John Lewis and James Bevel and Diane Nash how to not swing back if somebody hits you in the head with a nightstick. We actually practiced sitting in. Some took the role of students who were sitting at a lunch counter, and others took the role of white thugs. We were practicing how to remain nonviolent, even in the face of violence. There had been other sit-ins in those early months of 1960, but no one is centrally organizing or coordinating this, like the student group from Nashville. It was on February the 13th, and we had the very first city in here in Nashville. I took my seat at the counter. I asked the waitress for a hamburger and a coat. Well, the students sit down at the lunch counter asking to be served, knowing full well that it's against the law. We were prepared to be arrested and to go to jail. 
and if necessary, stay in jail. Well, it was a moving feeling within me that I was sitting there demanding a God-given right. I could no longer be satisfied or go along with an evil system. The big surprise for them was that they weren't arrested. They sat there all day, and they realized that white people were flummoxed. The new tactic came as a surprise, creating bewilderment and confusion in the white communities and even among the Negroes themselves. When this disciplined platoon comes into a store, occupies all of the seats at the lunch counter. They refuse to move on the request of the store owner. They put on a boorish exhibition of what seems to me plain bad manners and crashing into a place where they are not welcome. I submit to you, sir, it comes with singularly poor grace for their spokesman to then charge the store owner with bad behavior. Mr. Kilpatrick, I think on this point, you would have to agree with me that all people should obey just laws. But I would also say that an unjust law is no law at all. And when we find an unjust law, I think we have a moral obligation to take a stand against it. During the weeks after the sit-ins began, opposition in the white communities of the South solidified, and the first signs of violence appeared. The man came out and said that they were a fight on the inside. There was a bunch of colored boys and girls on the stools in the counters, so I instructed the men to put them place them under arrest. students were arrested out of over 300 who were participating in the sit-ins that day. As the students were confronted with the choice of paying a $50 fine or spending over a month in jail, each of them chose jail. I felt free. I felt liberated. I felt like a hair crossed over. While we were in jail, black women got on the phone and organized an economic withdrawal. The Negro has a terrific purchasing power. So the merchants, of course, was feeling the pinch because they were definitely not coming downtown to spend that money. The next day, the Nashville, Tennessee, on the morning newspaper had a headline, Mayor Favored Desegregation. It was a great victory for the movement and for the city of Nashville. The economic boycott was withdrawn and Nashville became the first major city in the South to permit whites and Negroes to eat together in public places. That remarkable group that Lawson brought together in Nashville, they became a cadre. We all applauded, and here was the situation that, that, that turned out right. The ideas that they promoted very quickly spread across the region and across the nation. The city and movement. It has challenged certain fundamental concepts of law and is shaking the regional traditions of the South in an entirely new way. King is extremely pleased with the emergence of the student sit-in movement in early 1960. There are sit-ins in Atlanta, where Dr. King is living by that time. King himself gets arrested in one at Rich's department store. King is kept in jail when everyone else is released. And that's when it got involved in the presidential campaign. John Kennedy, the presidential candidate, calls Mrs. King to express his concern. Very unexpected public gesture. Within 24 hours, Robert Kennedy called that judge and asked that he get King out of jail. Next thing we knew is Daddy King had gone public and had said, I was against having a Catholic for president, but if 
He can wipe the tears from my daughter-in-law's eyes. I have the courage to vote for Kennedy for president, and I have a suitcase full of votes. Dr. King, have you heard anything from Vice President Nixon or any of his supporters? I've been confined, and I haven't talked with anybody from Washington or from the campaign. Do you know of any efforts made on behalf of the Kennedy group? Well, I understand that uh, the Kennedy group did uh, make definite contacts and uh, did a great deal to make my release possible. It turned out that that phone call was given credit for Kennedy's victory in one of the closest elections in modern history. King said, I hope that at last we have a president with the intelligence to understand this problem. I'm convinced that he has that understanding, and now we'll have to see what his passion leads him to do. But what together we can do... Kennedy, in his inaugural speech, did not have a single mention of a domestic issue. Harris Wofford said, all these people out there, and particularly black people who voted for you, and you've got to give them something. What they did then was add two words talking about freedom and human rights abroad and at home. That was the only mention. Kennedy's administration is trying to keep a lid on the civil rights issue. And civil rights activists are determined to push ahead. Blacks and whites rode into the Deep South together on Greyhound and Trailways buses to challenge segregation as Freedom Riders. The Freedom Rides started with two buses, 13 people going from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. The concept of the Freedom Rides was to show that desegregation laws were not being enforced in the South. Even though the law of the land says that a passenger can ride interstate, and participate in lunch room, uh, waiting rooms, and bathrooms, that uh, even though the law says this, everyone cannot, particularly the Negro. They're buying tickets from town to town and getting off in each town, going into uh, waiting rooms, restaurants, cafes, which are uh, traditionally segregated in such a manner as to enrage them and to provoke them uh, into acts of violence. That's what they are doing. going to Birmingham. We were surrounded by a mob who followed us out of Anniston for about four miles until one of our tires went flat. They finally threw a bomb into the bus. The bus filled very rapidly with black smoke. Meanwhile, when the railways bus got to Birmingham, it was even worse. They dragged about six of the passengers out, both Negro and white. They took them into corridors and alleys and began beating them, began hitting them with lead pipes. They knocked one man, a white man, down at my feet, and they beat him and kicked him until his face was a bloody red pulp. Freedom Riders were severely beaten, could not continue. The Nashville movement decided that we had to take up the Freedom Ride where it had left off. Groups would be dispatched. Diane Nash said the line that made the difference. She said, we will not allow violence to destroy nonviolence. This was the test. Ten of the kids said, we will go tonight. And that's the stuff that makes you free. That's the stuff that is freedom. A group of them got on a bus in Birmingham. When the bus pulled into the Montgomery station, John Lewis could see hundreds of whites headed towards him with baseball bats, bricks, rocks. An angry mob just came out of nowhere. And they started beating the Freedom Riders. I was hit with a wooden crate beaten, left line in a pool of blood. Before police 
finally woke up the crowd with tear gas, they beat and injured at least 20 persons. After the riders are attacked and brutally beaten, the Freedom Riders essentially become trapped in uh, Ralph Abernathy's First Baptist Church. The church was surrounded, and people were setting fire to cars. It is a very dangerous situation outside. No one, but no one can leave the church. Dr. King had gone over to Montgomery from Atlanta to lend support to the Freedom Riders. And so King, too, along with the Riders, is trapped at this church. Now, it's very easy for us to get angry and bitter and even violent in a moment like this. But I think this is a testing point. I hope that we will remain calm as we have done in so many touchy, difficult moments, and I know we're going to do it. Martin Luther King Jr. placed a call to Robert Kennedy and said to the Attorney General, something must be done. We are planning uh, during the course of this afternoon to send in uh, several hundred uh, more uh, U.S. Marshals from around the country to help and assist. President Kennedy had called out United States Marshals. He placed the city of Montgomery under martial law. In this situation, I want to make this announcement that the city is now under martial law and troops are on the way into Montgomery. is to return to their homes, go back to their books, and mind their own business. Finally, with federal intervention, the Freedom Riders were put on a bus and headed to Jackson. Jackson, the wagon was waiting for us. We didn't know it at the time, but the Kennedys had agreed that the Freedom Riders could be imprisoned. The Kennedy administration makes a deal whereby the Mississippi police units agree that there'll be no violence. But the trade-off is that every Freedom Rider uh, arriving in Jackson immediately will be arrested. Officials in Mississippi think they found a legal way to circumvent desegregation. Their method calling any defiance of segregation a threat to the peace in an area where popular feelings run so high. The Freedom Riders included James Bevel, John Lewis, James Lawson, among others, were sent to Parchman State Penitentiary. So this guy takes me back to the jail cell. When prison doors slam, it has an effect on you. That sound, you felt you would never get out again. As soon as the agitators leave and get tired of trying to stir up trouble, we're going back to the same old way of living that's made our city such a wonderful place in which to live. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Well, this attempt to, to stop the Freedom Rides only served to fuel the flames of the Civil Rights Movement. I'd like to see the show of hands of those of you who will be willing to continue the Freedom Ride in the near future. Let's see the show of hands, please. Freedom Ride after Freedom Ride would come through. They'd get arrested in Jackson. They'd go to the Hines County Jail or the Jackson Jail, and then they would get moved to Parchman Penitentiary. During the time they spent in prison, a bond formed, and they came out of prison more dedicated than ever. And they began to fan out across the South. 
James H. Meredith, son of a cotton farmer, grandson of a slave, and applicant for admission to the University of Mississippi. James, why do you want to enter the University of Mississippi? Well, I think that uh, every citizen should have an opportunity to receive an education in his own state. I think he should have an education, to, an opportunity to receive the best possible education. Mississippi Air Force veteran James Meredith insists on being admitted to the University of Mississippi. And Ross Barnett, the governor of the state, he's not going to let this happen. Do hereby deny you admission to the University of Mississippi. And it becomes a crisis. Ross Barnett withdrew local police and allowed the uh, campus to turn into a kind of war zone. Please, why don't you, uh, can't you give an order to try to remove me? How can I remove him, Governor, when there's a, a riot in the street and he may step out of that building and something happened to him? I can't remove him under those conditions. We've got to get somebody up there now to get order and stop the firing and the shooting. Then you and I will talk on the phone about Meredith. Oh, first, right. we got to get order. Finally, the army arrives from Memphis and comes rolling onto campus and stops a riot at that point. I deeply regret the fact that any action by the executive branch was necessary in this case. But all other avenues and alternatives, including persuasion and conciliation, had been tried and exhausted. James Meredith went to school at Ole Miss today, but his travels to and from classes were not those of a regular student. Go home now! For everywhere that Meredith went, so did his escorts of federal marshals and troops of the United States Army. There is no country where the violence of Sunday and Monday has gone unreported. For example, the biggest story in the London Evening Standard was the violence on the Mississippi campus. The outburst of violence was described as humiliating for American democracy, and embarrassing for American prestige abroad. I think my father and my uncle were originally focused on those foreign policy issues of America's leadership in the globe and saw the uh, civil rights movement in our country as kind of a distraction. I think this is a choice before the president. He must uh, start now making moral decisions rather than purely political decisions. George Wallace became an almost mythic figure for white Southerners, and that speech in which he promised segregation forever is the fullest expression of that commitment to becoming the leader of the resistant white South. I'm sorry, Mr. Wallace. God has spoken to me that he wants freedom for his people. It may even mean physical death, but if it means that I will die standing up for the freedom of my people. God has spoken to me. King very wisely sees an opportunity to give more exposure to the civil rights movement and to prod the Kennedy administration. Martin Luther King decided that they should have major demonstrations only in areas that local law enforcement would react violently. Do you think you can keep Birmingham in the present situation of segregation? I may not be able to do it, but I'll die trying. Bill Connor has a well-known identity as one of the hardest hardliners in defense of segregation. He encouraged the hiring of Klansmen on his police force. King is assuming that Bull Connor is going to provide the pictures and the footage they need to outrage the country. Safety Commissioner Bull Connor used mass arrests, fire hoses, and police dogs to break up the demonstrations. The demonstrations continued for weeks. You got 12, 14, 20 adults maximum per day marching. They're making no news and numbers were dwindling, and the movement was on the brink of extinction when Bevel and the Nashville movement comes along. 
and said, I've got plenty of teenagers in my youth workshops who are willing to go to jail. I was on the phone constantly with Jim, with Diane, and others about making it happen. There's an understandable reluctance on King's part of organizing students to get arrested when their parents are going to be furious for putting their children in the line of fire. Finally, it's King who makes the decision to send the children into the streets. Will you use the hoses and dogs? We will use the dogs if they start draw drawing knives again and throwing rocks. We will use the hose if it becomes necessary to stop the mob. Most of the pickets and the marchers were juveniles instead of the adults seen in previous protests. Officers quickly moved in to make the arrest under the direction of Commissioner Bo Connor. Police overflowed Juvenile Hall with the youthful demonstrators. All kinds of vehicles had to be pressed into service to carry the Negroes. Cars, police paddy wagons, and later in the day, school buses. The Sheriff's Department estimated upwards of 400 had been arrested. And instead of 14 adults, you had 600 teenagers. And then the next day, 1,000. And that's when the dogs and the fire hoses came out. <laughs> what he was doing was exactly what the head of the civil rights movement in Birmingham wanted him to do, to create the theater that was going to be broadcast on national television that would show just how bad things were in Birmingham. Demonstrators attacked with water hoses were as young as six, eight, nine years old. Well, why did you want to take part in demonstrations? Yes, all the color folks get together and take part. Uh, for, for freedom, maybe they'll get some. But if they don't, they won't get nowhere. Birmingham was a crucible in which the soul of the nation was being forged. The Negro drive for equality gathered momentum this week. The Supreme Court sanctioned sit-in demonstrations. Still another court removed the strongly segregationist city government of Birmingham, dominated by Eugene Bull Connor. Wendell, all I can say is that I have enjoyed my 22 and a half years as public safety commissioner in the city of Birmingham. I don't believe I owe the taxpayers of Birmingham anything. They're going to owe me almost two and a half years back pay. Don't shop for anything on Capitol Street. These are stores that help to support the White Citizens Council. Medgar Evers is operating in and around Jackson, Mississippi really the heart of resistance to desegregation. The NBC network affiliate was notorious for features, segregationist speeches. It became such a problem that Megger Evers demanded equal time. When the Jackson, Mississippi television station found itself under threat from the FCC, they agreed to allow Medgar Evers to go on television and make a statement about the goals of the movement. You know this black son of a bitch that's on television? Yes, sir. He's been on more than goddamn 17 minutes. They better get his black ass off or I'm gonna come up there and take him off. Sir, we're required to oh, do hell this. Oh, no, this is in the South. This is below the Mason-Dixon line. You don't have to put these black jungle bunnies on TV. To many white Mississippians, it was an outrage. That's the first time a black man had ever been allowed to appear on television in Mississippi, certainly to argue against segregation. It made him, in some ways, a kind of marked man in Mississippi. We'll be demonstrating here until freedom comes to Negroes here in Jackson, Mississippi. Our guest today on Meet the Press is Governor George C. Wallace of Alabama. His state is the only one in the country today whose schools are completely segregated. Next week, the issue heads for a climax when two Negro students will seek to enroll at the University of Alabama. Governor Wallace has been quoted as saying that he will personally bar their entrance 
despite a federal court order and a threat of federal troops. Did you believe that uh, the Negroes in the South are human beings created by God? Uh, of course they are. I said so uh, in my now, campaign address. It wasn't do, you, uh, do you think they should be discriminated? For obvious reasons. Can they be enrolled without the use of troops? <laughs> well, of course, I, we'll just have to wait and see exactly what transpires on that occasion. At the center of this potential storm are two young Negro students, Vivian Malone and Jimmy Hood. He's 20 years old and made the National Honor Society when she attended a segregated high school in her hometown of Mobile, Alabama. He's also 20, was president of his class in high school at Gadsden, Alabama, and president of the student council. What's the general feeling around the campus uh, concerning the agreement to admit the Negro here this summer? Well, all the students I've talked to and my friends feel that there's not going to be any repeat of the Mississippi situation and there's not going to be no violence. Well, I feel like it won't be as much trouble as, you know, have been on other campuses, but it will be bad news when the nigger comes here. the government plan to use federal marshals if he does go through with his announced intention to prevent these Negro students from entering. I know there's a great uh, opposition in Alabama and indeed in any state to federal marshals and federal troops, and I would be very reluctant to see us reach that point. You know, those Kennedys up there in Washington, that little old Bobby Sox and his brother the president, Governor Wallace has ordered 500 Alabama National Guardsmen into Tuscaloosa. At the moment, they are under his control. It would require hardly more than the flourish of a pen to convert their status to federalized troops and place them at the disposal of President Kennedy. National Guard units are commanded by a governor unless they're federalized and the president becomes their commander in chief. Kennedy had to make the decision of what to do next. President Kennedy has done some significant things in civil rights, but at the same time, I must say that President Kennedy hadn't done enough, and we must remind him that we elected him. Under a searing Alabama sun that already has the temperature near 100 degrees, the waiting continues. With Governor George Wallace's direct confrontation with federal authorities and two Negro students at the University of Alabama is now believed to be only a very short time away. The two Negroes, Vivian Malone and Jimmy Hood, reportedly are en route from Birmingham to the campus. Governor Wallace reportedly about ready to make his appearance on campus. To it, nobody knows what's going to happen. The Justice Department doesn't know what Wallace is going to do. Wallace doesn't know whether he's going to be put in jail. As governor and chief magistrate of the state of Alabama, I deem it to be my solemn obligation and duty to stand before you, representing the rights and sovereignty of this state and its peoples. And now being mindful of my duties and responsibilities under the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Alabama, and seeking to preserve and maintain the peace and dignity of this state, and the individual freedoms of the citizens thereof do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. <clears throat> Governor Wallace, I take it from that uh, statement that uh, you are going to stand in that door and that you are not going to carry out the orders of that correct. I stand upon the statement. Stand upon that statement. Governor, I'm not interested in a show. I don't know what the purpose of the show is. I am interested in the orders of these courts being enforced. That is my only responsibility here. The choice is yours. I would ask you once again to responsibly step aside. Remain on the campus. 
the Justice Department says that the Negro students will be enrolled sometime today. After Ole Miss, the Kennedys learned their lesson about negotiating with the Southern governor. Kennedy just decides to go ahead and federalize the Guard. He's not going to play games anymore. The National Guard General, Henry Graham, goes up to Wallace. He says, it is my sad duty to tell you to step aside. We shall now return to Montgomery for the purpose of continuing this fight, this constitutional fight, because we are winning. Governor Wallace moved away from the door and has left after being confronted with about 150 federalized National Guardsmen. United States Assistant Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach now all smiles as the two Negro students are to enter the registration building. Each time a big issue came up, the President and the Attorney General did everything they could not to have to get involved. And it was after the encounter with Wallace at the Civil Rights became top priority. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. And that was the first time the president made the question of ending racial segregation, not because it's politically expedient to do so, because it is morally right to do so. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. It's his most eloquent speech in some ways, most heartfelt speech. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. There's a kind of bitter irony in that within hours afterwards, Medgar Evers comes home and his wife and children are up because they want to tell him about the president's wonderful speech. Shortly after midnight, Medgar Evers steps from his car in this driveway. Then, Evers was murdered. The fatal bullet was fired from a vacant lot across the street from Evers' home, crashing through his body and through the window of his home. He was 37. I was appalled at the cowardly ambush of him at his home in front of his wife and children, who said something about how far we still had to go in reaching any semblance of social and civic justice. going to Washington to urge the Congress to pass strong civil rights legislation this year. The nationwide response to the power of Alabama supplies the energy that allows the March on Washington to start coming together. We will keep this demonstration nonviolent. It will be peaceful. It will be dignified and disciplined. And I think it will have a, a great impact. In my judgment, there was perhaps only one man or woman in America who could have put that march together. And it was by Rustin. For any movement, we need the cooperation of the best minds, many of which are white as well as black. Rustin was simply an organizational genius. He was the best and the brightest. Do you feel that the president's civil rights program is actually not needed? I don't think it's needed, and furthermore, I think it's unconstitutional. Segregationist senators like Strom Thurmond are attempting to trumpet the fact that Byard is known to be gay uh, as a way to undercut the march. There was an effort to block Rustin being selected. And Martin King said, let he who has not sinned cast the first stone. Dead silence. I recommend very strongly Rustin be designated as the director and chief of staff for the march. April Randolph says, I second that. Freedom Now movement. 
movement, Hear Me, we are requesting all citizens to move into Washington, to go by plane, by car, bus, any way that you can get there. Go to Washington. The White House, the Washington Police Department, the Defense Department, we're all drawing up these tremendous contingency plans for mass violence. You have any questions, be sure you contact your captains for anything, and they will take it from there. The whole thing is an orderly march. They came from all over America. Negroes and whites, housewives and Hollywood stars. More than 200,000 of them came to Washington this morning in a kind of climax to a historic spring and summer in the struggle for equal rights. The March on Washington was probably the most joyous protest march I've ever seen. Look back and wonder how we made it over. This turned out to be a huge interracial gathering that clearly did send a national message that there was tremendous support for racial equality. I admired the people my age, and I knew that John Lewis was the, the youngest speaker at the march. As a student and as a participant in the national movement, I was ready to go. I wanted to push and wanted us to stand up and speak up and speak out. We're tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. But I would never forget the speech of Martin Luther King Jr. On that day, Dr. King spoke out of his soul and he used that day and the steps of the Lincoln Memorial to preach a sermon, not just to America, but to the world. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. As he is speaking, Mahalia Jackson shouts to him, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And I see him take the written text, and he slides it to the left side of the lectern, looks out on the 350,000 people there, and then he speaks. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. quite anticipated just how successful it would be. It represents the civil rights movement at a kind of high watermark. The momentum of change 
seems to be accelerating. And in the hearts of 21 million American Negroes and untold millions of sympathetic whites, there beat tonight the hope that the dream of Negro equality was at last overtaking the reality of history. In the immediate wake of the March on Washington, the civil rights movement has a, a national glow to it that it never before had had. But that glow tragically lasts hardly two weeks. The bombing of this Birmingham, Alabama church claimed the lives of four little girls attending Sunday school. That was the church out of which all the kids had marched in May. So it was clearly a punishment. We felt like we were involved because if there had been no movement, chances are that bombing would not have taken place. press secretary, Malcolm Kilduff, has just announced that President Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. After being shot at, after being shot by an unknown assailant, by an unknown assailant, during a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas, during a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. It is said that the human mind has a greater capacity for remembering the pleasant than the unpleasant. Today was a day that will live in memory and in grief. No words are strong enough to express our determination to continue the forward thrust of America that he began. Lyndon Johnson wasn't that widely known to the country at large. Johnson's aides say to him in this speech, don't fight for civil rights. It's a noble cause, but it's a lost cause. You know what Johnson says to them? Well, what the hell's the presidency for then? No memorial oration or eulogy could more eloquently honor President Kennedy's memory than the earliest possible passage of the civil rights bill for which he fought so long. Johnson gets that civil rights bill moving in the first few weeks after Kennedy's assassination. Dixiecrats, led by Richard Russell, announced a filibuster. That is, they would continue to talk and prevent the bill from coming forward for a straight up or down vote. This bill, which we feel is a perversion of the American way of life and a great blow at the right of dominion over private property that has been the genesis of our greatness. LBJ and his allies knew that they were short, so thus began a 24-7 campaign. He bullied, he cajoled, he made deals in order to get enough senators on board. Surprisingly, after a year on Capitol Hill, this bill is stronger than the one President Kennedy first requested. President Johnson should have the bill on his desk by the 4th of July. We hope to send into Mississippi this summer upwards of 1,000 teachers, ministers, and students to open up Mississippi to the country. Freedom Summer, an operation to flood the state of Mississippi with volunteers, white and black students. 
We were there because we could assume that if the white Mississippians mistreated us the way they mistreated the black people, that would be a basis on which to mobilize national opinion. We will treat anyone with great respect here in Mississippi, but we will treat the people who come here, these children, like any other backward children should be treated. There is some mystery and some fear concerning three civil rights workers, two whites from New York City and a Negro from Mississippi. Police say they arrested the three men for speeding yesterday, but released them after they posted bond. They have not been heard from since. They paid the fine and I released them. They escorted them to their car. And uh, that's the last time we saw any of them. We got word that Mickey and Andy and James had been arrested. And there was no word what had happened to them. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. uh, I wanted to let you know we have found the car. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> this is not known, nobody knows this at all, but the car was burned and uh, we do not know yet whether any bodies are inside of the car because of the intense heat. It is merely an assumption that probably they were burned in the car. Or well, maybe kidnapped and locked up. Well, I would doubt whether those people down there would, uh, would even give them that much of a break. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. We can understand without rancor or hatred how this all happened, but it cannot continue. Our Constitution, foundation of our Republic, forbids it. The principles of our freedom forbid it. And the law I will sign tonight forbids it. Senator Hubert Humphrey has called the Civil Rights Bill the greatest piece of social legislation of our generation. Bill, tell somebody my staff, be sure we get some more pins here. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is not going to create instant brotherhood. No one pretends that. But the Attorney General gets new power to bring suits against racial discrimination in voting, in public accommodations, in education, in employment. If a court finds you guilty of violating some part of the civil rights law, and if you continue violating the law, you can be fined or put in jail until you stop violating the law. The three civil rights workers who disappeared in Mississippi still have not been heard from. A search has thus far produced only one clue, the burned out station wagon in which the three were last seen riding. There is little hope that they are still alive. Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman were found shot to death in a grave at the base of a recently built dam just six miles from the city of Philadelphia. Their bodies, wrapped in plastic bags numbered one, two, and three, were taken to the state medical center in Jackson for identification and examination. The two white boys were shot once each through the heart. James Cheney, the black youth, had been beaten with chains until every bone in his body was broken. Then he was shot three times. The finding of the bodies of the three Mississippi civil rights workers is a saddening and shocking reminder of the brutality of race hatred. We naturally expect that those responsible for these terrible murders will be brought to justice. Hold your 
freedom now. I don't want to have to go to another memoir. I'm tired of killing her. The arrests had started before dawn. In all, FBI men picked up 21 men. Included in the group were the chief law officers of Neshoba County, Sheriff Lawrence Rainey and Deputy Cecil Price. They were murdered by Ku Klux Klan men with uh, the conspiratorial help of the local sheriff. Bond was set, but less than a week later, the accused were set free, their bond lifted. For James Cheney's mother, who attended that hearing, it was a shock, frustration, disappointment. The legal answer to her son's murder seemed to her as far away as ever. I have the great honor to hand over to you the insignia of the Nobel Peace Prize and the gold medal. Uh, some critics uh, have charged that the Nobel Peace Prize uh, was not appropriately given uh, this year. What's your reaction to that one? Well, first I should say that I don't think the Peace Prize was given to me personally, and I don't accept it as a personal honor. I think it is rather a tribute to the wise restraint, the discipline, and dignity with which uh, Negroes and white persons of goodwill have carried out the whole struggle for civil rights. By the end of 1964, Dr. King is aware that the one major Southern civil rights challenge that had not been dealt with in the 1964 Civil Rights Act was voter registration. Bewildering hodgepodge of election laws from state to state prevents many from voting. Boss controlled political machines disfranchise others by downright fraud. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that the day is wrong or the hour is late or the official in charge is absent. There are five counties in Mississippi, each at least 57% Negro, in which no Negroes at all are registered. And today marks the beginning of a determined, organized, mobilized campaign to get the right to vote all over this state. Martin Luther King chooses the city of Selma because it has the worst record of any southern city on black voting. We will traumatize this whole situation and seek to arouse the conscience of the federal government by marching by the thousands on places of registration all over the state. had already had a presence in Selma going back to 1963, but had found it exceptionally tough going because the Dallas County Sheriff, Jim Clark, was an even tougher version of Birmingham's Bull Connor. Brother Strauss is not in session this afternoon, as you went for him. You came down to make a mockery out of this courthouse. This courthouse is a serious place of business. You seem to think you've taken it up just to be a uh, Disneyland or something on parade. We have had uh, numerous niggers that uh, couldn't read and write come down and say that they were told to come, and if they didn't come, they would lose their pensions from the welfare department or their social security or have the land confiscated if they didn't show up to, to register to vote. And when they came down, they had no idea then what they were supposed to do. You are breaking the injunction by not allowing these people to come inside this courthouse and wait. Well, this courthouse court does not belong to Sheriff Clark. 
This courthouse belongs to the people of Dallas County, and these are the people of Dallas County, and they have come to register. And you know this within your own heart, Sheriff Clark. You Clark, he knew what he wanted to do to me, but he couldn't do it in the open because of all those cameras, right? We have come to be here because they are registering at this time. Right. And, and so right. we have I'm come to And we have come to register. We have come to register. And this is our reason for being here. We're not there. You're blinding me with that light. We're not We're not moving. Move back. And you misuse democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. I'm here to tell you tonight that the mayor of this city, the police commissioner of this city, and everybody in the white power structure of this city must take a responsibility for everything that Jim Clark does in this community. We are marching today to dramatize to the nation, dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens of Alabama, but particularly here in the Blackbelt area, denied the right to vote. We intend to march to Montgomery to present certain grievances to Governor George C. Wallace. Governor George Wallace's head of the Alabama State Patrol, in tandem with his good buddy, Sheriff Jim Clark, thinks that uh, what these marchers deserve uh, is a good beating. At the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, down below we saw a sea of Alabama State Troopers. Opposing the protesters was a force of Alabama State Troopers, Sheriff Clark, and then Clark's private army, the so-called posse men. We saw these men put in on their gas masks. They came toward us. It'll be detrimental to your safety to continue this march. You are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. This march will not continue. Local assembly, you have to disperse. You are ordered to disperse. I thought we were going to be arrested. The major said, troopers advance. electric cattle prods, bull whips, wooden clubs wrapped with barbed wire. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. Clark and his volunteer army, the posse men, sent 80 men, women, and children into the hospital. ABC broke in with this footage, what was now being called Bloody Sunday. 
and white middle-class Americans sitting in their comfortable living rooms suddenly had the whole racial, ugly mess thrust into their face. It was a watershed moment in television, a landmark moment in the civil rights movement. For the first time since Birmingham, that footage sets off a, a national firestorm. In our country, we don't tolerate police by terror taking the law into their own hands. This is unacceptable and just not American. And I believe the time has come for the president to step in. The Pettus Bridge incident is in one of those seminal events that helped create a political groundswell for Lyndon Johnson to quickly, and uh, this time without nearly as much opposition as the Civil Rights Act of 64, to push through the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The President of the United States. Johnson feels that he needs to go before the country and a joint session of Congress about why this should be done. I was in the home of a local family in Selma with Dr. King, and we watched and listened to President Johnson. At times, history and fate meet at a single time to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. There, long-suffering men and women peacefully protested the denial of their rights as Americans. Their cause must be our cause, too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. To hear Lyndon Johnson, the President of the United States, use the theme song of the movement, We Shall Overcome. I looked at Dr. King. Tears came down his face. He started crying. We all cried a little. Dr. King decided that uh, the only proper response to this was to continue the march to Montgomery, and a court order forced the state of Alabama to permit said march. Johnson has just ruled that we have a legal and constitutional right to march from Selma to Montgomery. Yeah! Don't wait till tomorrow Oh, you may be dead Oh, we're young Oh, and I wanted to play Said I'd win Just one more day Don't you know how I would Know I would Know I would When it comes Yes, sir. How long? Not, not long. Not long. Because my eyes have 
have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. summer 65, Johnson gets that voting rights bill passed. Certainly the 64 Civil Rights Act led to dramatic changes, but politically, at least uh, in the short run, the uh, Voting Rights Act was even more dramatic. This is an examination room at the Central Post Office in downtown Birmingham, where, under the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965, Federal officials are examining people to determine their qualifications to register and vote under the laws of Alabama. Once the Voting Rights Act was passed and people got the right to vote, they stopped sitting in and started voting. And that turned out to be much more effective. The number of blacks who began voting across the South, the number of black office holders at the local level, at the state level, at the congressional level, one of the greatest changes in American society. This is what James Meredith intends to do for the next two weeks. March along the highways of Mississippi, a state where he is one of the most hated men alive. His purpose, Meredith hopes to encourage unregistered Negroes along the way to qualify as voters. He also, by his very presence, hopes to dispel some of the fear Negroes have in the South. In 1965, with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, you'd have thought anything was possible. But then very quickly after that, things start to fall apart. I'm shot in the leg. In the other leg. As James Meredith was walking along the highway, a gunman stepped out of the woods and just blasted him with a shotgun. Meredith was taken to a Memphis hospital under police guard. His blood still remains on the highway. Once he was shot, then there had to be some response by the movement. They had to show that the segregationists can't win that way. Yeah. They got together and decided to continue the march, Stokely Carmichael and Martin Luther King. Stokely Carmichael was very much unlike the Nashville group in terms of his perspective. We feel that we must continue this march right now, that is, it is urgent to do it, and we will be calling on people of goodwill from all over the nation to join us in this march. Martin Luther King was almost at the level of sainthood. Stokely Carmichael understood that he needed that symbol in order to provide legitimacy for what he was trying to do. We want to put President Johnson on the spot. He called a conference two days ago to fulfill these rights. We want those rights fulfilled. They cannot be fulfilled with words. Words cannot stop bullets. And we need action, and we need it now from the federal government. No more questions. Uh, no more questions, gentlemen. All right. We got the mods the most impressive thing about this march on Mississippi is the developing coalition among civil rights leaders. There are reports of differences between leaders, and they are true. But their organizations have always been divided. A split among them is nothing new. Put them all together on a march on a highway in Mississippi, and frictions emerge because of personal competition and individual ego. Our sweat and blood built Mississippi, and we got to take it over, because we deserve to have it. That's what we're working for. Stokely Carmichael started expressing the goal now is black people exercising power. Let me say first that this march is nonviolent. It is a nonviolent expression of our determination to be free. This is the principle of the march, and certainly we intend uh, to keep this march nonviolent. Mr. Carmichael, are you as committed to the nonviolent approach as Dr. King is? No, I'm not. Why aren't you? Well, I just don't see it as a way of life. I never have. And I also realize that no one in this country is asking the white community in the South to be nonviolent. And that, in a sense, is giving them a free license to go ahead and shoot us at will. 
If there was a symbol of white anger at Negro protest in the North this summer, it was Cicero, Illinois, a town chosen by Dr. Martin Luther King as the pressure point in his open housing drive. Dr. King takes the civil rights movement north to Chicago, and the issue is housing. The northern scene was a far more complicated scene and did not have the advantage of the Jim Crow law as a target. It was one thing for northern liberals when the issue was integration in Selma. It's quite a different thing when it was in Cicero. If, let's say, 10 or 20 families moved into Cicero, which is a town of 70,000, they'd get killed. It's the beginning of serious white backlash against the entire civil rights movement. The nation suddenly learned what it should have known, that racial prejudice was not just a southern problem. It was nationwide. If whites in the North formerly could comfort themselves by pointing an accusing finger at the South, they could do so no longer. South Deering, once again, is showing open hostility towards the civil rights demonstrators. These people here are firmly opposed to these marches. Moreover, they don't see where they serve any useful purpose. Most of the national press categorizes Chicago as a defeat for King. But I can say that I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen in Chicago. There was a growing feeling that King's movement wasn't working. He had lost a lot of support from whites and blacks. Martin Luther King is a good man. He's my brother. He's still like me. We're all catching hell. He's got his approaches of freedom. He's doing his best. And uh, he's changing now, too. He uh, sees now that it seems to be impossible to do what he want to do. King was rapidly being eclipsed by a younger and much more militant faction of the Black Power movement. We are not going to let these white people come into our neighborhood and kill us. We are going to put every cracker in Atlanta on his knees. There was a lot of disunity because the only thing that had really kept the Black community together, ironically, was segregation. Once that has been overcome, then the question is, what do you want? I would like for all of us to believe in nonviolence, but I'm here to say tonight that if every Negro in the United States turns against nonviolence, I'm going to stand up as a lone force and say this is the wrong way. I think that there's a realization in this country, the black power is not just a mere slogan, nationally or internationally. It is real that black people can come together and start determining for their lives how they're going to live and controlling their economic and political lives. So it means that you have to build a movement so strong in this country that if one black man is touched, every black man will rise up and let this country know they're not going to tolerate it. You better quit running around here talking about loving these honkies to death. Doing rebellions, brother, you got to stop looting and start shooting. Black power, brother. Black power! The issue is one that moves across civil rights, moves across poverty. You get this explosion of violence. You have the Watts riots. Then, subsequently, riots in Newark, in Detroit. The riots bring to the fore the problems of inner city life, a consequence of a generation of neglect in uh, America's urban centers. This happened on 12th Street in Detroit in July. Next time, it could happen downtown or in your town. When you stood on the Lincoln Memorial, you said, I had a dream. Did that dream envision the federal government preventing the society doing for the Negroes that which you think had to be done? It was a high moment, a great watershed moment. But I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. 
I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments. And some of the old optimism was a little superficial, and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee, shot in the face as he stood in the balcony of his hotel room. of sacrifices made for freedom. Most liberation struggle is trying to bring about a better world and a better society. We had to give everything we had to the movement. We accepted a way of peace as a way of life, a way of nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. We forged an agenda in the mind of the country. The movement begins with Montgomery, becomes the sit-in campaign, the Freedom Ride, the Birmingham campaign, the Mississippi Summer, the Selma to Montgomery March. History will record that those singular cumulative acts of courage transformed the South transformed the country. We wanted to change America, to make America better, not just for our generation, but for generation yet unborn. All of the civil rights, all the marches, all the people who have died in the civil rights struggle will have died in vain if once the opportunity, once the doors are open, no one is prepared for it. I know there's got to be several young people here who are like five years old, right? It's now becoming a possibility that that young man, by the time he's 50, could be running for the president of the United States. different things arose. There's sort of sex thing or yes. it's sexual. Yeah. There is a desire to get power in order to use it for good. Pop musicians in today's generation, they could rule the world.
beetle land, formerly known as Britain, where an epidemic called beetle mania has seized the teenage population, especially female. CBS, they do a story on what they probably think is a goofy band from England that's doing quite well. These four boys from Liverpool with their dish mop hairstyles are Britain's latest musical and, in fact, sociological phenomenon. They symbolize the 20th century non-hero as they make non-music where non-haircuts give non-mercy. Meanwhile, yeah, 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 this is Alexander Kendrick in Beatleland. Some little girl heard just a hint of what the Beatles were about and starts calling her local DJ. The local DJ asks his friend to bring over a Beatles record from England and has the vision to put it on and hear that there's something happening. So Marsha Albert of Dublin Drive of Silver Spring has the honor of introducing something brand new and exclusive here at WWDC. Marcia, the microphone here on the Carol James Show is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on the air in the United States, here are the Beatles singing, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand. That song really started to take off. It was impossible to anticipate how much that momentum would continue. Hi, everybody all over America. This is the WABC Party. Go, go. Woo! song was absolutely contagious and I think the teenager found a voice. Here's what's happening baby, the Beatles! There was a moment where you just heard this is our music now. It was like here in the future. Out about it. Well, Sylvia and I first learned about the Beatles at London Airport. There was an enormous crowd of kids gathered around, and Sylvia and I asked them what was going on, and they said the Beatles were here. Well, we didn't even know who the Beatles were. We'd never heard of them. And that night, I booked Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and John Lennon for three shows for $10,000. You know, for four white guys who are British, to come out of nowhere and be everywhere was quite unbelievable. The Beatles are a bunch of guys from Liverpool. I mean, people in London would have looked down at Liverpool back then, but Liverpool was a port town, and these port towns become places where all sorts of contraband gets exchanged, and one of them, at that point, was great music. A lot of the sailors and people that were coming back from America were bringing back these records. You know, some were pop records, some were called race records because they were by black artists. The level of influence that American rock and roll, blues, country and western, Motown had on those kids growing up in England was really amazing. Oh my love, oh my kisses, you don't know what you've been of it, no boy, when you're with me, oh boy. So I would listen to Buddy Holly and Gene Vincent and Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, all the great rock and rollers. It was like a new language for us. The power of the jukebox, there's nothing quite like it. took a bunch of those strains, the Everly Brothers from the 50s is a big influence for them with the harmonies. So the Beatles in Liverpool are taking this pop sound but putting their own spin on it. sound. How does it differ from other rock and roll and pop? It just happened that all of a sudden uh, hundreds of rock groups all from Liverpool made records and it was a bit more like the original rock and roll than the stuff they've had over the last few months. Initially there was no tradition of great British bands conquering America. That had not happened but it's that moment where everything turns. There's no 
single moment that more embodies the moment when rock and roll became the province of teenagers. <laughs> as something that you would not just love, but that you would go crazy for. As the Beatles! The Beatles have come to this country and taken all the women away, and everybody's going crazy about them. It was like aliens landed. Look at how they look and how they act, and they... Wow! I got every Beatle record at home. Can we didn't get to see them. What kind of police protection? Yeah, I don't know. I'd like to get a piece of the Beatles. Please. I don't know where they've got out of here. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. The reporters had the same attitude that most adults in America had, which was no one took musicians seriously. They didn't understand anything about youth culture. The press had gone into this with the idea that this was a useful novelty that could be dismissed and maybe even deflated in a press conference. You understand Don't you get a haircut at all? No, 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 no. no. I had one yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are nothing but a bunch of British elders and Presley. It's Nine. not true, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> No, we need money first. When you saw them sparring with the press, it was just another aspect of them that made them even more unique. And tomorrow night at 7, the Beatles read their own poetry on a documentary, Meet the Beatles. Oh, oh, all over the world. Oh, really? I don't understand. If Elvis was the first wave of mega fandom, then the Beatles sort of blew that out the water to the point where even Elvis was losing sleep. The city never has witnessed the excitement stirred by these youngsters from Liverpool. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! showed up with their great sense of humor, their completely infectious pop songs, their, you know, their, their everything. It was just impossible not to fall in love with them. As soon as they started playing on the Ed Sullivan Show, we all knew they're playing live, because that doesn't sound like the record. The idea of driving, swinging R&B mixed with imaginative wordplay and lyrics and harmonies and the perfect three-minute record, they defined it. The Beatles took this dream of what America represented, the freedom that was in American music, and they brought it back to us with an excitement and a ferocity that we didn't have, and with longer hair. Three million people watched that night. When the Beatles did the Sullivan Show, everything at the radio station changed. There were no more requests other than the Beatles. Looking back, I believe without Ed Sullivan, there wouldn't have been the British invasion. It wasn't just the Beatles. The British invasion had legs because there was more great music to back it up. A big hello. <laughs> Come on. Rick Huxley. Mm -hmm. I'm Lenny. I'm, I mean, I'm Dennis. I'm Dave. 
For the first six months they were singing, they sold over a million records a month. And in the words of one of their biggest hit songs, we're mighty glad all over to have them with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the Dave Clark Five. We were the first band to tour America. We did, I think it was 46 cities. Then you realized you'd made it. And suddenly it's like the gates of hell are open. And, you know, every transatlantic ocean liner seems to have another British band on that it rockets up to the top of the American charts. There was this powder keg of energy from the young people in England and it touched the flame to the fuse and boom. zombies because they were keyboard oriented. Rod Argent, the first guy to really develop the idea of rock and roll soloing on a keyboard. And it's a first time welcome now for that top four with her top hit, You Really Got Me Gone, The Kinks. The Kinks were already you know very big band in the uk but if you break in america you break big and you sell a lot of records You had another name. What made you change it to the animals? Well, because we were a bunch of animals. <laughs> the animals were a grittier RB-based yeah. band with Eric Burden, who wasn't cute like a beetle. He was a little more dangerous. You. Now you're gonna do the uh, new record for us? Yeah. And it's called The House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> That song was a song that Bob Dylan had already recorded a year or two earlier, like a folk traditional song. Bob came along his album, House of the Rising Sun. It was crying out to be rocked. My baby world. She sold my new, new jeans, yeah. My baby world, yeah. Me down in you, I'll The English group music thing also arose where groups not only were performing their own stuff compact on the stage, they didn't need anyone else, they just had the four blokes with their amplifiers, guitars, and they could do the lot. The Who are just sort of like in that catalytic converter of rock and roll, they were maybe the most explosive musical unit. It's interesting. The Beatles all lock in and play together and help each other. Daddy, 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 the Who is like four different creatures who weren't even like noticing each other. Everyone in the Who was like the lead player in the Who. It's all 
all these great bands created this thirst in music, but the ones that really had the true, true talent have really stood the test of time. Five singing boys from England who sold a lot of albums. <laughs> I've been rolled while I was stoned myself, so I don't know what they're singing about, but uh, here they are. We're the bad boys of this British invasion. And the girls went crazy. I love you, baby, tell her, right to you. Is it that sort of sex thing? Or yes, it's sexual. Yeah. Love to you, baby, love to you. You've been doing this now for how, how many years is it? Two years. Two years. How, how much longer do you give yourself doing this thing, going around being a sort well, of a... a, a, a I don't know. I never thought we'd be, I'd be doing it for two years, even, you know. I think we're sort of pretty well set up for at least another year. Well, when we first started playing together, we started playing because we wanted to play rhythm and blues, and Howling Wolf was one of our greatest idols, and it's a great pleasure to find he's been booked on this show tonight. It really is a pleasure. Thanks to Howling Jack Wolf. So I think it's about time you shut up and we had Howling Wolf on stage. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> The Rolling Stones invite Howlin' Wolf, who is a 60-year-old black man from the south side of Chicago who never in a million years would have been on Shindig, and there he is. You could believe a word I say. The Stones clearly wore their heart on their sleeve for blues and R&B. You can hear traces of Delta blues inside of Keith's guitar. They tried to be as authentic to the core as possible. Even so much that, you know, their first few American recordings were done in chess in Chicago. The dogs begin to bark. The hounds begin out. We've got to get the Chicago kids used to rhythm and blues. That's where it started. You know, the white people over there know nothing about rhythm. Because it's Negro music, isn't it? Mm. And America, even in the black community to some degree, had, had abandoned certain aspects of black culture, even by the mid-60s. The blues in particular had been sort of pushed aside by soul music and R&B, which considered more modern. The Stones, the animals, the yardbirds, British groups picked up the American blues, where the American groups, they kind of let it go. And in a strange way, we were taking back to America what America had given us, which was American music. You and Chuck have kind of taken England by storm. How do you feel about other people borrowing your material? I am very grateful to know that my material is uh, the type of material that the entertainers today would like to use. The British invasion played a huge role and not just introducing themselves to America, but reintroducing a lot of black music to mainstream America. play on uh, Ed Sullivan for the first time is the year The Tammy Show comes out as a movie. You know, and Tammy Show's got everybody. The Tammy Show was really uh, the first rock and roll concert movie. Stones headlining, and the first time that us white kids got to see James Brown, and nobody, you know, will ever get over it. Dr. Hammond, 
Everyone remembers James Brown's performance. He gave them what black audiences have been seeing for years, but had not really been seen outside of the black community. And people were electrified by it. James Brown just kills the show. Just like, what's the phrase they have in gospel music? He wrecks house. And it really began his journey into becoming a mainstream figure. them close and they refer to it as the biggest mistake they ever made following James Brown. We see, you know, Jagger coming alive, you know, doing things that he hadn't done before. It was great because you're seeing a seasoned professional with James Brown and a young performer and band figuring out who the hell they are. When I say stay put, I mean stay put. It's okay, me, sir. I was led astray. Oh, shut up, John. They're waiting for you in the studio. Gee, I'm down to do a bit of work. Oh, this is the teacher's pet. It's all up. Take the class, eh? I'll lay off. You get a move, I'm not waiting for you. It's been a hard day's night. Hard day's night sort of just perfectly encapsulated Beatlemania. It is the most perfect representation of 1964 Beatles. I should be sleeping. Brian Epstein said, if the Beatles were going to go, they were going to go big. And they went big. The fact that the Beatles were exposed as writers of hit songs exposed them to the public even more than perhaps just a pop singing idol would. They made the announcement that they were going to tour America. The Beatles wanted $25,000. Well, I didn't have $25,000, and so I borrowed $25,000 on the house. There were no computers, but we sold it out in three and a half hours. 17,000 screaming youngsters have jammed their way into the huge amphitheater. But they're the lucky ones. Outside, thousands of others were not so fortunate. Here they are! The, the The output was phenomenal. They seemed to always be either touring, making a movie, or making a record. Uh, hello. See these little fellas? They're the Beatles. Inflatable Beatles. They're yours for just $2. The best thing in life are free. They had posters and magazines and stickers and dolls and cartoons. Like, this is the start of where the teenager becomes the most desirable target for the dollar. I lived in a projects in Brooklyn, you know, in a black community, and the Beatles were everywhere. So it wasn't like this was a white phenomenon. They were everywhere. The Beatles created a rock industry. They were selling in ways that no one had ever sold before, and they were playing venues that were bigger than anyone had ever played before. Ladies and gentlemen, honored by their country, decorated by their queen, and loved here in America, here are the Beatles!
Have you got time to actually spend this money? What money? <laughs> he said. Doesn't he give any to you? No, no. no. Have you seen that car of his? <laughs> the Beatles taught every other band that writing your own music made you more powerful. I think what's really funny about a band like the Stones is they did tons of covers on their first couple of albums. It wasn't until they really figured out how to write their own songs that they really became a real band. They really had to find their own voice. that was going on between soul music and the British invasion. A, because there's a way for me to make a nod to the mainstream, and B, because the songs, you know, were good. His satisfaction is fantastic. He doesn't know all the words, even, and he doesn't care. He's just kind of singing the song. At the time, Motown and the British Invasion, they're going hand in hand with sort of redefining what America dances and listens and socializes to. Motown, it evolved with the rest of the world, but we did have to compete with this British Invasion for places on the charts. The first time I heard you really got a hold on me by the Beatles, and I was very, very, very happy. The Beatles chose one of my songs, and they wrote great songs. A lot of the stuff that Dylan wrote in 63, 64, 65 was very political. It wasn't really what the Beatles were doing, and it wasn't what the Stones were doing, or the Kinks were doing, or any of those rock and roll bands. And for a period of time, there was this distinction between the folk culture and the rock and roll culture. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. I'm not sleepy. In 1964, during that first tour, the Beatles had the opportunity to meet Bob Dylan. He understood what they were doing musically, and they were awakened by the more personal perspective of his songs. Dylan was a huge influence on John Lennon. I think it inspired him to write more serious songs, deeper songs, and be more experimental lyrically. I once had a girl, or should I say, she once had Bob Dylan going electric is another one of those big seismic changes in the pop music era in the 60s. He was bold enough to leave his comfort zone.
it's not just about Dylan going electric, but it's also about the fusion of an emerging tradition in popular music that was really political with rock and roll, which had largely not been overtly political. There's nothing like the feeling of your audience not being with you and walking out on you. People took it personal. You know, who needs him anymore? He's part of <laughs> your establishment and forget him. Where are all my friends? They felt betrayed, like you're supposed to be our Woody Guthrie and you sold out. <laughs> Not only did he take it, but he managed to just chokehold them all and make them see his vision. Like Other musicians started bringing poetry and politics and soul searching to popular music. It was obvious to me and the Hollies that we had a, a responsibility as artists to reflect our world around us, and we utilized our music to be able to reach people. Pop musicians in today's generation are in a fantastic position. They could rule the world, man. Well, I don't argue. We can shout it to the world. Like, so I why don't we do more of it? We can stop world wars before they ever started. I disagree. I don't believe that you, you know who start world I, wars. I, I, the one. Do you know who start world wars? People that are over forty. But really, they really. That want to conversation start. was unstoppable. You couldn't shut it down. Ray Davies from the Kinks and Pete Townsend from the Who were the two social commentators. Every political move, nation to nation, is really to try and break down these barriers between people. All of them were obsessively listening to one another. And what became the game was who can take rock and roll someplace more interesting? You know, records had been two or three of your singles, some covers of some other artist's song, and just a bunch of filler. Rubber Soul basically start the idea of the record as a complete statement. That's really a game changer. I think that Brian and the Beach Boys felt that he didn't fit in to this new British invasion thing that was happening. Beach Boys heard Rubber Soul. Brian Wilson was inspired to try to create something as pure and beautiful, and this, this album of everything was great. I remember going over to Brian's house, and I looked into the living room, and I saw that everything had been taken out except the piano, and the living room was completely filled with sand. <laughs> he said, I'm gonna write the greatest album ever recorded. 
60s, you see Brian Wilson retreating into the studio and he's concentrating on writing and producing these amazing songs. I may not always love you, but long as there are stars above you. The recording studio had been a rigid place where there were engineers literally in like suits and ties and lab coats when all of a sudden there were these crazy young geniuses who reinvented the studio as an instrument to be played with. God only knows what I'd be without you. Technology is evolving for how to record, and Brian Wilson was absolutely on the cutting edge of that. Music in the 60s was like any great art movement. The greatest practitioners of it pushed one another to be better. Have the mic on the piano quite low this time. In the studio, the Beatles' natural creativity was sort of brimming over, okay. and George Martin was a brilliant collaborator and champion of that. Run back the tape, please, Richard. You can slow down or speed up your tape. You can put in backward stuff. You can put in electronic sounds, which you couldn't possibly reproduce live. Something happens on air, you know, I couldn't tell you what, because then we have a special man who sits here and goes like this. And the guitar turns into a piano or something, you know. And then you may say, why don't you use a piano? Because the piano sounds like a guitar. There were FM radio stations that did nothing but play Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band over and over for the first three or four days that it came out, because that was all anybody wanted to listen to. Sgt. Pepper's became the thing. You'd drop the needle on it, and you'd hear a little crackle, and then you'd be taken away on this journey. I read the news today, oh boy. Sergeant Pepper was our opera. It sounded unlike anything we were used to. In the 60s, lyrics are generally infantile. And it's noise, not music. But the Sgt. Pepper album was a brilliant album, signifying a break from the old ways of being entertained. It really caught the moment. Pop music is, is, it is crucial to today's art, and it's crucial that it should remain art, and it is crucial that it should, it should progress as art. The British Invasion changed pretty much everything. It was not just a sound or a band or a phenomenon, but it was the beginning of the most powerful decades in popular music. Rock and roll music was very important in the growth of the society. We were able to speak our minds. We did shake up the world. No desire in any of our heads to sort of take over the world, you know. There is, however, a desire to get power in order to use it for good. How many people that you started loving in 1964 do you still love? The Beatles and the British invasion may be the greatest love story in a cultural sense that's ever been.
The communists seem to be putting us on the defensive on a number of fronts. We are behind, and uh, I'm sure they're making a concentrated effort to stay ahead. We may get beaten more. There are no quick, cheap, or easy victories in this game. We are aware of the international implications of the project, but we're not in this thing for the race aspects. Rockets for the lunar trip that will make this one seem puny already are being built. The first strides toward the stars were not without tragic setbacks. You're aware of the risks. We accept the risks, what risks there are. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. talented scientists, but we did not make a major effort in this area for many years. And we are now behind and paying the price of having the Soviet Union exploit a great uh, propaganda advantage with the flight of uh, the Sputnik as well as the flight of Mr. Gagarin. I have Marvin Kalb, CBS News correspondent in Moscow, on the phone now. Marvin, is there any doubt at all in your mind that this really happened, that the Russians really have put a man in space? I'm almost certain that the Russians did fire a man into outer space whose name is Gagarin. He's 27. It's a great historic scientific feat. At that time, we didn't really know whether a human could survive in space. And here, boom, the Soviets send this guy into space, and, um, and he survived. Yuri Gagarin was something that affected American proudness, that we are ahead of everybody now. It was first Sputnik satellite, and now first man in space was Russian. And you can understand that this was really in the middle of the Cold War. There was competition of the great superpowers. President, yes. could you give us your views, sir, about the Soviet achievement of putting a man in orbit and what it would mean to our space program as such? Well, it is a most impressive uh, scientific uh, accomplishment. I have already sent uh, congratulations to, uh, to Khrushchev and uh, to uh, the man who was involved. The space race wasn't just about space. It was about our own sense of security. It was this new Cold War battleground. And so it wasn't very hard to realize that if they could put a man in orbit, they could also put an atomic bomb in orbit. Suddenly, the sky was menacing. It means they're getting ahead of us, and we certainly need to start working hard to catch up. I think it's about time America woke up and did something about it. I believe it's uh, very impressive for propaganda purposes, but I think if we put our minds to it, that this country can top that in six months. From my perspective, as a kid, we were in a race against the Russians, and the Russians were the bad guys, and they were winning this race, and that meant they were superior to us, and yet they were the bad guys. In 1960, we had astronauts. But we hadn't had anybody in space yet, but we were kind of knocking on the door, getting ready to go. We're a little bit behind. We want to catch up. We want to be the leaders. There's another question, Doctor, and that is, do we have the stuff to do it? What would you say now that we must do to match this or better it? Well, the United States Man in Space program is based on the philosophy that uh, we don't want to pull a stunt and risk a man's life. For this reason, there are certain intermediate steps planned before we put a man in orbit. If this is successful, then and only then will an orbital attempt be made. The Mercury Project was our first real response to the Sputnik and to Yuri Gagarin's flight, and it was a big deal for us, I'll tell you, because all of a sudden we had 
seven guys, and they were fighter pilot types, very alpha male guys, fun to be around, you know. It was like being with rock stars. It's a gala day in Houston, as its citizens turn out by the tens of thousands to give a Texas-sized welcome to the U.S. space team. They were heroes even before the public knew their names. They became warriors on behalf of the United States against our most feared enemy, the Soviet Union. What they were hiring these guys for was for mindset. They wanted experienced test pilots who could observe and report during a very violent and dangerous activity. As we develop this spacecraft, almost everything we do uh, deals with the risky side of the business. We recognize that we can get killed flying spacecraft like we can get killed flying uh, T-33s or T-38s or, or driving my Corvette. It's just one of the facts of life for everyone, but uh, we have a job that is uh, very fascinating and it's worth the risk. Al Shepard was a uh, natural leader. He got the first ride into space. The Shirley Temple program, usually seen at this time, will not be presented in order that we may bring you the following special broadcast. Within the next few days, from this guarded wasteland, the first American will be launched into space. He will not go into orbit, as Yuri Gagarin did, but he will ride his spacecraft 116 miles up, and there he'll hang weightless for about five minutes until gravity pulls him back through the atmosphere to the sea nearly 300 miles downrange. This astronaut Shepard making his way to the elevator there is some applause from the 120 or so people. And now astronaut Shepard ascends the gantry plane. In a few moments, we'll be spaced in his capsule. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. lawmakers want to award the Medal of Honor to Shepard. All today appeared ready to spend more money on our space effort. All agreed Russia is still ahead. But all this was beside the point for the wife of the first American astronaut. Mrs. Alan Shepard at Virginia Beach, Virginia, heard the news with relief. Mrs. Shepard, could you tell us uh, what are your feelings on this tremendous occasion? Oh, I don't think I have to tell you, do I? I'm just so happy. It was beautiful, I thought. <laughs> The Gagarin flight was a 10, Al Shepard's flight was a 1 or a 2, okay, in terms of uh, the capability that it demonstrated. So uh, the Russians clearly were ahead of us. So the attitude is, we would like to do something really big, but small enough so that we could accomplish it. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. I don't know how he decided we could do that, because when we heard about it, we thought they, you know, lost their mind. reporting from the cabin of a C-131 over Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. This aircraft is executing a maneuver to make it and everyone in it temporarily weightless. This weightless condition is one of many that man must learn to tolerate or overcome to survive a first trip to the moon. Cronkite was the perfect person for space because he was a space junkie. He ended up um, covering the early Mercury missions, and he just became encyclopedic on it. What are the hazards, and what are our scientists doing to ensure man's survival in the hostile environment of outer space? That is our story. First man on the moon, as the Prudential Insurance Company of America presents the 20th century. This is Marine Lieutenant Colonel John H. Glenn, Jr., who within a few days will be the first American to fly in an orbit around the world. We're embarking on a completely new field here of space science. And uh, I'm happy and proud that I can maybe contribute a little bit in my own 
own way in this new field. John Glenn came along next and flew the first orbital flight for an American. Uh, to us, that was a huge deal because now we had an American hero who could at least stand up to Yuri Gagarin. Godspeed, John Glenn. before he's supposed to re-enter the atmosphere. The word comes that there's a possibility that Glenn's heat shield has detached from the base of the capsule. Texas, Capcom, Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight, go ahead. Uh, we have decided to re-enter with the pack on. Okay, Cape Flight, Cape Flight, go ahead. Uh, this is for Tip 7. Now, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. The only thing holding the heat shield on are three straps, which are attached to the retro rockets. So normally the plan is you fire the retro rockets and then you let him go, but now it becomes clear that if Glenn does that, he might be burned alive. He went through this period of intense ion buildup where you're, you lose contact with him. and uh, thanksgiving of all of us that Colonel Glenn has completed his trip. And I know that this is uh, particularly felt by Mrs. Glenn and his two children. It was quite a day. I don't know what you can say about a day in which you see four beautiful sunsets in one day, but it's pretty interesting. Now we know that Russia need not and will not have any monopoly on manned space flight. A new spirit has arisen in U.S. missile men and in our capital. Out of the growing pains of Project Mercury, a host of new projects will be born. Dr. Von Braun, you could have gone ahead faster if you had more money earlier, is that right? Well, this is true, uh, although uh, there are some limitations. You know, there's an old saying, it still takes nine months to have a baby. <laughs> big rockets, too. Von Braun was perfectly placed to get us off the planet. He was a German rocket scientist that we were pretty lucky to get after the war. Von Braun was a futurist and a visionary as much as anything else. He built the team that became America's brain trust for rocketry. I have come to Texas today to salute an outstanding group of pioneers. While headlines may be made by others in other places, history is being made every day by the men and women of the Aerospace Medical Center, without whom there could be no history. When he was assassinated, that was a personal blow. It was a personal blow to us, because he was the guy that got us on his track. When President Johnson came in, you know, he was going to continue to implement what President Kennedy had done. Those two men together led us to where we ended up at the end of the decade. Cape Canaveral are the new astronauts, the men who will join the original seven and ride the Gemini and Apollo spacecraft. They are the new pioneers of space. We were very fortunate in that our country always seemed to have the right person ready when the right person was needed. I give you Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was unflappable. He was a natural aviator, and Armstrong just seemed never to be ruffled. Neil's a cool guy, uh, as we all know. And uh, in fact, all of the guys that I was working with at the time were all exceptional pilots. And uh, so it's great to be on a team like that where they're all winners. Gemini is the space agency's bridge to the future. With it, we'll learn man's true capabilities and drawbacks in space. And on the last five Gemini flights, we'll practice several different forms of rendezvous. 
The skill needed to resupply spacecraft to change crews. The ability to operate in a new medium that is both fantastically rewarding and terrifyingly dangerous. Gemini, moreover, is a rehearsal for Apollo, the three-man spacecraft that will get us to the moon. The Russians surprise with another first in the person of Alexei Leonov, who they say became the first man to walk around in space. When Leonov went outside his spacecraft, we said, no, nah, he couldn't have done that. But the fact that the Soviets went outside successfully and came back was a shocker. The Soviet Union pushed Americans back. It was part of this game at that time. I would say for most of the 60s, we had a sense of being behind. It was a perfect launch, and Scorpio 6 is on its way to make space history. So, look. They see it! They, they see, see it! They see it! See it. S -O -L. Oh, no, it's not solid. It's it's not solid. It's right. it's right. The astronauts just became part of the fabric of the country. It was finding its way into the popular culture. If you grew up in the 50s, you were watching science fiction. But if you grew up in the 60s, you were watching it actually happen. I think I'm dragging a little bit, so I don't want to fire the gun yet. When Ed White went out on the first EVA, people were holding their breath. There was a real push to get a spacewalk as soon as possible. That turned out to be Gemini 4. And Ed White's spacewalk was just a magnificent thing. Okay, I've rolled up. I'm rolling to the right now. Under my own influence, there goes a... Looks like a thermal blast, yeah. It is, ah. He went out and he had this little nitrogen bottle to fire this little thruster that pushed this way and that way. So he could rotate himself around, you know, and so on. And it gave the appearance of being a piece of cake. Okay, I'm coming over. You're right, son, Ed. You look beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. There was absolutely no sensation of falling. There was very uh, little sensation of speed, other than the same type of sensation that we had in the capsule. I think as I stepped out, I thought the uh, biggest thing was a feeling of accomplishment of one of the goals of the Gemini 4 mission. The next major breakthrough will be the bringing together of two orbiting craft. The Russians have made one test in their program and presumably have learned something. We have not yet made our first test, so we must be considered behind. The primary goal of Project Gemini was to perform space rendezvous. Without that, no moon mission. With the lunar orbit rendezvous technique, where the lunar module flew back up rendezvous with the command module, you have to bring these two vehicles together and to get them close in such a way that it was then easy to dock them. It took a fair bit of work. We are flying a nose to nose. We can uh, very clearly see the right scanners operating. Roger, Tim. That was the moment when we pulled ahead in the space race. That was something that the Russians hadn't even come close to doing and wouldn't accomplish for a couple more years. It was an unknown as to how we were going to do that when we first started. But we got good at it, and we mastered it on Neil Armstrong's flight, Gemini 8. Well, Houston, this is Gemini 8. Uh, first station keeping on Eugene at about 150 feet. Way to go, partner. You've done it, boy. You've done it. Good job. Man, that's great. Man, that is really slick. Okay, Jimmy 8, uh, we have cams solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. We are docked. They found another object in space, and they docked them together to make one big spacecraft, a rocket on the nose of the Gemini. That was amazing. So it's nighttime, power down, have dinner, and get ready for the next day. And I happened to look over at Neil's panel, and I saw his eight ball, his attitude gyro, in a bank. And I said, Neil, we're in a bank.
they got up to one revolution a second. So we decided to undock from the Agena, which we suspected was a problem. And then the Gemini started spinning very rapidly. And we figured out that, oh, it's the Gemini. The only way that they were able to get out of this thing was for him to fire his thruster. They stopped the spinning spacecraft before it spun so much that they passed out. We got down alive, and Neil said, I think we'll both have another chance, and we did. The week in space. CBS News coverage of astronaut Gene Cernan's Gemini 9. Two and a half hour walk in space. Reporting from the CBS News Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. The space walk is over. The hatch has been locked closed again. Cernan is safely back in the spacecraft. Uh, it was a disappointing space walk in the true sense. The only thing we did not do well was EVA extravehicular activity. For the last flight, Gemini 12, Buzz brought in the idea of training in the water tank. I was a scuba diver from 1957, so I, I knew a bit about dealing with currents and moving around and spacewalking. It was very delicate moving and uh, you balance so you don't uh, exert yourself. So I started training underwater. Buzz put all that together and the final EVA was done very much by the book. It was a big success. So I was standing up in the hatch and looking around and took a couple pictures of Texas and the Astrodome, and I decided, uh, well, let me just turn around and take a picture. Nothing unusual about that. But that was the first selfie in space. When Gemini was over, the team of people, the planners, the astronauts, and the people in the control center were completely synced. And we came out of it with confidence in ourselves. It was like, let us have this Apollo stuff. We're going to take it to the moon as fast as we possibly can. I recognize it, that uh, there is some risk. People might look at our work as, as uh, being perhaps dangerous, but uh, we just try to take as much of that out of, as we can during the pre-testing to make sure the systems are good. I think we train in it and work in it so much that and understand it well enough that we don't look at it from this viewpoint. And as to how far I want to go, I want to go as far as uh, NASA goes in, during my useful time as a pilot to them. I'd like to go on a moon flight, and if we go to Mars, I'd like to go on that. NASA is looking ahead to the first manned Apollo flight. Now, this is an early version that was intended only for test flights in Earth orbit. And they've had a lot of problems with this spacecraft, but they figure when you develop any new spacecraft, you're going to have bugs. The regularly scheduled program will not be seen at this time in order to bring you this special program. It was all over in one stunned, horrifying second. At T minus 10 minutes in a simulated countdown, an electrical spark apparently shot out and ignited the 100% oxygen in the cabin. On closed circuit TV screens, horrified engineers watched the burst of flames and smoke envelop Grissom, White, and Chaffee. They heard their last words of shock and surprise. The flames enveloped Apollo 1. The crewmen never had a chance. News of the tragedy reached the White House shortly after formal signing of a 60-nation space treaty. President Johnson immediately sent condolences to the families of the astronauts. Then he issued this statement, three valiant young men have given their lives in service to the nation. We mourn the great loss and our hearts go out to their families. The Apollo fire was a shock to those of us in the program. It was a real shock, it was devastating. How could we put these guys in there? How could we not see 
how dangerous it was. How could we do that? There's reason to believe that establishing a deadline of 1970 for the moon flight contributed to their deaths. NASA has acknowledged that success had dulled its earlier apprehensions, but it's determined not to let its revived fears paralyze its future efforts, and that seems the proper attitude. Your option is either to stop or to keep going, and in some ways it's almost insulting to their memory to stop. What you want to do is you want to fix the problem, and you want to keep going. You want to achieve that goal, and that's what those guys would have wanted. Any endeavor is going to meet with tragedy and failure. That's the way humankind has progressed the complete reorganization of the Apollo space program, without a doubt, happened because of the fire. At the Langley Center, an accomplished lunar acrobat, Amos Spady, gave some basic training in moonwalking to this reporter. Gosh, I feel like Peter Pan. He was like a big kid in a candy store. When you're doing TV and you want to talk about something happening, the best way to do it was well, go out and do it yourself. And Walter enjoyed it. What happens if I fall over on my face? Am I going Nothing at all. Very uh, simple, very soft, slow motion, in fact. Just so I uh, fall over on my face to see? Right. <laughs> Just let yourself fall. Really? Right. Okay. Here I go. Oh, nothing to it. Why don't you try jumping a little bit? Here I go. Woo! <laughs> this is just really for fun and games. Uh, what do you do for a living, Amos? <laughs> Mr. Von Braun, what do you see in the way of the vehicle in which we travel in space in the next 35 years? Already in the last 15 years, we've built up this system of rockets to the point that your model doesn't even fit in the room any longer. Are we going far beyond Saturn V? I think there will be a continued need for some sort of workhorse, and there's rather arbitrary how big it'll be unless, as long as it is big. The Saturn V is like the mythic monument to human audacity. No matter how you look at it, this thing was just a mind blower. Saturn V was actually three big rockets stacked on top of each other with the spacecraft on the very top with three guys in it. And you knew that that sucker was going someplace. It had a purpose in mind and it was going someplace. You get to December of 1968, and Frank Borman and Jim Lovell and Bill Anders have actually been training to fly the first flight around the moon. We kind of feel that this flight has set the, uh, the pace to uh, begin in earnest our uh, lunar landing Apollo program. The countdown to liftoff for Apollo 8 is now T minus 50 minutes and counting. This will be the first manned flight of the Saturn V, the largest rocket man has ever built. And it has the explosive potential in its fuel of two and a half million tons of TNT. Broadcasting the launch of the Saturn V, I never got over it. We have ignition sequence start. And I'm supposed to be talking all through this. The engines are on. It's hard to talk when you're holding your breath. Three, two, one, zero. Three, two, one, zero. We have commit, we have put off. E1 AM Eastern Standard Time. Looks good. We've cleared the tower. Oh, and there's the rumble in our building. It looks good. It looks like a good flight. This building is shaking under us. Our camera platform is shaking. But what a beautiful flight. We interrupt this program to present another in the series of onboard television transmissions from the Apollo 8 space capsule. Brought to you by Tang, the instant breakfast drink chosen for Gemini and Apollo astronauts. Apollo 8, now 175,450 miles from Earth and about to be pulled in by the moon's gravity. The astronauts have now truly left the Earth and its gravity. For this second telecast, Frank Borman has fixed the TV camera on a bracket below his window and has turned Apollo 8 so it faces the Earth. And now, here are the television pictures coming through from Apollo Control. Uh, here's to what you're seeing is the Western Hemisphere. I can see the southwestern part of the United States. And it appears now that the East Coast is cloudy. Apollo 8, around Christmas of 1968, 
showed us the craters of the moon and then showed us the earth at the same time and spoke to us. They read the book of Genesis. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called these the far side of the moon and the earth rise for the first time seen by human eyes as well as that television broadcast from in orbit around the moon i'm sorry on christmas eve holy smokes who wrote that who's the genius who wrote that script pretty dang good Nineteen sixty-eight was a tough year for the country. Assassinations, bad stuff happening in Vietnam, and people were kind of down. But it was a great way to end it with people going around the moon for the first time. No one's been able to do it since, beside the United States. Then Apollo Nine goes up a few months later, does everything it needs to do in Earth orbit. Then you have Apollo Ten that does the same thing that Apollo 9 does, but except they fly all the way to the moon to do it in lunar orbit. The lunar module goes down to within a few miles of the lunar surface. That works fine, they come back. No one has paid attention to Apollo 10. <laughs> Apollo 10 risked death like everybody, and it's just this forgotten thing. Oh yeah, they did that too. What a shame they didn't get to land on the moon. And just a few months later, they came down to Apollo 11. What kind of a physical sensation do you expect at actual touchdown? I hope, I hope that it'll be relatively mild. Uh, there's no intention to make a, a smooth touchdown. We would uh, prefer to come in uh, several feet per second so that we will collapse the struts so that that bottom step on the ladder is close enough to get down to the moon and, even more important, close enough to get back up one. This is CBS News coverage of Man on the Moon. It's almost like this enormous flywheel of momentum was gathering speed. And the level of public attention on those three astronauts, and especially on Neil Armstrong, because by that time, we all knew that Neil was going to be the first one to put his foot on the moon. Aldrin will follow just 20 minutes later, and Armstrong will take that first step in more ways than one. Here they are as they left the, uh, the Manned Space Center at about 6.30 this morning. There the van backs up uh, to this cage elevator and uh, takes them up a couple of floors to the second level. Then out of that cage and across a few feet through a large hatch in the permanent launch structure. The countdown going well, 28 minutes and uh, counting. We've got a picture there of oh. former President Johnson and uh, Mrs. Johnson as they arrive in that uh, DVVIP viewing area. Now a transfer is complete. We're on internal power with the launch vehicle at this time. T minus 15 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. And guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.
miles, 195 feet per second. Houston, be advised, the visual is go today. Yeah, they finally gave me a window to look out. Back here at our CBS News Space Headquarters, we're watching the countdown to the landing on the moon and waiting for the, uh, the spacecraft to come around on this side of the moon again so we can get confirmation that all is still going well. Eleven, uh, you got a pretty big audience. It's live in the U.S., it's going live to Japan, Western Europe, and much of South America. Appreciate the great show. They weren't just going on a pleasure cruise here. They had a lot of work to do. They needed to be on the top of their game, working together as a crew and with the control center, so they were probably in the zone. I would have been in the zone big time. Everything had been tried on the missions leading up to that point, except the landing itself, and there was a good reason for that. The landing was the most complex part of the entire Apollo mission. It was essentially a controlled fall. Landing, 3,000 feet. We're go, same time, we're go. Down two and a half. Neil Armstrong took over manually during the descent because they were coming down in an area that was the planned area to land, but there were boulders and some other kind of stuff. So he had to maneuver the lunar lander away from, from where it was headed to land. Pick up some dust. Which also caused everybody to start worrying because they had a finite amount of fuel. And so for him to do what he did caused everybody on the ground to get really nervous. Contact right. Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. Armstrong is on the moon. Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. It was a moment when it seemed like the whole country and even most of the world kind of stopped in their tracks and just took all this in with a sense of wonder and almost disbelief. My God, can this really be happening? Oh, that looks beautiful, Daniel. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Okay, you ready for me to come out? All set. Okay, I'm on the top step. You've got three more steps and then a long one. There you go. We'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this land. Dear men from the planet Earth, first step foot upon the moon, July 1969, B.T. It came in peace for all mankind. The real moment of truth is next. They still have to get off the surface of the moon. They push the button on the computer, and then bang. They see the moon receding from them. And then some minutes later, they're back in lunar orbit, and they're on their way to rendezvous with Mike Collins. Although the entire world could watch the Apollo 11 astronauts take man's first steps on the moon, the pre-dawn darkness of the mid-Pacific obscured their return to Earth. So it was already daylight when the carrier Hornet approached and found Columbia in the ocean swells. Neil, Buzz, and Mike, I want you to know that I think I'm the luckiest man in the world because I have the privilege of uh, speaking for so many and welcoming you back to Earth. It was such a huge event in our country's history. I grew up in New York. This was bigger than the Mets winning the World Series in 69. I remember as a little boy looking up to them, thinking that these guys are even cooler than, you know, the, the Beatles. You know, these guys were the epitome of cool. There was another one of these suckers scheduled for November. So the people who did it were so busy getting ready for the next one, they didn't have time to celebrate the first one. Apollo 12, Houston. Hello, Houston. Yankee 
clipper with intrepid in tow has arrived on time. We didn't actually spend much time asking ourselves about the greater meaning of this. We weren't aware of what was going on around the world in terms of the reaction of people. We just pressed right on. I think I see my crater. Hey, there it is. There it is. Son of a gun, right down the middle of the road. Outstanding, 42 degrees, Pete. It wasn't until afterwards that we began to realize the depth of the significance of it. Until Apollo 11, the moon was unattainable mystery. But after Apollo 11, the moon is mysterious no longer. All of human experience will be divided into two eras, before man walked on the moon and after man walked on the moon. The whole world was together at that particular moment. It was an example that in spite of all that's going on down here, in spite of all that we're going through, there's hope. My generation is the generation that changed the moon from an object to a place. And that will never happen again. There can only be one first time. The space program in the 1960s, it set the standard of what we could do. I mean, even say it today, we can land a man on the moon, but we can't do this. You know, we, when we think of it within the space program, we're like, go to Mars? Yeah, we could go to Mars. We went to the moon in 1969. We can do anything. To all those Americans who built those spacecraft and put their heart and all their abilities in, into those crafts, to those people, tonight we give a special thank you. And to all the other people that are listening and watching tonight, God bless you. Good night from Apollo 11. Thursday on the 60s. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. 1968 was one damn thing after another. More troops are being killed every week. People were afraid. I picked up the phone. This colleague said something's happening to the senator. There's something happening here. The 60s, Thursday night at 9 on CNN. The enemy of freedom has chosen to make this year the decisive one. Something's going to happen. The change is on the way. We can change America. We can change the world. What we need now is a reconciliation in this land. There's not anything wrong with you that a good haircut wouldn't cure you. Rest assured, we Democrats will stir it up up here. This election year of 1968 has touched the emotions and assaulted logic as never before. I think we're having a little too much violence in this country. We go up together or we go down together. If we have that love and understanding for our fellow citizens, we will have a new America. And I need your help. If you look at the whole year as theater, as real acts of tragedy, there's an almost poetic feeling to it. 1968 was one goddamn thing after another. Hardly a day goes by without a new report of another demonstration or protest against the Vietnam War. There is in the land a certain restlessness. Lyndon Johnson, whatever else one thinks of him, his reputation will always have the stone of Vietnam around it. We're living in the middle of a 
beast. Lyndon Johnson is a common murderer. Johnson did things that no other president did. Civil rights, great society. He should have been somebody that every young person and every liberal would have celebrated, but they didn't. He became the Vietnam War president. We've been told repeatedly that we're succeeding. We're, we're defeating them. They can't hold out. Johnson kept saying, there's light at the end of the tunnel. This is a CBS News special report. Saigon under fire. The enemy in Vietnam has demolished the myth that allied military strength controls that country. The American embassy is under siege. Inside are the Viet Cong terror squads that charged in during the night. The Tet Offensive was an enormous game changer. They were shooting up the American embassy. They had hit dozens of cities all over Vietnam. It was a tremendous shock. Already, get closer. We have known for several months now that the communists planned a massive winter spring offensive. We do not think that our military operations are going to be at all ma materially affected. He was unable to be honest with the American people because, of course, he was unwilling to simply say, this is an unwinnable war. Cronkite's Vietnam Report, real one, take four. These ruins are in Saigon, capital and largest city of South Vietnam. When he went to Vietnam during Tet, it was the first time and maybe the only time that Walter had shown any kind of bias in his public broadcast. It is increasingly clear to this report that the only rational way out will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. After Walter Cronkite, Johnson's popularity sinks. To most ordinary citizens, it has become obvious the war is not being won. Opposition to the war was rising. It wasn't just beatniks and young kids. We are fighting a war. And I'm convinced that it is one of the most unjust wars that has ever been fought in the history of the world. Martin Luther King came out uh, against the Vietnam War. His own followers said, you shouldn't be focusing on that. You should be focusing on our issue. And he said, they're intertwined. You can't separate them. President Kennedy said on one occasion, mankind must put an end to war. A war will put an end to mankind. Do you honestly think that if there was an election, a vote for and against the war, that the anti-war people would win out? Well, it's really hard to tell now. The polls are uncertain, but the polls do say that most of the country is discontent with the manner the war is taking. I think something ought to be done. Senator, how are you? When some of the anti-war activists were looking for somebody to run for president, a number of people turned them down, including Robert Kennedy. There are increasing reports out of Washington that your advisors are now telling you that you should run against President Johnson this year. I have no plans. I have no uh, plans to change the statement that I've already made. According to our Mr. Senator... The assumption among the Kennedy intimates was that LBJ was totally unbeatable in 1968, and Bobby would run in 1972. The anti-war movement needed a leader, and it fell to Gene McCarthy. How do you do? Senator, uh, President Johnson supporters say you don't have a chance here in New Hampshire, and you'll be lucky if you get 10% of the vote. What do you say about that? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, the people who are supporting me say we'll do much better than that. One Democrat, Senator Eugene McCarthy, defied precedent to bid for his party's nomination. His platform, peace. Eugene McCarthy does something that, you know, is taboo. He comes out against a sitting president from the same party. McCarthy came in from left field. He was not thought of in the front rank of presidential contenders. But there was a great deal of frustration and even despair among the young. Eugene McCarthy gave them hope. Who volunteers for Senator McCarthy? Yeah. Reminding everybody to vote in the primary. From NBC News Election Central in Manchester, New Hampshire, this is the news. If McCarthy gets as much as 30% of the vote or more against an incumbent president, he can legitimately claim an important victory. A 
McCarthy didn't win the New Hampshire primary, but he took enough votes that it scared Lyndon. They got 42% of the vote, but McCarthy was a nothing, an upstart. If McCarthy could draw blood, Johnson was vulnerable. You said 68 was the year. I think that March the 12th was the day. How does this strike you? You're not disappointed that he didn't oh, actually win? Oh, no. no. Oh, he did win, though. This is exactly what he wanted. He said he shouldn't have dissent that, that breaks down our system. You should work through the democratic process to get what you want. You can hope, and I mean, you've got to base it on a dream, and this is coming true. Whatever happened to Robert Kennedy? Uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the most important result out of all this from McCarthy's viewpoint is that he will, from now on, be treated as a serious presidential candidate. All of a sudden, after New Hampshire, there's a new political reality, and Bobby very rapidly starts recalculating. Would you welcome his entrance? Well, I don't know. It's a little crowded now, but... Uh... <laughs> This CNN original series, The 60s, is brought to you by CokeCareers.com. Tell you the issue of 68. The issue of 1968 is not the Johnson personality, but the Johnson policies. And I happen to believe that this country can't afford four more years of Lyndon Johnson. That is the issue of 1968. For 16 years now, in the shadow play of American politics, there has always been a Richard Nixon. He's not coming back. He never left. Most political observers thought Nixon was finished. He'd been counted out so many times. So Nixon wanted to show the leaders of the Republican Party he was a winner. We'll inaugurate a Republican president next January. Thank you. Media consultants worked with him so he wouldn't be the sweaty Nixon of 1960. I'm, I'm really the most difficult man in the world when it comes to a so-called public relations firm. Nobody's going to package me. Uh, nobody's going to make me put on an act for television. If people looking at me say that's a new Nixon, then all that I can say is, well, maybe you didn't know the old Nixon. I wrote a diary of being on the Nixon campaign plane, and I came out just saying, what does he believe in? What does he care about? How can we trust him? I realized that the person I felt most related to was Robert Kennedy. I have traveled and I have listened to the young people of our nation and felt their anger about the war that they are sent to fight, about the world that they are about to inherit. I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Eugene McCarthy clears the way and tests the water, but he wasn't the guy who was going to get there. Bobby was going to get there. This nation must adopt a foreign policy which says clearly and distinctly, no more Vietnams. You have the declaration of another rival candidate from within his own party. Currents of anti-war sentiment are building up. And at the same time, the war is getting worse. I think if you're Lyndon Johnson, you feel you're being surrounded by a stampede. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight, I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. This is the moment for LBJ, where the pressures of Vietnam are becoming almost overwhelming. It is true that a house divided against itself is a house that cannot stand. Accordingly, I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. You have just heard the President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, in an address from his office at the White House. The advanced text of his address did not contain those last remarks saying, and I quote from President Johnson, I shall not seek and will not accept the nomination of my party for the presidency. Roger, uh, no question about it, this was a bombshell politically. Well, I, you, you really don't know where to begin. Uh... <clears throat> Our guest today on Meet the Press is the Vice President, Hubert H. Humphrey, who yesterday announced his candidacy for the Democratic presidential nomination. Hubert Humphrey was LBJ's Vice President, and now he's running for President. Humphrey 
has doubts about Vietnam, but has been a good soldier. He has stood by Johnson. Your president made the supreme political sacrifice to promote this cause of peace. He was one of the casualties of this war. I don't think there was ever an overwhelming enthusiasm for, for Hubert. The drama of McCarthy and Kennedy had captured everyone's attention. Is the key Vietnam? Yes, in a large way, in a large measure. Not totally, but uh, uh, there's a certain degree of general protest amongst youth, which I think is, uh, on balance, a healthy thing. <laughs> There was a lot of frustration on the part of, of students that the war was not drawing to a close despite our, our demonstrations. So the students began to become more militant. At Columbia University, students barricade themselves into university buildings. Their leader is a 20-year-old ex-Boy Scout, Mark Ruff. I would say that, that we now have more support than any group has on about any political issue has ever held on any at any time. Columbia became the symbol of students in revolt. Activists like Tom Hayden went to Columbia and said, let's have more Columbias. There's nothing like feeling that you're fighting the power or somebody's listening to you at least to draw more people in. We started shouting the phrase. And it's a phrase that's been used in other words and by actions of people all around the world when they face troops. And that phrase is, I forget the war, motherfucker! We had an idea that this was the beginning of something very important. We took it as the beginning of revolution. What's happening to America? Conversation 3. Tonight, our young people. What's bothering them? Is there really a generation gap? Generation gap is a way that whites in this country and the structure in this country, the system in this country, rationalizes its lack of responsibility in teaching this generation how to solve the problems which we are faced with. 1968 was the year that you could point to and say, here is where the separation began between past generations and generations going forward. I think all of us have a role to play. And I think all of us have a great stake in the future. You more than anybody else. As President Kennedy once said, you have the least ties to the past and the greatest stake in the future. You always find idealism in youth. And I think that's something my father and my uncle recognized and why they always visited the universities. I remember my father talking about how the founders of the American Revolution, you know, they were young people. Well, you fellas don't even vote over here. You're not any older than my son. You don't even vote. Come up here and I'll autograph your sandals for you. That'll make you feel better. There was a third party candidate in this election, George Wallace. But Wallace was not affected by the Vietnam issue. He was going to have a certain amount of support in the South, come what may. There's not a dime's worth of difference in either one of the two parties. And if they don't give the people a choice, we're going to give them a choice by having a new party. There was just a plain, ordinary, anti government streak in him. It was his act. You bastards in Washington are not going to tell me what to do. And you anarchists had better have your day now, because I tell you again, you're through after November 5th in this country. I have already introduced Ladies and gentlemen, Could you lower those signs, please? I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. When King was killed, Bobby was on his way to a campaign stop in Indianapolis, into the, going into the ghetto. And the cops said, don't go. They were fearful of a riot. Bobby went anyways. 
for those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. He gives this spontaneous speech to an absolutely devastated crowd. This wasn't just politics. He made it personal. Let us say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much. This country and every person in it suffered a terrible loss tonight with the assassination of this man. The perpetrator of this deed brings down upon all of us the painful charge that we Americans are prisoners of violence and destruction and death. That is the tragedy of it. Restraint, gentleness, charity. Virtues we so desperately need have had a dark day. King was the only rational voice that was left in America. He stood against the war in Vietnam. He stood against violence, period. So when you killed him, you killed everything. You killed the only rational voice that's left. It became absolutely clear you don't want Dr. King, you've assassinated nonviolent direct action, you've tried to kill the dream. Okay, here's a taste of the nightmare. The outrage could not be contained. Fires burned in the cities of America. Washington, Chicago, Detroit, Boston, New York, these are just a few of the cities in which the Negro anguish over Dr. King's murder expressed itself in violent destruction. I remember coming back to Washington two or three days after King had been killed. You're thinking, what am I seeing here? This is the United States of America, and there are, there are machine guns on the steps of the Capitol? 100 cities rage with riot. 20,000 are arrested. People were in open revolt. Sirens wailing, people screaming. And it, it, it shook everyone, black and white, to the core. Nothing could be more desecrating to the memory of Martin Luther King than to use his death as an excuse to engage in, in violence. There was a faith and spirit vacuum. And when you find people who have lost that hope, fear tends to fill that vacuum. People were increasingly afraid. And Mr. Law and Order stepped up on the Republican side My father's appeal was to really the most disenfranchised classes. He felt like nobody else was speaking for them, and that's where his base was, rather than with the, with the liberals. The liberals were for McCarthy. I want to reassure you that I'm not yielding to anybody along the way, either the vice president or Senator Kennedy. Indiana, Bobby wins. Nebraska, Bobby wins. And then on May 28th, Oregon. McCarthy's crowds in recent days have been good, larger than Kennedy's in many places, although without the frenzy that accompanies a Kennedy appearance. I can't afford to lose if I'm going to remain uh, a very active and viable candidate. It would uh, very adversely affect me in a very serious way. The actual final figures yet to come in, but apparently Senator McCarthy has won a major victory in Oregon. Senator Kennedy has suffered a severe setback. They move on now to California and the primary there a week from tonight. And this result tonight does not prove, of course, that Kennedy is politically dead this year. It does prove that he is politically mortal. It establishes that he is Robert Kennedy after all, not John F. Kennedy. I think what will happen now is that McCarthy gets a new life. He's still a long shot, but he has a chance now. I think that, uh, however, you don't uh, write off Robert Kennedy uh, because he can come off the floor and win big in California. That's what he has to do. But if he doesn't win big in California, he's had it.
Kennedy, having lost Oregon, knew that he had to win California, and that would be his ticket to the convention. It will take a very big win, a spectacular win in California, to repair the badly shattered Kennedy image. Bobby's going to do it. You know, this is just the way everybody felt. I was upstairs in the Ambassador Hotel. We were getting ready for a victory party, and somebody called. I picked up the phone in the suite, and this colleague said, something's happened to the senator. It was Bedlam. I couldn't find Kennedy. Finally found him. He was lying on the floor. I can't say that people thought, how could this happen? Because we'd seen it happen. Truth is that this had been in the back of everybody's mind. And one of the reasons why, you know, some people said, don't do this, don't run. Robert Kennedy is in the most grave condition. And hope is difficult to find. this new tragedy. People say, well, it was inevitable. His brother was murdered and so was he. Nothing's inevitable, it just happened. This plane will take back the body of Robert Francis Kennedy to New York. Also on board this plane today will be Mrs. John F. Kennedy. Also on board will be another widow, Mrs. Martin Luther King Jr. Somehow and in some way, we seem to be sending a great many of our young leaders to their early graves. It's been a very emotional period for all of us who have worked for the senator. And personally, the most horrifying thing in these last few days was this morning when I tacked this black ribbon onto my campaign button. Because now I'm lost. I'm desperate. And I don't know where we're going from here. 
when Senator Kennedy went down, he was trying to speak for those Americans, including the young, who feel a need to change many aspects of American life. Well, that cause has not been stilled forever because even without him, the changes will be made because they have to be. But nobody knows when, nor how, nor whether the changes will be made peacefully or violently. In the meantime, this country has lost another leader. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, has lost the, the only leader that I feel gives us any hope for the future. I mean, what happens to the country? I mean, you, be, you wonder if it's worth saving, you know. What, what is it? What's left of this country? I know my own feelings were, and I think they were widely shared. We have to question ourselves. Is our country coming apart? Uh, what are we becoming? Rockefeller in New York, for starters, and George Romney of Michigan. There was some talk of, of Reagan. But Nixon had a lock on the delegates. We are a nation in crisis. Right now, change rules America. It's time for America to rule change. It is my privilege to place in nomination the man for 1968, the Honorable Richard M. Nixon. There are 30 votes in Wisconsin, and this should put him across. Richard M. Nixon. Congratulations. Uh, sit down, get to work. <laughs> It looks like Nixon, nobody is really surprised, and no committed uh, Republican feels cheated. What was the fuss all about? The Republicans understand that Nixon, in this time of tumultuousness, he gives people the sense of continuity. What is most important now is for us to think how we can get this war ended. Mr. Nixon talks of an honorable peace, but says nothing about how he would attain it. At this point, the war is continuing at as hot a pace as it's ever been. More troops are being killed every week than at any time in the course of the war. This weekend, the enemy stepped up attacks throughout South Vietnam. We knew that we would not be able to influence the Republicans on Vietnam, so we wanted to put massive pressure on the Democrats. I didn't think anything could happen with Vietnam without that challenge. This is a CBS News Campaign 68 convention special. What's going to happen in Chicago? On this eve of the beginning of the 35th Democratic National Convention, Chicago is nearly security tight. Perhaps the heaviest security ever provided for a political gathering in the free world. The police, several thousand of them, are now deployed. Soldiers have arrived in Chicago and are standing by. For the convention, the plan was to have a mass anti-war demonstration and a mass counterculture festival. We gathered in the parks. We're going to march because we have a right to, because that's what we came here to Chicago to do, and no one's going to stop us. Thank you. There were many factions. They were united only by a feeling that this is our moment. This is Carnegie Hall. No more war! No more war! We are uh, concerned about the buildup of the force because we think that uh, anything that's built up like this is liable to be used. A democratic convention is about to begin in a police state. 
There just doesn't seem to be any other way to say it. The people of Chicago and its mayor are proud to welcome a great political gathering of Americans who come here to shape the future of a nation. And as long as I'm mayor of this town, there'll be law and order in Chicago. The two men who most still believe this is all about arrived in Chicago today to begin their final drive for delegate votes. Most of us were saying it just wasn't politically possible for McCarthy to overcome those who were pledged to Humphrey. So there clearly needed to be another force. Arriving now, Senator George McGovern of South Dakota. McGovern got into the race because there was a big hole in the anti-war side. And, you know, Bobby Kennedy had a lot of delegates. McCarthy said he didn't believe McGovern had enough strength to make any difference. And so McCarthy said he'll continue the fight for the nomination, although it was clearly implied that his chances are very slim. Mayor Daley set up all the conditions for conflict in Chicago. He didn't give them permits to march, but he knew that they were coming anyway. Over 10,000 demonstrators were gathered in Chicago's Grant Park. The demonstrators are determined to march on Convention Hall tonight in protest. The police are at the park in force. You can count on it, that the police and the authorities will always unify what you can't unify by yourself. The tumultuousness, the violence that was happening outside the hall became reflected inside the hall. There seems to be some kind of uh, battle going on over there. Uh, yes, directly under our booth here, they're carrying a man out. I got into a melee in the convention hall myself. Push me, take your hands off of me, unless you plan to arrest me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, Walter, as you can see, I don't know what's going on, but I think we've got a bunch of thugs here, Dan. Well, mind you, Walter, I'm all right. I, it's, uh, it's all in day's work. It reflected for all the world to see the repression inside the hall in what was supposed to be a democratic society of free people nominating someone to be president. Chicago, across from Grant Park, beside the Hilton Hotel, there has been in progress for some time a peace demonstration. The police have come to put it down. The National Guard has been called to help. You create disorder if you try to impose too much order with force. So that's what happened. They were suppressing our democratic rights in order to continue an undemocratic war. police riot. I had never seen that before in my life. I had never seen groups of uniformed policemen going after civilians. There were pools of blood on Michigan Avenue. The whole world is watching our chance to crowd on the side. With George McGovern as president of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo's tactics in the streets of Chicago. See what was happening downtown? Uh, yes, I saw it with this television set. Do you think this is going to cost the Democrats the election? This, what's happening here in Chicago well, this evening? I don't think there's any question. I think not only the party but the country is split in half, and I think they'll veer away from this dissension. Thank you very much, Shirley MacLaine and Roosevelt Greer, watching the television set in the back of the hall about what's going on downtown. It is my high honor to present the new leader of our party, the next president of the United States. The Honorable I proudly accept the nomination of our party. We got Hubert Humphrey, 
as the candidate. Humphrey was an example of what we were fighting. He was a liberal who was going to betray our hopes. I see an HHH on your lapel. Does that mean you're for Humphrey all the way? Well, uh, I wouldn't say all the way. Uh, I'm a Democrat, and he's the nominee. Now it's true what George Wallace said. If the first job at hand is to end this war, there isn't a dime of difference there between Humphrey and Nixon. Vice President Humphrey remains, by any basis of measurement available, a complete underdog. My feeling is that if he could cut himself off from the president, be his own man, that he has a chance of winning this election and it would make it very easy for all of us to support him. Humphrey desperately needed to separate himself from the administration, and he did. I think the greatest task of statesmanship is to find a way to conclude and bring that war in Southeast Asia to an end and to do it. The public was so happy that there was some movement towards peace in Vietnam. Humphrey was back in the game, and it was neck and neck. From NBC News, Election Central. Nixon's the one. That's the natural banner for any sprightly front page tonight. 94% of the popular vote is counted. There are the numbers. It was one of the closest elections in American history. Closer even than when Nixon lost to Kennedy eight years ago. I have done my best. I have lost. Mr. Nixon has won. The democratic process has worked its will. George Wallace carried five states, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi. In our judgment, the people who supported us uh, had an impact on orienting uh, the two parties in a different direction. And I do wish for Mr. Nixon the most success of any president in the history of our country. Having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this. Winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> With Nixon's election, even though many people felt a sense of disappointment, there was a sense that there may be some normality on the horizon. People were exhausted. So there was, in part, a sense of relief. Maybe, thank God, it's over. certainly has been one of the unhappiest years in American history. In the end, it always comes down to what the people do. And this year, the people, like the events of 1968, are largely unpredictable. Our country was put to some enormous tests in 1968. There was a bend, but there wasn't a break. The issues that were thrown open in 1968 who has authority, who deserves authority, or what the limits of power are. Those are profound questions that continue to matter. This will be an open administration, open to new ideas, open to men and women of both parties, open to the critics as well as those who support us. And I am confident that this task is one that we can undertake and one in which we will be successful. Next Thursday on the 60s. Jack, what is your definition of a husband? A husband is a guy who's in charge and should be all of the time. What we are talking about is a revolution and not a reform. Rules that had existed for a thousand years, just overnight they were gone. It's amazing we waited till the 60s to break the walls down. But it was time. Stop, children, what's that sound? The 60s, Everybody next Thursday night at 9 on CNN. Yeah. opportunity to all our people. We feel that women will work just as good as men and better. The husband is the guy who's in charge and should be all of the time. The latest threat to the status quo is the women's revolt. It is a pleading for social change. Even the fear of imprisonment forces most homosexuals to camouflage their identity. Let's grow up, conservatives. 
public, we did not have the whole picture. What we are talking about is a revolution and not a reform. the 60s saw explosive social change but the question is why in the 60s Eric there are periods in history so far as I can see it when human energies both constructive and destructive just seem to come to a boil you were living in a time of incredible economic growth in theory things had never ever ever been better it was just a really American Norman Rockwell vision. But the trouble is there are all kinds of tensions. The Civil Rights Movement is the seminal event of the 1960s that ignites so many other changes in society. The day had come when racism must be banished. The civil rights movement was incredibly inspiring, but at the same time, the women in it were not recognized as leaders in the same way that the men were. It said to us, if these movements we love still are not equal, then there has to be an autonomous women's movement. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President the Democratic platform promises to work for equal rights for women, including equal pay. What have you done for the women well, I'm sure we haven't done enough, and, uh... <laughs> In 1961, President Kennedy creates the Commission on the Status of Women. That commission produced a report in 1963 that revealed things like the fact that women earned 59 cents for every dollar that men earned, that women were kept out of the most lucrative professional positions. Women couldn't open a bank account in their own name. They couldn't get credit. They certainly couldn't open their own business. Women couldn't serve on juries in some states. There was one kind of disadvantage after another that was revealed altogether in this one report. Perhaps you'd be willing to tell the people what you feel is the real need for it. We want to be sure that women are used as effectively as they can to provide a better life for our, our people, in addition to meeting their primary responsibility, which is in the home. Women's position as it had traditionally been was that they were husband's helpmeets. Jack, what is your definition of a husband? I think it's like driving a horse, and he's got to hold the reins. And there's just a couple of reins, and if there were two people holding these reins, this horse is going to go skitter-scatter everywhere, you know? And the husband is the guy who's in charge and should be all of the time. Well, by the 1960s, women's position was changing. There was a big change going on in the country. People were talking about this book called The Feminine Mystique. A woman today uh, has been made to feel freakish and alone and guilty if simply she wants to be more than her, uh, her husband's wife. Betty Friedan wrote very much out of her own personal experience. The Feminine Mystique said that women were suffering from the problem that has no name a vague sense of dissatisfaction with the lack of meaning, the lack of opportunity in their lives. So many women read The Feminine Mystique and said, that's it. That's why I'm so angry. It was a huge, huge deal at the time. The middle-class woman up and down America is just so wretchedly unhappy that she's sick. You could call it by anything you like, but it is wretchedly boring to be with little tiny children one end of the day, the other, especially if you think that you should love it all the time. Women were being educated for one way of life, which was one in which they had brains. And then 
they were supposed to have wombs and arms to run vacuum cleaners, and that, that was a mismatch. Betty Friedan called for blowing up the rules. You cannot be given equality. You have to assume it. And it had a, a hugely profound impact. Young women started to see other women saying that women had not gotten enough out of life. And the point was, you don't have to be this. Choose what you want, but you don't have to be this one thing. Here she is, Mrs. Helen Gurley Brown. Helen Gurley Brown had lived without being married very happily, you know, dating men, having sex, supporting herself. And she wrote a book, Sex and the Single Girl, which was about her life. And it became a huge hit. Isn't this whole subject of uh, sex being uh, discussed and written and talked about too much? I could expect a, a reactionary opinion like that from you. I don't think so at all. She openly talked about sex and said, you won't get struck by a lightning bolt, you know, if you have sex before you're married. For average run-of-the-mill women, it was a bigger deal than the feminine mystique. Now that it's all right to discuss sex, people are now talking about it a great deal, and I don't think that's uh, so bad. Yes, Arthur. I think that talking about sex wastes such a lot of time. <laughs> Ellen Gurley Brown pointed out that the guys had one standard, the women had another. And that was a revelation. Rules that had existed for a thousand years, just overnight they were gone. In a recent survey, 44% of the high school and college girls questioned said they approve of sexual intercourse before marriage if they're serious about the young man. Do either of you approve for yourselves of intercourse before marriage? Yes, I do. Yes, I would say. Sexual revolution or sexual renaissance? The experts are still trying to define it. CBS reports, birth control and the law. This is a very personal program. Sometimes the most private matters are also public matters. It is about babies that bless a home and babies that can haunt a home. Reproductive freedom means that it's a basic human right to decide whether and when to have children. But reproductive freedom had not been enunciated in that way. The basic disagreement stems from the differences in the moral attitudes towards birth control. In 1957, the pill was approved by the FDA for severe menstrual distress. What became funny is then everyone seemed to be suffering from severe menstrual distress. It wasn't until 1960 the pill was actually approved by the FDA for birth control. The pill was originally very hard to get. It wasn't like you just went down to the pharmacy and picked it up. That took quite a while. This woman asked the doctor for birth control information. He said, best thing to, for me to do would not be close to my husband. And if I didn't want to get that way, it was up to me. Well, I'm 100% against birth control because it's immoral. It's the same as prostitution or abortion. There's always been pushback against birth control. Even when the FDA approved the pill, it was still illegal for many women across the country. So Estelle Griswold, who was a president of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut, uh, decided that she was going to challenge this. And she began handing out birth control, knowing full well that she would probably be arrested, which she was. On the uh, 24th of November, we issued two warrants one against Estelle Griswold and the other against Dr. C. Lee Buxton in violation of the contraceptive statute. The Griswold versus Connecticut case changed everything. Well, I think it's very evident that the law is unenforceable. I think if you had a policeman under every bed in the state of Connecticut, they still could not prove anything. We are continuing, maybe illegally, but we are continuing our program. The case went to the Supreme Court and made birth control legal finally for married couples only. And it was several years later that in fact birth control became legal for all women. It was very, very important because it both decriminalized contraception and established the right to privacy. 
how many states repealed their law against birth control just in this past year? Ten states changed or repealed their laws against birth control, but if I can add the end of 1964 to that, it makes it 13. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a national movement. Nearly 7 million American women are now taking oral contraceptives, and they are said to be almost 100% effective. The birth control pill meant suddenly women could finish their education. They could go in the workforce. And that is what radically changed, I think, life for women in America, was that ability to, to not only plan their families, but to plan their lives. What happened when you went inside? Well, when I went inside, I said no women's. Well, what do you feel about this part think, of this idea that they won't hire women? We feel that it's unfair because we feel that women will work just as good as men and better. And we're not hiring women at this particular time for the very simple reason the jobs we have available are jobs that only men are able to do. When the 1964 Civil Rights Act was going through Congress, an amendment was inserted to make it illegal to discriminate on the basis of gender as well as race. No one took it seriously. The National Organization of Women is founded to press forward on that one issue. What's the objective of the new organization now? Full equality for women in truly equal partnership with men. One of NOW's campaign is to make the Civil Rights Act of 1964 really be enforced. Suddenly, the Ivy League colleges began to open their doors to women for the first time. The quotas against women in the accounting field, in the legal field, and the medical field began to drop away. Betty Friedan wanted results. She wanted something to happen, and it started happening. Basic training for stewardesses is meant to turn a girl into a woman. The airline gives her beauty tips, a sense of responsibility. Stewardesses must be slinky sex symbols. Pilots can be homely and bald. They hit hearings on the airline industry and the stewardess situation because, of course, stewardesses were fired if they got married and they had to have a certain weight and height and their hands had to be soft and all this other stuff. We have an issue here, the 32-year age retirement, because behind that age retirement lies the future of the whole profession. The airline executives are saying that their clients are not going to get on board the plane unless there is a beautiful young unmarried woman greeting them at the stairs. Ms. Boland, what are you girls asking the Congress to do for you? We're asking them to give us an equal chance to continue in the job that we have chosen as a profession. There is no bona fide reason for terminating girls because they reach 32 or 35 years of age. Don't you girls know that that's going to happen when you take the job? We know that the companies have applied this policy. We're hoping and are asking to find a way to change this policy. Congress began enforcing the Title VII job discrimination laws. Things did begin to happen. The barriers start coming down. And it was, it was real results. <laughs> My name is Hugh Hefner, and I'm editor publisher of Playboy magazine. In eight years, I've built an empire worth 20 million. Gloria Steinem was a reporter, and a very pretty one. So she went undercover as a bunny at the Playboy Club. I remember the young woman who took my false bio. I had said that I was a secretary and thought being a bunny would be more exciting. And she leaned forward and whispered to me. She said, honey, if you can type, you don't want to work here. <laughs> Bunnies are forbidden to wear jewelry, pale lipstick, or gold or green nail varnish. Provocative cotton tail must be clean and sprightly. Gloria exposed how the Playboy bunnies were treated, what they were paid, and how they were running around in a club with their breasts exposed and a, a tail on their butt, and with men sort of snapping the napkin at them as they walked by. And so through her reporting, she was showing sexism in all its different flavors. The assignment, it was not a great experience, but in retrospect, I'm glad I did it because I got a notice from Hugh Hefner, and they did change the working conditions of those women for the better. 
Gloria Steinem challenged every stereotype of a feminist. She was this fabulous looking, incredibly smart, direct speaking woman. Forgive me, but I always thought that you had to be stacked, absolutely stacked to be a bunny girl. How did you get the job? Well, you don't have to be stacked to be a bunny. In fact, uh, all of that is usually stuffed with gym socks or something. It's where the girls keep their tips. It's where it's just a uh, sort of traveling cash depository. That's all. Gloria Steinem, good disarm. Even her harshest critics with humor and humility, but she was willing to challenge patriarchy at every step of the way. Gloria Steinem became a brilliant spokesperson for the women's liberation movement. We've been much too law-abiding and too docile for too long, but I think that period is about over. The latest threat to the status quo in America is the women's revolt. This is the symbol for the female. The women's liberation movement has added the equal signs. As a lot of women know, including this one, equality is often missing. You have this sort of bubbling up of a desire for real equality. And then you get women beginning to gel from community-based activism to real solid organizing. The women's liberation movement was a parallel movement to Betty Friedan's, the National Organization for Women. So almost as soon as now has formed in 1966, women's liberation groups are emerging around the country. This younger generation moves in and very much broadens the perspective of the women's movement. All of these things build on one another, and this younger group not only believed that you needed economic power, but that you needed a revolution in the relationship between the sexes. There was a revolution going on outside, but on television, there wasn't a real live girl. And that's what I wanted to do. Girl. Now, that is an incredibly subversive television show. Absolutely amazing. Daddy was just giving me a lecture on sex education. Why would you need a lecture on sex? <laughs> uh, uh, what, I, what I meant was, um, uh, Anne certainly knows all there is to know about sex. <laughs> I wasn't married to Donald, my boyfriend. I was doing a television series about a single girl who didn't want to get married and wanted to live on her own. I mean, this was like, you know, completely unheard of. The character that Marlo Thomas played was a fantastic alternative model of womanhood itself. That girl was the first time ever on television that a woman was allowed to have an independent, autonomous life and adventures of her own. It's amazing we waited till the 60s to break the walls down, but it was time. Everything to do in any movement is how do you get the spotlight and focus it on the issue? We've decided for at least one week, starting yesterday, to do everything we can to fight pollution. And Donald, that means all kinds of pollution. There's, there's air pollution, food pollution, there's waste. I felt strongly about the fact that we could not ignore what the issues of the day were for everything. There appears to be growing concern among scientists as to the possibility of dangerous long-range side effects from the widespread use of DDT and other pesticides. Have you considered asking the Public Health Service to take a closer look at this? Yes, I, 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 and I know that they uh, already are. I think particularly, of course, uh, since Ms. Carson's book, but uh, they are examining the matter. Rachel Carson wrote this book about pesticide called Silent Spring in 1962 and you talked about the long-term impacts, the concept of latency and bioaccumulation, which were all new terms. Farm animals were dying with monotonous regularity because of pesticides. People didn't have any awareness that if a fish ate the bug that was poisoned by pesticides, that that was gonna end up in our bodies. It touched a raw nerve upon the American public. The public was being asked to accept these chemicals and did not have the whole picture. So I set about to remedy the, the balance there. The major claims in Miss Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, are gross distortions of the actual facts. 
I mean, we talk about big oil. Well, there was big chemical. And Rachel Carson got under their skin because she was going to cut into their profits terribly. She was attacked uh, really viciously by Monsanto, and she was condemned pretty regularly as a spinster and a communist. She got called off into this battle at a time when she was already in a fairly advanced stage of cancer. The U.S. government went into a review of all of her data and months later came out with a report basically backing Rachel Carson. She dies in 1964, just shortly after with cancer. But if you have to make a hall of fame of, of people in the environmental movement, Rachel Carson is the game changer. She's number one. By closing loopholes which permitted pesticides to be sold before they were fully tested, this bill safeguards the health of all Americans. I'm sorry the voice of Rachel Carson is still today. She would have been proud of this bill in this moment. There were all of these things that were beginning to affect human health. We had cities in America increasingly having to call smog alerts. We had rivers catching on fire. In the Santa Barbara oil spill, it became clear that even the very richest cities were going to be exposed to massive environmental threats. The drilling continues, and so do the leaks. And the question here is not whether it will happen again, but when and how bad will it be? Issue after issue kept piling up. There's a building sense that we are stakeholders in the environment, that it is something that we humans can ruin. This is a, a real shift in our thinking. People were really worried, and the political establishments started to respond. Without the environmental movement coming out of the 60s, we would not have a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act. I mean, there was a wave of legislation that emerged in the immediate aftermath. We have not been inactive these last four years. We have saved more, we have preserved more than ever before in our history. I'm convinced that beauty and order in our environment are not frills. I am convinced that they are urgent necessities. I think that all of us are looking for a place under the sun. By that I mean for a union that we can belong as farm workers. We think of the civil rights movement as generally being about blacks in the South, but there was a Latino civil rights movement as well. How much have you been getting for a day's work? Only two dollars. Two dollars a day? Yes. Migrant farm workers who were getting paid pennies to feed America and were being sent from farm to farm with barely livable housing conditions. There are no bathrooms in the fields, often no clean drinking water. Workers would be forced to use the short-handled hoe that is back-breaking 18 inches from the ground. But it also is an instrument of psychological oppression because the supervisors could look down the row and if someone stood up to stretch, they could order them back to work. Essentially, there were no labor laws, no health and safety laws that applied to farm workers. What do you think of the idea of a union for farm workers? Well, I think it's ridiculous. Would you want to live in this country? I wouldn't live here. Somewhere you know, you're being very impudent. What if I want to live here? We have a real tough combination pitted against us. In 1966, it has occurred to a few of them that they ought to have a union. This is the union they formed, the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee. Their leader, Cesar Chavez, started out as a migrant field worker with a seventh grade education. Cesar Chavez was largely self-taught and becomes this great student of history. And he studies Gandhi and Martin Luther King. You've got to get out there with a picket sign and, and get some action going. And when you put all of those things together, then nonviolence works. The United Farm Workers realized very early on, you have to move people. You have to inspire them. So they set upon a march from Delano to Sacramento. It's a march to get the strike and the farm workers' story outside of California. Not just Delano. We're fighting for everybody. 
you get scenes that resemble some of the things that happened in the South. Workers just being nonviolent in the face of provocation from the police. It is a pleading for social change, for social justice to the farm worker and his cause. Saturday afternoon, a light rain was falling as the marchers arrived outside Sacramento. So when they start in Delano, there are about 75 marchers. By the time they get to Sacramento, there are 10,000 people rallied on the steps of the state capitol. The workers are on the rise. Delano has shown what can be done, and the workers know that they are no longer alone. One of the things that Chavez does that really catapults the movement into the national consciousness is to ask Americans to stop buying grapes. At its height, 15 to 20 million Americans were participating in the grape boycott. That is almost one out of every 10 Americans. We have, I think, a similar problem that the people in the civil rights movement had. It wasn't until they really went out and started organizing if the government came across with meaningful legislation. The boycott ultimately forces California's most powerful industry to sign contracts with its poorest workers. The revolution in California agriculture has moved far more rapidly than anyone expected. This much now is clear. California agriculture has been changed. Will you join in the battle? to build the great society, to give every citizen the full equality which God enjoins and the law requires. When Lyndon Johnson is pushing through the great society, he's riding the wave of the civil rights movement and the reform movement. But there are a lot of Americans who are not at all happy about this. Johnson is a man whom I've known for a long time, and I like him personally, but I've watched him change from a conservative Democrat to a, an, an extreme liberal Democrat. Too often the 60s is simply seen from a liberal perspective, but the conservative movement had its fans. Well, I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, what do you think about my running for the presidency? I would not say he was politically ambitious. What made my father run started several years before that. It really started with my father's book, The Conscience of a Conservative, in 1960, which became kind of the Bible of the conservative movement. Goldwater brought together a kind of muscular Americanism, anti-communism, and this growing political opposition to the expansion of the federal government. At the time, the Republican Party was dominated by the Eastern liberal establishment. Conservatives saw the more moderate liberal part of the Republican Party as not being real Republican because they're not getting rid of the problem with government, which was that it had gotten too big. At the time, nobody thought of it as a movement, but it was a nascent thing, but it turned out to be a very powerful thing. And that was the beginning of what we now think of as the conservative movement. What conservatives lacked up until the 1960s was any substantial media outlet to spread their message. But during the 1960s, you began to get the foundation for this. Barry Goldwater, jet-propelled philosopher of conservatism, he is the hottest thing on the lecture circuit. He pours out, with considerable help, books, articles, and columns. Suddenly, Barry Goldwater is being talked about as the Republican John F. Kennedy. We have lost election after election the last several years because conservative Republicans get mad and stay home. Let's grow up, conservatives. Let's, if we want to take this party back, and I think we can someday, let's get to work. And for the next four years, the conservatives went to work. Little dust devils of non-Goldwaterism are swirling about this convention, but that's about all. The cyclone is definitely coming in from Arizona. In 1964, the liberals, moderates, who were running the Republican Party, realized that their party had been seized from underneath them. During this year, I have crisscrossed this nation, warning of the extremist threat, its danger to the party. The governor is entitled to be heard for five minutes. 
all of these liberal Republicans who were considered the leading figures of the Republican Party, like George Romney and Nelson Rockefeller, suddenly didn't have a role in the 64 election that, that nominated Goldwater. He is the man who earned and proudly carries the title of Mr. Conservative and is now Mr. Republican, Barry Goldwater. Rockefeller, in his campaign, was painting the conservatives as extremists. And then my father followed up with his famous words about it. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Goldwater did not recognize that he was opening up a Pandora's box by saying that extremism could be a good thing. He was basically opening the door to the Birchers and the leftover Ku Klux Klan and all these other groups that were beyond the pale. The head of the Georgia Klan came out for your ticket. Do you accept their support? Uh, we don't want the backing of uh, the Ku Klux Klan. That's a different kind of extremist. And my father would have none of it. A thoughtful address by Ronald Reagan. Thank you. I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. Ronald Reagan was an actor. But it was in 1964 that suddenly he explodes onto the national scene as a political figure because he gives the speech. In this vote harvesting time, they use terms like the great society. Or, as we were told a few days ago by the president, we must accept a greater government activity in the affairs of the people. Barry Goldwater has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions. The campaign was always run optimistically, and when Ronald Reagan hit it out of the ballpark with his speech, we just knew we were going to win. According to a CBS a vote profile analysis, Lyndon Baines Johnson has been elected president of the United States, and the landslide has carried him in. We're going to devote our days and the years ahead to uh, uh, strengthening the Republican Party. After Goldwater loses, all it did was to make the conservatives more determined than ever. In addition, they found another star. The first question is for you, Senator Goldwater. It's been said that Ronald Reagan has assumed the mantle of leadership of the conservative movement. Would you comment, please? I would say that if he continues uh, in his successful political career, that I don't think you could deny that he would be the uh, leader. If Reagan is elected governor of California, this gets to be a new ball game. There is this growing social uneasiness about the kinds of changes that are taking place in America. Conservative leaders were able to capitalize on those resentments towards government and toward this new America. As you move through the 60s, and even as Reagan wins election in 66 to become governor of California, the response on the part of conservatives is that what's more important is less anti-communism and more the social elements. Challenge ourselves into responsibility to offer something that the people of this country are crying out for. They are crying out for leadership. I saw him make a speech in 1964 for Goldwater. I said, There's the man that should be running for president. He has the same type of feeling with the people that John Kennedy had, I think. Reagan did a very brief run for president in 1968, but it was too little too late. Richard Nixon goes over the top with 287 electoral votes, and that seems to be the 1968 election. Conservatives won control of the Republican Party in 1964, but they didn't figure out what to do with it for 15 years.
CBS reports, the homosexuals... Lars Larson is a member of the most despised minority group in the United States, but few homosexuals are willing to admit it publicly. The fear of being ostracized, of losing a job. Even the fear of imprisonment forces most homosexuals to camouflage their identities. Do you remember how you felt when you first realized that you were a homosexual? Frightened. Terribly frightened. Look, I was so scared that anybody would ever figure out I was gay. I was a deeply closeted and very repressed gay man. The Tallahassee Police Department is using Florida State University students as informers against homosexuals. The students get $10 a head every time one is approached by a suspected sex offender. In the 1960s, there are a number of these kinds of committees that investigate gays. And even though it's still submerged, you begin to see the first issues about gay rights. There were multiple organizations to try to counteract that repressive regime that gay men and lesbians were suffering under. They have the Medicine Society and the Daughters of Bolitis, which were part of the homophile movement. The laws which forbid certain types of, of private consenting sexual behavior among adults need to be changed. In the Madison Society, this was the dilemma. How do you combine activism with anonymity? You can't run a social movement from behind the closet door. Gays are limited in their ability to show affection, can't party the way the straights can. Their whole entire existence is stigmatized. One of the Mattachine Society's founders, a man named Frank Kameny, he was a worker in the U.S. MAP service, and he's fired because he's gay. So he pickets the White House. Well, I understand that we're being picketed by a group uh, of homosexuals. The policy of the department is that we do not employ homosexuals knowingly, and that if we discover homosexuals in our department, we discharge them. Every American citizen has the right to be considered by his government on the basis of his own personal merits as an individual. Frank Kameny is a pioneer. He's standing there, he doesn't care what people think. He's saying, I am just as normal as you are. It's a polite reform movement. Homosexuality is in fact a mental illness which has reached epidemiological proportions. The American Psychiatric Association deems homosexuality to be a mental disorder. This involves showing the gay man pictures of nude males and shocking him with a, a strong electric current over a short period of time. Hopefully, he will be unable to get sexually aroused. It's very hard to achieve civil rights for a group where the medical world is describing this group as, as mentally ill. So one of the goals of the gay rights movement was to eliminate that kind of thinking. It represents prejudice, it doesn't represent science. The dilemma of the homosexual, told by the medical profession he is sick, by the law that he is a criminal, shunned by employers, rejected by heterosexual society. At the center of his life, he remains an outsider. I think gay men got uh sort of sick and tired of seeing the quote-unquote revolution going on all around them while they were being vilified and kept completely to the margins. Something is always going to light the spark, and it was about to happen somewhere. In June of 1969, the police staged a raid, just a routine raid, on a gay bar, the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village uh, in New York. And unlike a routine raid, in this case, men fought back. Stonewall was a watershed moment in really the development of civil rights for the LGBT community. Within four years of Stonewall, the American Psychiatric Association removes homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. In four years, this was a movement that could not be denied. With each decade, the glass ceiling gets chipped away at and ultimately, one would hope, broken. So much of the 60s is now draped in nostalgia, but the things that were important and that were so controversial then 
whether it was the movement for civil rights, the environmental movement, or the women's movement. Much of that work became cornerstones from the world we currently live in. I no longer accept society's judgment that my group is second class. Women begin running for office, being able to open up their own businesses. You now have women doctors and scientists and astronauts, things that were unheard of. After the 60s, people began to take a more holistic view of the environment. Everybody now fundamentally believes that they've got a right to a healthy, safe environment. We explored so many blind alleys in the 1960s that perhaps we've put ourselves on a platform from which we can more constructively attack the problems which we've now begun to identify. Now, if that happens in the decades to come, I should not be surprised if historians didn't date its beginning in this troubled 10 years we've just gone through. Uh, these are the cutaways for Esther Peterson, Assistant Secretary of Labor. Highest ranking woman in the federal government. Do you think that the American public is ready to accept a woman in the White House? I think... I think that when the right woman comes along, that the, that the society will recognize. And I think it's completely possible that someday there can be a woman in the White House. psychedelics and the war, the protesting. I'm planning on having a good time as long as I can. Smoke pot with your kids and then you'll understand why the kids are happy. It's a giant love in. People should be uninhibited in their sexual expression. You cannot ignore a change in morality. They're fascists. They don't like hippies and they don't like things we do. We do have to maintain law, order and decency on the streets. What we're thinking about is a peaceful planet. We're not thinking about anything else. They are trying to do what no one else has ever done before, find a new way for humanity. sixties it was a real good time of prosperity but it was also kind of a stagnant time in terms of spiritual growth things were kind of at a standstill the baseline culture was materialism and also the feeling that the culture itself didn't honor the human spirit and didn't honor creativity in the early 1950s the nation recognized in its midst a social movement called uh, Degeneration. A novel titled On the Road became a bestseller. When Kerouac's book comes out, it became a revolution, defined a new generation of what being beat means, and it defined it as a spiritual revolution. But if we're living in an age of conformity, if everybody's trying to work for the, the corporation, that you're losing a sense of self. I was traveling west one time at the junction of the state line of Colorado. I saw in the clouds huge and massed above the fiery golden desert of even fall, a great image of God with forefinger pointed straight at me. Come on, boy, go thou across the ground. Go moan for man. Go moan. Go groan. Go groan alone. Go roll your bones alone. 
Jack Kerouac became like a godfather for the counterculture. The village has a life and language all its own. If you dig it, you're hip. If you don't, man, you're square. Coffee houses, the neighborhood bars of Bohemia, where the strongest potion is coffee, and the coffee house poet is the specialty of the house. To find a place where the eyes can rest. Beatniks. They had these coffee houses. They would go in and, and play chess and read poetry. And those same coffee houses became a kind of a proving ground for folk singers. And all young kids were running out to buy guitars and banjos. Folk music, it gives me a lot more than the popular music of our own time does. My outlook is that topical songs should be sung because we don't do anything about say the bomb, you know, the whole situation comes to an end. There's got to be an alternative to whatever ways of life are offered to them. You know, I mean, Democrat, Republican. And I would like to offer some kind of alternative somehow, you know? Folk revival scene had a big part of politics. You can't get left politics out of Woody Guthrie or Pete Seeger. And so the Greenwich Village movement was there to celebrate people's culture. If you liked the music, you really were signing on for their ways of looking at the world, too. And then eventually, one guy emerges as being special. A bullet from the back of a bush took Medgar Evers' blood. During that, that time in the 60s, Behind as that cultural right. revolution was slowly bubbling Kenny, Kenny, and kids Kenny. were starting to question authority, question what was happening in their country, they're looking for answers. Bob Dylan thought that folk music was poetry. He took beat energy and mixed it with folk culture, and it's more a lyrical intensity than anybody's put to song before. And the Negro's name is used, it is plain, for the politician's gain as he rises to fame. And Up until the time of Bob Dylan, there were the songwriters and there were the singers. Dylan started writing his own music. He says, I am going to comment on the world. I'm going to comment on the nature of this human experience. Bob Dylan was in this sort of white hot moment of saying more in the popular song than anyone ever had before. Only a pawn in that game. After the revolution of Bob Dylan, the music world moves west. Laurel Canyon becomes the epicenter of the rock revolution. The music scene was not happening in New York anymore. It was now L.A. Everybody moved to Laurel Canyon. Actors, musicians, artists. And so it was a kind of a whole community, very open. If you were driving over Laurel Canyon and you saw somebody hitchhiking, you'd just automatically pull over. Hey, brother, get in. You know, where are you going? Laurel Canyon was an incredibly interesting place to live in those days. I lived on Lookout Mountain with Joni Mitchell. Crosby was close, Stephen was close. Now it was all these artists who were singing the truth. And their truth was this idyllic sort of sense of freedom. There was a, a thriving community of kids that were discovering their new life and couldn't wait to play you the new song that they'd written. It was a lot of freedom, there was a lot of drugs, there was a lot of beautiful women, there was a lot of good rock and roll being made. It was a fabulous time. at a suburban high school in Los Angeles. They reflect the sun, sensuality, and affluence which dominate life in Southern California. The latest fad is the Sunset Strip. During the past year, it has become a playground for Southern California's mobile, restless teenagers. It is the place to go. People would meet down at clubs on the Sunset Strip, and they would go to the trip, or they would go to the, uh, the Whiskey A Go-Go. 
it was a real happening. <laughs> We've changed from a culture of grown-ups that sort of look down on kids to kids leading. It is the creation of the teenager, and the revolution begins. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office has begun foot patrol on the Sunset Strip to cope with the growing influx of youngsters. The notion of teenagers who had a culture of their own, that weren't listening to their parents' music, kind of opens up this giant space for rebellions, large and small. I believe 10% of the students have used and are using uh, marijuana. Also, a very, probably a very significant thing is that acceptance is gaining steadily and the usage is really uh, increasing very, very rapidly. In L.A., we were all kind of, you know, smoking God's herb, whereas up in San Francisco, it seemed like they were, they were experimenting more with mind expansion, you know. Kesey took classes of writing at Stanford University, and he writes the great novel, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, and this makes Kesey a celebrity. While at Stanford, I was uh, given the opportunity to go to the Stanford Hospital and uh, take part in the LSD experiments. Kesey had volunteered to do tests for LSD, a government-sponsored test. LSD was isolated by Stuhl and Hoffman in a Sandoz pharmaceutical company of Basel, Switzerland. Do you feel happy? Yes. Well, you must be, because you have tears in your eyes. Oh. Is that a beautiful experience, would you say? I would say yes. Some people think it's when Kesey discovers LSD that the counterculture in California is born because more and more people then want to try to experience what Kesey experienced, and he becomes a promoter of it. Kesey created a drug commune at La Honda, which is an hour from San Francisco. Great artists love smashing traditions, and it is best Kesey was doing that everybody would have this communal LSD trip together. Tom Wolfe would write the electric Kool-Aid acid test about it. People were constantly slipping drugs into my food. The number of times that I would get up, I don't know what the hell had happened to me. They thought they'd do me a favor. They were having the World's Fair in New York, so a bunch of us were gonna go. But the bunch of us were too big to fit in his station wagon, so he bought this converted school bus. He was going to put the bus in day glow bright colors and then go what he called unsettling America, blowing people's minds. The whole idea of blowing people's minds was that you have to present something to them that is so different. There's a crack comes open where something new can come in. And the reaction to all these people was wonderful because what it was in 1964, there was no other thing like this happening. It's part of a kind of cultural revolution going on, making the squares pay notice to this underground of America. When we got to New York City, which is the home of the Beats, where Kerouac lived and picked him up, because we were in his presence, we were just acting as goofy as we could, playing music, putting on costumes, doing all kinds of acts and stuff like that. And, and Kerouac sat on the couch drinking a big, tall Budweiser. Uh, he was obviously not an enthusiastic guy. Those beats, they had done their thing, you know. I really felt like the torch had been passed from those guys to the psychedelic generation. Kesey, in many ways, was very messianic, and he started feeling that acid would allow you to see a larger truth. And they started saying, let's get as many people to try LSD as you can. And so we started running halls. We called the thing the acid test. And the band, of course, was known as the Warlocks. As time went on, they changed their name to the Grateful Dead. Saint Stephen with a rose in and out of the garden he goes. Country garden in the wind and the rain wherever he goes. 
loves the people all complain. LSD was not an illegal drug. When Kesey held these acid tests, as they were known, they'd have two vats. One was punch, and one was punch with LSD. The acid tests were like a party. The scene is a lot of light shows and music and people dancing. And when the dead were playing, it was a way to feel that acid in waves. And I looked down and I saw kids in front of me moving to the music. They looked up at me and I said, yeah. The drug culture really took hold. And that's where artists, whether it was a Grateful Dead or a Jefferson Airplane, were able to embrace it and put it in their music. The counterculture in California is born because more and more people then want to try to experience what Kesey experienced. And he became the kind of brand poobah of the carnival of San Francisco in the 60s. There's nothing uh, grown up or sophisticated in taking an LSD trip at all. They're just being complete fools. CBS News, without any flowers in its hair, is in San Francisco because this city has gained the reputation of being the hippie capital of the world. I got accepted in San Francisco State, and I found an apartment at Haight and Clayton Street, right in the center of what would become the Haight-Ashbury. The psychedelic shop on Haight Street started just over a year ago. It spreads the gospel of a dreamy new utopia based on brotherhood and love and LSD. So all the people out there that are, that are confused and hungry for some kind of spiritual meaning life, that's why all these people are down here. That's why there's so much interest in the hate Ashbury because it offers some kind of hope. We moved up and lived right down the street from the psychedelic shop. And people were growing their hair long, they were wearing beads, they were playing music on the street. It was just an incredible environment at that point at the beginning. That's when it was just like one big giant family. Before you knew it, it was a congregating place for artists, and the dividing line seemed to be the psychedelic experience. You couldn't understand the posters, you couldn't understand the fashions, you couldn't understand anything if you hadn't gotten high. The diggers group scrounges food and money to feed free those who arrive in Panhandle Park with a bowl and an appetite. Diggers are people who share, says their manifesto. And their aim is a society where everything is shared, everything free. The diggers were one of the first groups that were into social consciousness about what was needed to take care of this huge group of people that were coming into the Haight-Ashbury. Their free shop looks more like a playground at first sight. Here they make sheets and clothes for other hippies who can come and take what they want without paying anything for it. Everything in the store was free. Tools, clothing, televisions. And so we were inviting people to imagine a way of life that would please them and then to make it real by doing it. What we're thinking about is a peaceful planet. We're not thinking about anything else. We're not thinking about any kind of power. We're not thinking about any of those kind of struggles. We're not thinking about revolution or war or any of that. That's not what we want. Nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. We would all like to be able to live an uncluttered life, a simple life, a good life, you know, and, like, think about moving the whole human race ahead a step or a few steps. We wanted to learn more about the real meaning of life. Why are we here? Certainly not to kill each other, but here to celebrate life, to make music and do art and love each other. These people are hippies. They represent a new form of social rebellion. It is hard to figure out what positive things they are in favor of. The reason we can no longer identify with the kinds of activities that, that the older generation uh, are engaged in is because those activities uh, are, are, for us, meaningless. Uh, they have led to a, uh, uh, a war. monstrous war in Vietnam, for example. We did want change from war, from rigid ideas of what the sexes ought to be doing a change from black people ought to be here and white people ought to be here. 
no. Why can't we try and make that work? The Haight-Ashbury community has created the Council for a Summer of Love in San Francisco. The Council is calling for creative love happenings for every weekend throughout the summer. We ask all who come here to come here in love, and we ask all who live here to greet all men with love. They, at their best, are trying for a kind of group sainthood, and saints running in groups are likely to be ludicrous. They depend on hallucination for their philosophy. This is not a new idea, and it has never worked. It was sort of a divide of generations, a lot of mistrust. Young people didn't uh, trust old people. Old people didn't understand young people. What's so offensive about long hair? It looks sloppy. Just. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't differentiate the boys from the girls enough. We didn't call ourselves hippies. The hippies are a fabrication. They were an attempt to diminish young adults and infantilize us. And it certainly serves to exclude the people that were deeply thoughtful about the world, that were ready to dedicate their lives to making change, and that questioned the paradigm of materialism. Look around you, nothing works. The only thing we're the kid is presented with is when you grow up, look, you know, uh, you can join the army, you can go to war, you can get a gig uh, working as an engineer and become a vegetable and dr drive to work in your own car, in your own big metal box. And, uh, you know, it just it looks absurd. You know, people in their metal boxes like this going all over from job to job, frustrated, uptight. Uh, what joy is there in life? Life should be, life is, should, is and should be ecstasy. The counterculture had the arrogance to tell everybody else what they were doing is wrong, and nobody likes that. It's estimated that anywhere from 10 to 200,000 youngsters may pour in to hate Ashbury this summer. Many people are apprehensive. They fear that black power or other political activist groups may use Hate Street as a stage setting for riots. Hate Ashbury cannot handle 100,000 because there isn't room. The tension between the government and the people began to be evident. Nobody should let their young children come into San Francisco unsupervised to become a part of a group such as that. They're fascists as far as I'm concerned and they, they don't they don't like hippies and they don't like the things we do and they try to harass us and bother us. In some way their revolutions are war between generations. The hippies rallying cry is never trust anyone over 30. The war of youth culture against the establishment is in full swing on every front. About four policemen and a plainclothesman came in and said everybody get out, everybody get out, the store is closed. They wouldn't give a reason, they wouldn't identify you know, under what uh, premise they were doing this. When we asked them, they started pushing people around, they pushed people physically out of the store. The mayor is, this is really very insidious what he's up to. He wants to stop human growth. The hippie leaders say all will be well. Flower power will prevail. They say it will be a summer of love, a great pilgrimage. Hopefully, they'll be right. If it's necessary to bring in National Guard, I'll bring in National Guard. I'll use whatever force is necessary. We now seem to be witnessing in this country and elsewhere an intense preoccupation with the pursuit of pleasure. Call it hedonism, call it self-gratification, call it what you will. You cannot avoid noticing it. You may not like it, you may not accept it, but you cannot ignore it. A change in morality. Turn on, tune in, drop out. I spent some time in New York, and I spent some time in London, and I'm here to tell you it's happening all over. In any large city, there were other hate ashbrays which people could point to. See, we're on the map. We're big, and we're far more interesting than what you all have to offer.
answer the questions of parents who are concerned about the use of LSD and marijuana for their children. These are young people who are hungering for older people, for their parents to listen to them. These, these youngsters want to share with their parents the uh, grandeur and the glory that they are encountering. And uh, perhaps uh, eventually, when you're spiritually ready, you'll turn on with your children if you think that's the right thing to do. Monterey Pop. It was the absolute ultimate love-in. Just looking out at the rain. The best festival that I've played pretty much ever is uh, Monterey Pop Festival. Monterey hit like lightning. Popular music was changing and had become something different. And there was a whole new generation of people that wanted to march with it. It said, get on board. We're leaving town. Realize this is Janis Joplin before she was known, before she'd ever done her first album, before she'd ever done her first single. It's just music at its freshest. It's music that is just being born. And the audience is like, Everything was love and peace and music and the policeman who was in charge brought flowers out to his men and he said, don't bust anybody. Monterey was that hippie dream come true. Culture was changing. The hippie movement, it was swaying the mainstream. This is where the youngsters come to buy their clothes. And not just the youngsters, it's the young adults and the men who are 40, 50, and even 60 years old. In the States, pot is going middle class and spreading like prohibition liquor. As more and more citizens get zonked out of their minds, the drug cult enters the bloodstream of American life. Like it or not, we're living in the stone age. At its best, the counterculture came in with hard punches to the mainstream culture. People have already changed their minds about contraception, abortion, premarital sex. The 1960s were absolutely a sexual revolution. Because of the pill, women could take charge of their own bodies, that they could be sexual, that they didn't have to get pregnant. Everything sort of coalesces, sort of the perfect storm of societal forces come together. Here, if you love somebody, and people here love everybody, if you want to make love to somebody, then you should. There's no reason why you shouldn't. Free love was all well and good, and there was a lot of accidental sex. <laughs> but we didn't look at it as hedonism. People were just so open to each other, and, and life was beautiful, you know, and people weren't judgmental. The mainstream young people were telling their parents, you've been prohibiting my sexual freedom, and the Puritan work ethic is bunk. It was clear the rules were changing, and the rules were really that there were no rules.
This CNN original series, The Sixties, is brought to you by GoLong.com. Uh, the topic tonight is the hippies we have with us. Uh, Mr. J Jack uh, Kerouac over here, who is said to have started the whole beat generation business. Jack Kerouac never wanted to be a prophet. He wanted to be a great American writer. But fame destroys people in America. To what extent do you believe that the beat generation is related to the to the hippies, oh, what, just, what do they have in common? Was this an evolution from the one to the other? It's just the older ones. Yeah. I'm 46 years old, these kids are 18. The B generation was a, a generation of beatitude and pleasure in life and tenderness. I believe in order and piety. Here's the progenitor, really, of the counterculture kind of disowning his own babies and try to make sense of a decade, the 60s, that he didn't feel um, parried to. Apparently, some kind of Dionysian movement in which I, uh, I did not intend. This was pure in my heart. So. All sorts of people have been writing various articles about the hippies, usually about the hippies as if they were animals, something to look at. Thus, we've gotten hundreds and literally thousands of people coming up to Haight-Ashbury to watch people. It makes Haight-Ashbury uh, a terribly unpleasant place to be in. The news got out about the Haight-Ashbury. It became overrun. We're now entering what is known as the largest hippie colony in the world, the fountainhead of the hippie subculture. The nickname is Hashberries. And marijuana, of course, with LSD, is being used. Literally, people made the trip to San Francisco to be a part of something. But by the time they got there, that trip was over. This is the latest stage in the evolution of the hippie movement. The hippies are trying to get away. So they go out to a cabin in the countryside and start a commune. Here, they can get away from the tourists and the reporters who badger them in San Francisco. Communes have started, and this is really what the hippie movement was all about. An idea of sharing everything, clothes and food and everything. People could just help themselves, you know. We lived communally because it was the cheapest way to live. A lot of people began to clarify and simplify their lives. What will follow this dispersal of the hippie movement to the countryside is hard to predict. They may be, as they say, coming here to build the foundations for a new society in this nation. Or they may be coming like the woolly mammoth to find their own extinction. Down where the woodbine twine, that's where I meet my love. Down where the sun never shine, down in the woods where the woodbine twine. I was working for the New York Times in the Catskills and there were just a couple of us going up there. As we went north of the city, we began to run into traffic jams. I found a state cop. I said, what the hell is going on? He says, I don't know. There are thousands of people here, and they're all going to some farm. And it was, of course, Woodstock. I think Woodstock was an opportunity for people to realize they weren't alone. A lot of people who in their hometown or in their family felt isolated realized they weren't. The townspeople, quite frankly, were terrified at the prospect of the hippie arrival. I was apprehensive. This little hamlet has a population of under 100 people. When I started hearing the figures of 200,000, 300, finally 500,000, we had a sea of people there. The word got out. Everybody and their brother came from all over the country. First, the sudden rain. Then the thirst and hunger from the shortage of water and food, just for the opportunity to spend a few days in the country getting stoned on their drugs and grooving on the music. We got together and had a little powwow about what are we going to do to feed these people? 
We went into New York to buy 1,500 pounds of bulgur weed, 1,500 pounds of rolled oats, 130,000 paper plates, 130,000 Dixie cups, and I believe we served 200,000 people. By now, there are tens of millions of people who feel themselves to be an irresistible river of change. And you get something incandescent. love-ins in L.A. on the weekends where everybody gets dressed up and goes to the park and brings an instrument. But to see hundreds of thousands of people, like a meeting of all the tribes from all over the country, boy, we didn't know there were so many of us that felt the same. We must be in heaven, man! A rock music festival that drew hundreds of thousands of young people to a dairy farm in White Lake, New York over the weekend came to an end today. Admittedly, there was marijuana, as well as music, at the rock festival, but there was also no rioting. What did not happen at that dairy farm is possibly more significant than what did happen. These long-haired, mostly white kids in their blue jeans and sandals were no wide-eyed anarchists looking for trouble. They remained polite. Residents and resorts freely emptied their cupboards for the kids. Merchants were stunned by their politeness. And while such a spectacle may never happen again, it has recorded the growing proportions of this youthful culture in the mind of adult America. Whenever you see a phenomenon, especially if you're living in it at the time, you tend to think that's the arrival. This is the dawning and the start of something new. Unfortunately, Woodstock just marked the end of it. Is this going to be Woodstock West? Well, it's going to be San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Woodstock was followed by Altamont, you know, only a few months later, and there couldn't have been two more different concerts. The Jefferson Airplane. Jefferson Airplane. We had had the Hells Angels be security at a number of free in the park concerts that we had done, and they were fine. They were funny. They were doing what they were supposed to do. So we suggested using Hells Angels. Happened was a lot of speed and alcohol. That's a deadly combination for bikers. Marty said the F word to one of the Hells Angels. While we were on stage, the Hells Angel knocks him down. That was just the beginning. And I'd like to mention that the Hells Angels just uh, smashed Marty Ballin in the face and knocked him out for a bit. I'd like to thank you for that. You're Damn talking it. to me, I'm going to talk to I'm you. I'm not talking to you, man. I'm talking to the people that hit my lead singer you're in the head. You're talking to my people. Right. Now let me tell you what's happening. You! And what's you're not happening. happening. Oh! No! Oh, one oh, pill no. makes you larger And one pill makes you small And the ones that mother gives you When we left, it was dark and the Rolling Stones were on and we were on a helicopter. Paul Kantner looked down and he said, wow, it looks like somebody's getting killed down there. He was right. They were.
in California, five members of a so-called religious cult, including Charles Manson, the guru or high priest, have been indicted in the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. All the elements are present for one of the most sensational murder trials in American history. Seven people brutally murdered in a glare of Hollywood publicity. The involvement of a mystical hippie clan which despised the straight affluent society. Young girls supposedly under the spell of a bearded Svengali who allegedly masterminded the seven murders. Morning. What? Sun shining this morning. It is. Yeah. Oh. Charles Manson, cleverly masqueraded behind the common image of being a hippie, goes up to the Haight-Ashbury district, surrounds himself with a young bunch of followers. Their lifestyle was sex orgies and LSD trips. Eventually, he gets them to commit mass murder for him. With blood, the killer had scrawled on a refrigerator door the words, death to pigs. You see, prior to these murders, no one associated hippies with violence and murder. People would pick up a hitchhiking hippie. There was, there was no big deal. But after the Manson murders, you saw a hippie with long hair hitchhiking, and the image of Manson would enter the driver's mind, and they'd drive right by. By the time of Charles Manson and watching Altman and seeing what happened there, it symbolizes the drained idealism of the spiritual quest of the Beats and early hippies. Today, the magic is gone. Aimless and disorganized, the hippies have fallen prey to their own free spirit. Free love, free drugs, and too much free publicity have gradually corrupted them. Has something happened to hate Ashbury since last year? We, we hear it's not the same place. Well, no, it isn't. The love-ins brought more and more people. And then people who are really just bums and just trying to get into a good thing, you know, free food, free everything. And so they all just came in, you know, and a lot of really rotten people. And so now you've really got a bad thing. I mean, it used to be you could set your stuff down beside the road, nobody would touch it. And now it got so you couldn't even put your, your things inside of a building. Somebody would come along and take everything you had. Well, one day I, I woke up very hungry, and, you know, very dirty and tired and, and disgusted. So I decided, you know, get a job and settle down. I get serious. Joe's job is making jewelry. He's been taking a six-month course to learn how. It was hard in the beginning, getting up at 8 o'clock every morning and doing all those changes. Joe bought the suit, uncomfortable though it looked. Will he be equally uncomfortable in his new life? There have been generation gaps before, but today's is probably the widest yet. Can the Joes of America bridge the gap and conform without society making concessions in return? I'd say there was a common element in the counterculture of people trying to invent a new world. But people mature, their point of view gets more nuanced. The costs start to come due. Children come into the world. That idea of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it's a youth dream, then youth dies. Yet our mainstream culture took what it needed from the hippies. The actual movement of the 60s was the movement towards something more authentic. In the 60s, we thought of other people as part of our own family. We were into caring for society as a whole. This is what the revolution is all about. Mercy is better than justice. The carrot is better than the stick. And the most important lesson is be kind, be kind. To me, every day was a high water mark. We played music all day long. We worked, we did not have jobs. It was the most carefree period of my life. Dylan has this great line in an early song. He says, I wish, I wish, I wish in vain that we could sit simply in that room again. A thousand dollars at the drop of a hat. I'd give it all gladly if our lives could be like that. <laughs> 